Good evening. I would like to call on the November 27th, 2023, regular meeting of the Malibu City Council to order. On account of the, COVID, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, this meeting is being held in a hybrid format, which allows members of the public to participate in person or remotely via Zoom webinar. In-person participants, if you'd like to speak, please submit your request to speak form to the clerk. Remote participants, if you would like to speak, please join the Zoom webinar meeting at the printed, the Zoom webinar meeting printed on the agenda and raise your hand in Zoom when the item you wish to speak on is called. Kelsey, can we have a roll call and see who's here? Councilmember Grisanti. Here. Councilmember Riggins. Here. Councilmember Silverstein. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart. Here. Mayor Yearing. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you very much. Do we have any speakers online or cards? No, we don't have any speaker slips and we don't have any raised hands or participants in Zoom. Thank you very much. Uh, so what we'll do now is close, the, uh, now recess to closed session, discuss the items listed on the closed session agenda. We'll reconvene around 6.30 to begin regular session and hear the closed session report. So closed session, here we go.
and then we'll get going. Lloyd understands. Ready? Cook it up. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, the, the November 27th, 2023 regular meeting of the Melville City Council is now called to order. On account of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, this meeting is being held in a hybrid format, which allows members of the public to participate in person or remotely via Zoom webinar. In-person participants, if you'd like to speak, please submit your request to speak to the form to the clerk over here on my right. Remote participants, if you'd like to speak, please join the Zoom webinar meeting printed on the agenda and raise your hand in Zoom when the item you wish to speak on is called. Uh, Kelsey, could have a roll call? Let's see who's still here. Councilmember Grisanti? Here. Councilmember Riggins? Here. Councilmember Silverstein? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Here. Mayor Yearing? Here. You have a quorum. Treasurer, Trevor, could we have a closed session report, please? Yes, at 5.15 p.m., the City Council met in open session, recessed to closed session for the items listed on the posted agenda. All five council members were present and no reportable action was taken. Thank you very much. Can we get a report on posting the agenda, Kelsey, please? Yes, the agenda for this meeting was properly posted on November 17th, 2023, with the amended agenda posted on November 22nd, 2023. And Mayor, would you like to have someone lead the Pledge of Allegiance? Ah, uh, yes, very good idea. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairman, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Go, oh, I pledge allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, I need a, move, a motion to approve the agenda. And before we do that, I have one change. We were planning to have a pr announcement or a proclamation for Dick Van Dyke this evening. He was sick and cannot attend the meeting, so we're going to post, or propose, propone that, postpone that. It's another word I was trying to get to uh, until the next meeting. So uh, the agenda, we'll make that change to the agenda. Uh, any, can I get a motion to approve the agenda with, with that change? I'll make a motion to approve. Need a second. second. Roll call, Kelsey. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart. Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Yearing? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, very good. We're on to get my agenda out here. Update on slope failure. Ceremonial presentations. Uh, update on slope failures. Yolanda, you're going to give us that? Yes. Please do. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. This evening, the Environmental Programs Team will be providing you with a brief update on the status of 27 slow failures that our team has been monitored this year. We will also provide you with our, in our community with an update to the wet weather season. Next slide, please. This year, staff has visited over 77 sites to monitor slow failures with the goal of protecting human life, structures, and public access way. Understanding the causes, monitoring slopes, 
and the installation of mitigation measurements for these slope failures is crucial in order to minimize their impact and ensuring the safety of our community. Our presentation this evening will highlight the local slope failures, the best management practices for properties, in addition to sharing photos of those failures and the temporary measures taken. We will also provide you with a summary of the rainfall experience during this winter that may trigger slow failures and more information about the upcoming wet weather season as well. Next slide. Mitigating slow failures and landslide requires a combination of engineering, planning, and environmental management strategies, such as geotechnical analysis, erosion control, slow reinforcement, and collaboration. The next slides will show you some before and after examples of landslides that have occurred this year and how we are actively monitoring their movement. I will pass the presentation to Solicia Andico, our environmental analyst, to share with you some of the sites Mark, Mark Johnson and her has visited this year. Thank you, Yolanda. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council Members. Best management practices, or BMPs, such as vegetation and erosion control are important to stabilizing slopes. The picture on the left shows an example of the slope failures that the city is monitoring. The picture on the right shows a slope after it had been repaired and revegetated. Here is another example depicting the effectiveness of BMPs. The picture on the left is a slope failure identified by the lack of vegetation due to earth movement. In terms of compliance and ongoing proactive prevention, the ideal example is the photo on the right. The disturbed land has been covered by a tarp held down by sandbags so it can direct water away from the slope. Proper management practices are important to prevent further erosion and earth movement from occurring. Here, the picture on the left is a slope failure that affected the ground-mounted solar panels, which have since been removed. The project geologist is preparing plans on how to stabilize the slope. City staff, city geotechnical consultants, the property owner, and the owner's consultants have met to discuss implementing temporary erosion control measures. These pictures here were taken at a bluff side failure that caused debris to fall. It's not every day that you find a tree on the beach. Excessive water is considered one of the most common triggers for landslides. Malibu has received 23 and a half inches of rain from January to March of this year. As seen in this chart, January had over eight and a half inches of rain, February had over five and a half, and March had almost nine inches of rain. For reference, Malibu experiences about two inches of rain per month in winter, and the average annual rainfall in Malibu area is just under nine inches. Due to these rains, the city monitored a total of 27 properties with slope failures and conducted 77 site visits and counting this year. City staff has been extremely busy meeting with homeowners, civil engineers, and geotechnical engineers to address slope failures and ensure temporary erosion control is in place prior to the rains. To date, staff have issued 13 notices to comply, nine notices of violation, and met with 12 properties so far to discuss implementation of temporary erosion control. Two slope failures have been repaired, and we are actively working with code enforcement to ensure BMPs and mitigation measures are in place prior to the start of the rainy season. Now, I would like to pass the presentation back to Yolanda to discuss the city's outreach efforts and provide information about the El Nino. Thank you, Solicia. In getting ready for the, this wet weather season, city staff has sent out over 500 emails to all city registered building professional. In addition, we have sent notifications to all contractors with open permits. We have also added this advisory notification announcements in our social media and our website. This notification alerts the construction community 
to the upcoming wet weather risk season and provides them with information on minimum requires BMP that must be installed at every construction site. Next slide. During early September, the Coastal Commission presented on the emerging El Nino for the 2023-2024 winter. El Nino is characterized for warm ocean temperatures along our coast. The changes in ocean temperatures and surface wind also shift atmospheric pressure patterns, which may cause higher sea levels. We might see more rainfall and more storms towards our coast. Next slide. The National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration, best known as NOAA, is projecting that there is a 95% chance that the El Nino conditions will affect our area this winter. In addition, there is a 66% chance that it will be a strong El Nino. This graph here shows an updated on El Nino conditions in red. They're likely to occur this season, and the chances will gradually decrease with, from the winter to spring. Past strong El Nino have been characterized by extended periods of high intensity rainfall triggered by heavy runoff, floods, mudslides, debris flow, and landslides, both inland and along the coast. Additionally, past strong El Nino coincides with high tides have affected our coastal areas. It is predicted that we will have an approximately 44 days of high tides during the 2023-2024 winter season. Next slide. So how can, do, how can we prepare for this type of events? The first half of the presentation depicted the effects of rainfalls from early this year and emphasized the, new, the need to prepare for the possible strong El Nino winter. The city has prepared a checklist for the community to prepare. This information was based on information provided by the Coastal Commission. To highlight a few items in this checklist are the following. It is recommended property owners visually inspect their structures, such as their seawalls, for any size of distress or of obstructed drainage. Also, if you live close to a slope, a bluff top, a beach area, inspect your property, inspect the, inspect the site for any surface cracks. If you notice any cracks, Contact a California registered geologist or geotechnical engineer to inspect the property right away. Also contact the city. We are also recommended that homeowners should have, should make measure, measures, make sure all of their drains and gutters are clear of debris so they can be functionally and properly working. Next slide. Please, if you have further questions about slope stabilities, flooding, mud flows, or erosion, we are here to help you. Our geology department can answer questions during our counter hours. We're open Monday through Friday. Please also note that the Los Angeles County Fire Station provides this uh, free sandbags while supplies last to residents that can provide proof of local residency. We will also like to remind the community that plastic and plastic-based sandbags are banned in Malibu. Information for the local fire station have been with, that have free sand and sandbags can be found on our Malibu winter preparedness checklist. And this concludes our presentation. Any questions? Comments? Anybody? No? Okay. Yolanda, thank you very much. I, you know, I don't typically believe in weathermen, but every, uh, there seems to be a consensus this is going to be one heck of a, a winter. So keep your eyes open, and, and, and I, you guys got a lot of work ahead of you. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, sir. Okay.
Next presentation is from Rob DeVoe dealing with an up update on the Civic Center Wastewater Treatment Facility Phase 2. Rob, good to see you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Tonight, I'm gonna to give an update on the Civic Center Water Treatment Facility, Phase Two. First, let me give you some background on the project. Back in September 2010, uh, the State Water Board implemented a septic prohibition within the Civic Center um, area. This, this prohibition, uh, it eliminated all septic systems within the Malibu Civic Center area. Uh, the city and the regional board entered into an MOU uh, to provide a roadmap for implementing the septic prohibition. The, the MOU identified three phases to to use to move forward with this, with the prohibition. The first phase was completed back in September 2018. Phase two has a deadline of completion of November 5th, 2024. Phase three has a deadline of November 5th, 2028. Back in August of 2019, uh, the city began the, the design of phase two. Um, and then one last word for phase two is that we were looking into funding by a low interest loan by the state water board. So I'm gonna go over the, an update of where we are with phase two. Back in February of 22, we did complete the, the design for, for phase two. Um, this was done in anticipation of being completed by the November uh, 24 deadline. As I mentioned, uh, this project is utilizing a low interest loan by the State Water Board. It's called the State Revolving Fund Loan. And that process began uh, with a review of our project by the State Water Board. The State Water Board actually does an extensive environmental review of our project. One of the requirements uh, that they wanted us to do is do an extensive soil investigation along the pipeline. This included um, digging down, looking if there's any type of uh, culture resources along the alignment. In, uh, in uh, July of uh, 22, uh, the city did find some culture resources and this was, this was discovered at the intersection or near the intersection of PCH and Sarah Road and up on Sarah Road a little bit to where the alignment is. This caused a significant delay in the project to where we basically lost probably about a year and a half um, going through figuring out what steps we were gonna do to get over this um, issue with the cultural resources along their alignment. Uh, the city has met with the regional board several times to discuss this issue, and the regional board has uh, agreed to look at the phase two mapping and see if there's a way we can redesign or remap phase two and eliminate those sections that are in conflict with the cultural resource finding. Here's a map of the septic prohibition area. The yellow is phase one, which was completed in 2018. The orange is currently the phase two um, limits, and you can see phase two includes uh, the colony um, section of the condos along Civic Center Way, um, a part of uh, the properties along Cross Creek, and a huge section of, of Sarah Retreat area. So, as I mentioned, the area in conflict was up on Sarah Road right by PCH, and the area that I identified in circle there was about 41,200 gallons per day of wastewater generated from there. Uh, the regional board indicated from us that they would remove that section from phase two, so as long as we find an equivalent flow areas from, from properties within um, phase three. Um, a, a initial discussion was to relocate 
the properties that had the equivalent flow of, of around 40, 41,000 um, along Malibu Road. And these are two potential areas that, that, that we have identified that have, have an equivalent wastewater flow for the areas in Sarah Retreat. So what are the next steps? Um, the next steps was to, is to finalize the revised map. We have done our calculations to figure out the wastewater flow equivalent from the Sarah Retreat neighborhood. We identified those areas along uh, Malibu Road that could take up that same amount of flow. Uh, step two would be to meet with the regional board to discuss and look at the revised map. I have a meeting with them on Wednesday to go over this, and I'm hoping to get kind of concurrence. Uh, we had an initial discussion to where they initially agreed on the, the properties, but they wanted to see the numbers, and so we have those numbers now. After after the, rev the revised map is approved by the regional board, we can proceed forward on revising design based on the new properties we identified. And then proceed forward with our finalized and our S SRF funding, our, our state revolving fund loan. Um, they initially put a pause on our funding until we got this resolved. Um, once we have this final map resolved, we can continue during the process of our funding agreement. And after our funding agreement is approved and ready to go, uh, we will proceed forward with forming an assessment district and proceed on construction. And as you can see, there's no really dates on here that I, because everything is is set based on the approval of step number one with approval of the map. Once I have that approved by the regional board, then we could proceed forward on setting dates and, and, and milestones for design and, and funding and, and construction. And so um, I, I plan on coming back, providing more detail on those dates and providing more updates to the community, those new property owners that who, who will be moved into phase two and proceed forward with the project. So that's that's my update and I'm available for questions. Rob, thank you very much. Question, Bruce? Yeah, Rob, so if the properties do change like you described, um, what consent rights or veto rights, what have you, do the new property owners have with respect to this, or does it just get imposed on them? Well, it, it's currently right now there is a septic prohibition within the within the um, civic center area. The MOU between the city and the regional board ad identifies deadlines when those property owners need to be um, connected. So the regional board will move forward on revising the map based on what we put together. Um, they will modify the MOU and modify those deadlines to those property owners to connect and, and follow through and uh, cease using their septic systems. So they could they could object to the regional board on that part, but that's kind of where it stands. So it doesn't get submitted to any kind of vote? It's there's an assessment district vote that would need to go through for the financing part of it, but that doesn't that doesn't um, take away the the necessity to make the connection be before the MOU deadline. Okay, thanks. Okay. Mary Ann? Could you bring the map back up, please? <clears throat> so are there properties currently in phase three that want to potentially be in phase two? Or is everybody who's in phase three just phase three? Great question. I, I don't have a full answer okay. on that, um, but I know that some of the property owners on Malibu Road did identify or contact us during phase one and were asking why they weren't included in phase one and, and they would like to connect. And we told them that they're in phase three, they can wait until 2028. Like the Civic Center Wastewater Treatment Plant is actually in phase three. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Thank you. Doug? Uh, yeah, Rob, uh, question about on Sarah Retreat. What's the status for their being able to do any work with septic tanks now? And when when are 
if are they going to be in phase three, phase four? Is where where do they fit? So that's our further discussion with the regional board. Um, they will be moved to phase three. There is a potential where I um, could be um, doing something altogether to totally eliminate it. But I, it's those are initial discussions on where we are on what we can do, um, and it, you know ultimately it, it comes down to the regional board and, and their approval for this modification. Is there any testing being done on Malibu Creek to see if there's any uh, further pollution or any pollution that might be attributed to Sierra Retreat? We do do testing, water quality testing every quarter to, to see the effectiveness of phase one. Um, we've seen some data come through. I, I don't think it's very conclusive yet. We've had some significant events that kind of like caused some issues. First one was Woosley Fire right after the opening of of the treatment plant. And there was a, a lot of time where we didn't see any type of flow, any type of improvement. And, and once we had that going, the uh, 2019 pandemic hit and really kind of affected the flow. So the timelines and the water quality that you would have typically would have seen in the Malibu Creek probably weren't seen yet because of the, just the, the number of wastewater flow um, that we were generating. It, it just wasn't there yet. So eventually we'll see better flow, but we're just, it's or a water quality once we get more flow. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, the testing you're doing is primarily at the mouth of the creek, right? It, 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 on Surf Rider Beach. It's, it's, are, are you cr testing up the creek also? There is for the for the water quality testing that's done for, according to the MOU, it's in various locations okay. within the city, not just there, but, it, but it's a long, it's strategically located based on our, our um, analysis of the water table and our, our injection areas and the septic systems and everything that goes in. Cool. Uh, let me just say thank you very much. I mean, I know you've done yeoman's work trying to put this thing together after Sarah retreat went belly up, and uh, a lot of hours, a lot of work. You've done a hell of a job. You're negotiating with the, uh, the regional water has been very, you know, done a good job with that. So thank you very, very much for all your efforts. Uh, I think that's been very helpful. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. We're into item two, oral and written communication from the public. Now, we're going to do this, okay? We have, I don't know how many. Uh -huh, we got a stack. Uh, I'll take a look at this while we're waiting. But two things. If, if somebody before you has spoke, again, we like to try and get out of here before midnight. Uh, so if somebody has spoken before you and they're saying the same thing you'd like to say, um, and, you know, it might be easier if you just sort of say, I agree with, you know, Henry who just said this. And if you're going to speak, you have to have your speaker slip in before the item is called. So uh, we're not be taking any more speaker slips on this item. I've got a stack of them here. So let's get started. Joan Hawkins, you're up first. Followed by Norm, you're up. And then Joe Drummond. Please Hi. go. Jill Hawkins. Um, so I'm just here. I hope everyone's well. Um, I'm just here on behalf of a lot of Malibu residents. I get a calls weekly from kids being denied school based on vaccination status. So um, anyway, I'll keep it. I know you guys have a lot of people speaking, but um, I just would like to ask you guys to just I hope you're taking consideration my emails and maybe considering reaching out to Senator Allen and maybe Senator Stern to see if they'll be willing to introduce a bill to get us our religious freedoms back for our kids. Um, again, I think I said in the email, the previous email last week, why that is a good reason. Um, products need to work for the person using them. So anyway, um, I'm just going to share another book with you guys. You guys all get a copy. This is my friend's book. It's called I'm Unvaccinated and That's Okay. Dr. Do uh, Dr. Shannon Croner, also published um, by, I don't know if you guys know Del Big Tree. He's, his organizations have been suing our top health agencies, exposing what's going on in the vaccine industry and where they have not been safety. So um, anyway, and I have some little flyers for you all. But if um, you could consider maybe reaching out to Senator Allen and asking him to introduce a bill this session starting in January 3rd um, to introduce a bill to get our religious freedoms back, to get our kids back in school, our healthy, unvaccinated kids. So anyway, thanks. Jill, thank you very much. Okay, Norm, you're up. 
Joe, are you close to the front? Yeah, just grab a seat up front so you can keep, we can keep it moving. Uh, good evening, council members, and I hope you all had an enjoyable holiday. Um, two weeks ago, I mentioned an inconsistency <clears throat> between the benefits and rights that the city granted to fire rebuild uh, people um, and the lifting of the moratorium on uh, filing new primary view determinations. <clears throat> the inconsistency arise, arose out of uh, probably a, a feeling that four years was sufficient for people to file applications to rebuild their homes and restore their vegetation. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that was not the case. Um, there were a lot of attorneys involved uh, with the uh, insurance companies. They forced people into litigation. Litigation takes a long time. And then there was two and a half years of the COVID pandemic. All of that delayed the processing of the applications for the fire rebuilds. And that, and those delays were inconsistent with uh, with eliminating the moratorium on primary view determinations. Many people <clears throat> that were close to the area where people lost their homes and all mature vegetation um, saw that they had a, had a view of the ocean uh, when all of that was gone. Uh, and at the end of four years, they filed a primary view determination. and. That restricts people from doing what the city felt that they had a right to do. Um, so many of the people actually filed applications prior to the lifting of the four-year moratorium. But the process of going through the city and getting approval for the fire rebuild uh, and the mature vegetation took, in one case, a year and a half. By the time they got through, someone had filed a primary view uh, determination over their property. So what is the solution? I believe that the, the rights granted for a three-year extension that was approved by the Planning Commission and by the City Council for people trying to rebuild their homes and regrow their vegetation um, should be extended to the primary view determination moratorium. It would have to be retroactive. Thank you, Norm. Thank you very much. I'd like to see it on the agenda as soon as possible. Thank you, Norm. Okay, uh, Joe, you're up, followed by Lee LaPlante. Lee? Yeah, it's just, okay, so you're close. Good, okay. Joe, go ahead. Honorable City Council, I was very happy to see all of you who could make it to the Ghost Tires Memorial for the four Pepperdine girls that were tragically killed on October 17th. And now the full memorial is complete for the 58 victims' fatalities along PCH since Emily Shane. I hope the city can partner with the county and the state to get a redesign of the PCH, at least between Big Rock Drive and Civic Center Way, add medians, roundabouts, and whatever is required to slow down traffic in this deadly area. We should possibly also rename it, not the PC Pacific Coast Highway, but Pacific Coast Boulevard. I also want to make a comment regarding Trevor Rissen, our city attorney, not recusing Paul Grisanti for any of the Smart Coast items at the last meeting, given that he is president of the organization, asking for a membership and a donation to the organization is a huge conflict of interest, and it's no wonder the city is under scrutiny by the FPPC. He should have been recused on both items and have left the room. This also reminds me of the incorrect direction Mr. Rustin gave to the Planning Commission on 20272 Inland Lane when he said that two against two was not a denial and that the commission needed to make a vote and force the commissioner to abstain so that the project would be approved rather than denied. This is just one of the bases of appeal on this project which will likely have to be remanded back to the Planning Commission more than three years later. Also, I wonder if Marianne Riggins will be recanting her statement that climate change is 
not, um, there's nothing can be done about it and we have to just live with it and realize that it's caused by human activity and humans can change their behavior and climate change can improve if we do this. It doesn't have to do, have anything to do with tectonic plates under the ground, but pollution and action of humans. And lastly, I'd like to ask Mayor Yearing and the City Council if some, there can be some solutions for the Malibu Farmers Market. Apparently, I mean, everyone loves the Farmers Market. We want it to continue, so we just need some solution. Apparently, the easement out of Legacy Park can be utilized, but there's a parking issue. A permanent solution needs to be found. The city owns a lot of property in Malibu, so perhaps one of their own sites can be delegated to the Farmers Market as an alternative scenario. Thank you so much. Joe, thank you very much. Leela Plant, you're up, followed by Ingrid Jensen. Ingrid, are you? Okay. Good evening, City Council. Thank you for everything that you do. I am going to be donating my minutes uh, to a video that is going to roll. Thank you. Okay. Arnold and Karen York back visiting Mexico and the Visit. Malibu and the farmers market. Yes. We're, we're delighted. We're so happy that it's here and what a great place to have it where the community can come together. There's plenty of parking. Everybody's smiling. Yeah. It, it, this got to do everything possible to keep it here. Yes. Stop this nonsense of <laughs> trying to end anything where people seem to be having a good time. <laughs> Hey, it's Steven Udoff. I'm with Coldwell Banker here in Malibu, a local realtor here for 14 years. And I just want to say this location of the farmer's market is one of the best spots. The vibes, the, the, just the walk path, I think is a lot more safer than across the street. So please do everything in your power to keep the farmer's market on this side of the street. I think everyone here who pays money to be a part of the farmer's market will agree that this is the better location for years to come. Thank you. I am Phil, local resident here in the Malibu area. I just want to say how much it's been it's been so enjoyable to come out here to the farmer's market at Legacy Park and city council members just do whatever you can to keep it over here it is such a, a pleasant experience there's so many people here wonderful vendors uh buy all the shopping the beach etc so please do what you can to keep it here it's such a great uh addition to the malibu hey i'm Teresa. i live here in malibu and i love the malibu farmers peter crane i'm a 37 year uh, resident of malibu uh, i think it's pretty obvious that the farmer's market should be kept here at Legacy Park. There's no real question of that, and I can't understand why anyone would want it. Mr. Squadler, we like it here. Hi there, I'm Suzanne Kingston. I am a Malibu resident. I love the farmer's market and this Legacy Park, and please keep it here. We love the farmer's market. Please keep it at Legacy Park here in Malibu. Zoe Langley, I'm a resident here in Malibu. And I just want to let you know, I love the farmer's market. And please keep the farmer's market in Legacy Park open. It's phenomenal. Hi, I'm Bill from Malibu Kitchen. We were here 22 years at the farmer's market. It's spectacular. It's so much fun. We've sold so many cookies and everybody's so happy with bundles of fruit and vegetables and eggs. Where can you go for something like this? Hey, I'm Howard Rose here, Malibu. <laughs> Love the farmer's market here at Legacy Park. We need to keep it. And, uh, my name is Isaiah Kincaid. I live in Malibu here. I live at Paradise Cove. I'm vice president of Guest Jeans. So I have a job that's corporate and I know what it means to be doing business in this economy. And we come to the farmer's market every weekend. We love it. We buy things and people make money from us and we get the products we love. And I don't see any reason why a clause should uh, discontinue this. It's too important to the community. Thank you. I'm Larry Kasanoff. I produce movies like Mortal Kombat. I live in Malibu and I love the farmer's market here. It's beautiful under the trees. It's natural right here. It's like we're in Europe. It's great. It's a tourist attraction. It's great for the people. Please keep the farmer's market right here under these beautiful trees. I am Rabbi Cantor Marcelo Gindley. And this is Rafael. I love the farmer's market here at Legacy Park. This is the best farmer's market. I have been coming here for years. And I'm a Malibu resident. My entire family loves coming to the Malibu farmer's market here at Legacy Park. 
please keep it here. Hi, my name is Wailani O'Hurley and I support the Malibu Farmers Market every weekend. So please keep it at Legacy Park because we love it here. And everybody else, as you can see along the path here, and it's brought the Legacy Park alive. I'm Susan Cooper, I'm a Malibu resident. Please, whatever restrictions there are, please find a way to work around these, through these, with these, we've got to keep this Malibu market open. We are now here at the Malibu Farmer's Market, which is fabulous. Hi, I'm Dan. And I'm Rachel. And we're here at the Malibu Farmer's Market, which is always a good time. We really enjoy it here and uh, hope it sticks around for a long time to come. Yeah, we're residents and this is a great use of the park. It's been, the park's been here for such a long time and we really don't use it till now. We love the Farmer's Market. <laughs> I love the farmer's market at Legacy Park. Please, please, please don't move it. Love the farmer's market. We need to keep it. This is Rob McClellan, and I have to say, uh, it's so great to have the farmer's market here in Malibu. The participation, the beauty, uh, being at uh, the park is probably the best choice. Uh, somewhere else it have to be. Council, you need to work on this. Um, this is. This is the texture of Malibu. Hey, it's Steve Phillips, and I love the Malibu Farmer's Market. It is an institution here in Malibu. We should stay in Legacy Park. This place is great. Hello, I'm Greg Alterman. I'm a local here at Malibu, and I'm just hoping that you guys would keep the Farmer's Market here. I love the Malibu Farmer's Market. Love Malibu Farmer's Market. We need it here in Malibu. We love, love the Malibu, Malibu Farmer's Market. I've been in Malibu for 17 years, and finally we have the market at Legacy Park, and we want it to stay here. We love it here. It's amazing. Hey, what up? I'm Frankie. I've been a Malibu resident for 20 years, and uh, keep the farmer's market here. Hi, I'm Dan. And I'm Rachel. And we're here at the Malibu Farmer's Market, which is always a good time. We really enjoy it here, and uh, hope it sticks around for a long time to come. Hi, I come to the farmer's market every Sunday and why I do it just a community interaction it's wonderful I love the Malibu farmers market hello I love the Malibu farmers market no matter what it takes please keep the Malibu farmers market it's so welcoming it's so lovely to see people the animals the children the vendors I love coming to this farmers market Kelsey okay thank you Mary. Very much. Next speaker is Ingrid Jensen, followed by Sherman. Sherman, you're up next. I'm Ingrid Jensen. We are grateful to the City Council for temporarily hosting the Malibu Farmers Market at Legacy Park. This gesture was a lifeline when Los Angeles County overlooked our existence, dismantling our market piece by piece to facilitate the construction of the college. Despite that Maria Chong Castillo, County of LA, promised during a city council and planning department meeting that the Malibu Farmers Market would remain untouched and retain its original footprint. Now with, now with the college complete, residents are strongly demanding for the market's continued presence at Legacy Park. I am speaking on their behalf. However, we've been informed that a stipulation set by the property agreement for Legacy Park prohibits commercial activities and picnics on this land. We would like to clarify that the Malibu Farmers Market is a nonprofit entity dedicated to serving the community for over 23 years and thus not be classified as a commercial business. As far as picnics are concerned, residents do not bring their own food, instead, we provide portable tables, chairs, and prepared food, ensuring no open fires or trash issues. Our staff diligently manages cleanup, maintaining the property's pristine condition. It's important to highlight that, the, that it was the local residents who assisted the city of Malibu in raising over tw in raising $25 million to purchase Legacy Park. Now these same residents are pleading with the city for a solution. Unfortunately, our requests have been met with a refusal.
coupled with an instruction to vacate Legacy Park and return to our previous location. At the councilman's request, as far as us going back to the county property, there was a meeting held on September 13th with county representatives, the library, and college officials, along with Deb Bianco, Sherman, and Cece Woods, an investigative reporter. We were offered a significantly reduced space that would account for a loss of 740 feet, which equates to 74 farmers and vendors. This would be devastating, especially during our low season. Who is going to choose which farmer and small businesses go? Instead of aiding us in finding a viable solution, either by securing our stay at Legacy Park or reminding the county of their commitments regarding our market, the city has imposed a fine of $6,540 and has left us questioning our future location. For 23 years, the Malibu Farmers Market has worked in harmony with the city of Malibu and its leadership. The current city council elected by us, is expected to represent and support the community's interests, wants, and needs. We hope for a resolution that honors the spirit of cooperation and community service that has always defined our relationship. After all, we voted for you. For anybody here that's here for the Malibu Farmers Market, can you stand quickly? Thank you. Thank you very much. Sherman, you're up, followed by Caroline Artes. Carolyn? Four minutes. Carolyn, okay, you're up close. Go ahead, please, Sherman. Hi, it's good to see all of you in person. I just want you all to know about some of the hoops that the Malibu Farmers Market has to go through, in case you just didn't know. They have to go through LA County Board of Health Fire Department, Sheriff's Department, Los Angeles Agricultural Department, and the City of Malibu, inspected by all at random times. Do you know that the farmer's market has never had any violations or citations until now? And by who? By who? By the City of Malibu. Apparently, somebody called the Board of Health and told them not to give out permits to any new vendors or farmers who wanted to join in. They were also apparently instructed to not give or renew any existing new permits for vendors or farmers who needed renewing. Who was instructed to make that phone call from the city and why? You know, it's interesting. The city council really is supposed to work for the benefit of the residents who voted for them. Well, how does this benefit Malibu? If you don't like this particular farmer's market or the person who runs it, who do you have in mind? I also find it very interesting that Nobu can close down PCH and be fined only $800. <sighs> That's one meal. But yet, the city of Malibu finds the farmer's market $6,450. Now, that's a lot of meals. Again, how are you or the city benefiting the residents by taking us away from Legacy Park or possibly even in the county with less space? Isn't this hurting other businesses, small mom and pop businesses? This isn't benefiting again anybody. What good is coming out of the decision to not really work and help keep the farmer's market here? But I'll tell you what, I'm sure that the homeless really do appreciate the city because apparently they keep residing there every single day. Thank you. Thank you, Sherman. <laughs> Carolyn, you're up, followed by Mel, you got any Mel out here anyplace? I can't read your last name, Mel. Good yeah. evening, Mayor and Council members. Um, I'm Caroline Artis, and I'm donating my time to show the County Promise video. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the same amendment that was made for the labor exchange should be made for the cornucopia, that they are they have a CD, CUP and it, it has to be respected. I don't believe that's a condition of the project. Well, they conditioned the, uh, the city council did it for, for the uh, labor exchange. 
the, the board of trustees a included a condition that the, I believe it was that the um, college construction not begin until the labor exchange is relocated. So they've already included that as um Okay, so I'm putting, I'm asking to put one in saying that the school district, the Santa Monica City College has to respect the CUP for the labor exchange. Me for the farmer's market? Farmer's market. Uh, hold, hold on, please. Does anybody want to ask her? Yeah, do you have some information you could add on that? That'd be great. <laughs> I just want Thank to, you so much. So sorry. Uh, just clarify, with regards to uh, Corntopia slash the farmers market, there is a agreement between farmers market and the county because we are the landowner, and this has already been approved by the board of supervisors that um, they are allowed to um, have their event um, per a designated area. Um, and I forget the timing, I mean, the timeline, but I believe it's every weekend. Um, so that's all been approved. And um, Santa Monica City College, uh, per this project, is required to accommodate them during construction and after, and this is what we're doing. So it's not, the construction project doesn't take away the um, land that we, I mean, the um, amount of square footage, so it's a wash. And um, in terms of parking, they will also um, accommodate the parking. So it's during construction and after construction. And as far as the labor exchange, um, Santa Monica College has committed in um, conjunction with the county to relocate the labor exchange to another location in the premises. We're looking at two locations. So, um, and that is a commitment that the county has with the labor exchange. Thank you. So we, and so then you're saying we don't need additional conditions. No, because we're Stop. requiring it. Okay. Thank you so right. much. I really appreciate that Thank input. Thank you very I much. Another comment. Another comment. Okay. Thank you very much. Mel Solowiski. I'm, I'm crucifying that last name. Sobolewski. Sobolewski. That's close. <laughs> close. <laughs> and um, followed by Veronica. Oh, here's another one. Veronica. Trying to do. Trying to do. Her, her too. You're close. Okay, fine. Go ahead, please. Uh, it has become apparent that Los Angeles County did not uphold its commitments during the construction of the college. The county progressively encroached upon the farmer's market space, eventually reducing it to a mere 14 vendors. In a striking turn of events, one early Sunday morning at 6 a.m., Deborah arrived with her team of farmers and vendors, only to find the college Ex excavators inexplicably parked in front of the farmer's market. This incident marked the unexpected beginning of the farmer's market at Legacy Park. Now, with the construction completed, there is reluctant consideration to move the market back, primarily due to the residents' strong preference for its presence at Legacy Park. However, the county has reduced the available space by 740 feet. The current site maps are available for public viewing and clearly illustrate these changes. For those interested in learning more about the situation and other related matters, we encourage you to visit our dedicated Facebook page, Transparency Malibu. This platform has been created specifically to offer clarity and updates on ongoing developments. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Veronica, followed by Deborah Bianco. Hi, good evening, council members. Um, just before I begin mine, I'd like to agree with Joe regarding finding ways to make the PCH safer for the community. Um, I'm here in support of the farmer's market remaining at Legacy Park. I'm a member of the community and a regular farmer's market goer. The farmer's market is a gem in Malibu, and so is the markets slash Cornucopia Foundation's founder, Deborah Bianco, who's been an integral part of the, an integral member of our community. The Cornucopia Foundation, through Deb, has been a recipient of over a dozen awards and recognitions from schools, publications, environmental groups, and the Malibu Chamber of Commerce. Um, these include an award from the Flag of the United States of America 2000, the City of Malibu Commendation Environmental Service Honor in 2017, LA County Commendation of Malibu Farmers Market in 2002, the Dolphin Award, the Malibu Times Citizens of the Year, 
National Board of California PTA certificate, recognition from Juan Cabrillo Elementary School, recognition from Santa Monica Baykeeper, commendation from Malibu Chamber of Commerce in 2002, Malibu Optimist Club Appreciation Award. Uh, Mayor and council members, I hope that you will consider keeping the market in this space. Uh, it's just a gem to the community, and Deborah's doing a fantastic job running it. Thank you very, very much. Deborah, you're up. Deborah, you're up. Hi. So, what am I going to say after all that? You know, I'm here tonight to represent not just the farmer's market, not just the vendors that have been in the market for the last 15 years or the little mom and pops that are just trying. Because we put a lot of mom and pops out of business in this town. When the residents were here pleading, hey, what just happened just recently at the lumber yard? Okay? Take that into consideration when you're making your votes in the future. 23 years we're here. You heard it. We have all the facts. Matter of fact, we just opened up a, a website, uh, a new f uh, Facebook. Um, what was the name of that Facebook? Transparency. Transparency Malibu. So all the, all the emails that were sent, all the correspondence between the city of Malibu and us are on it now. Okay? Anything that we're saying. Do you know, not long ago, I called the city. I emailed the city. Please. You know what? Keep us in the loop because the county lied to us over and over again. Keep us in the loop. No, that didn't happen. Two weeks later, we get slammed with what? A lot of money. Then, who gave you the idea in your head to call up the Board of Health? Good God, yet you keep Nobu in business? And I think they should be in business. Oh, are you proud of yourself? You know who I'm speaking to up there, okay? I'm asking you to join us. When I say us, I'm talking for the residents. You saw them up there? Well, you're going to look on our Facebook. Please look on the Facebook because all the residents couldn't be here tonight. Okay? That's why we just had some of them, and there are a lot more. A lot more. We, we voted for you. Some of you even came to the farmer's market and, and when you were up for election. You know who you are to try to get votes. You are in our market, not my market, our market. If you don't care for me, that's one thing. Do you have something on your agenda? I want to know that. Am I passionate? You bet. I care for our people. You see I make no money out of this market. But you know what? We served you during fire. When the smoke was out, our vendors were there. We went to your homes. We provided food for you. How about that? I mean, think about that when you make your vote. Really think. Okay, do you ever read the emails that come in? I don't think so. And you know what, Steve, city ma manager? I'm speaking to you, too, right to you, because you're the one that doesn't read. I honestly think that. I write and I write and I write you. I don't get nothing back, That all of a sudden I get slammed for 6,000-something. I get slammed, oh, with the Board of Health. And I plead with you, because you represent them. Am I upset? You bet. Do I care? You bet. But it's not too late. It's not too late for any one of you. I make mistakes all the time. I think you did too. Please, stand up for your residents, if not me. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Margo, is there a Margo? You're up. Followed by Ms. O'Herity. Senator O'Hurley. Oh, she left. She left. Okay. Then follow. Now follow her would be Alexander Gellis. Come on, get a seat in front so you're ready to go. Go ahead, my friend. Good evening, City Council and Mayor. I will be donating my time for the video. Thank you. Which video were you? Imagine. I never received that video. 
Okay, let's go to another speaking figure. We'll figure that out. You work. Okay, how about? Can you read that? I can't. Annie Ellis, come on up. Annie, you're, why don't you go? We'll come back to that one. Thank you, Steve. Great to see all of you. Annie Ellis, I've uh, been in Malibu 65 years, so now I guess I just told you how old I am. But, you know, I'm going to speak from the heart for a second here. Um, I'll try to be quick. You know, it's been really hard growing up here to see stuff like Tranca Serena, um, our other horse arena down here at Cromer Field. Um, and now they tore down my elementary school, you know? Uh, anyway, Juan Cabrillo, but those are all just fun things to say. What I'd like to really say is that the residents of Malibu should be able to convey to John Parencio how much we love the farmer's market at the park and our gratitude if it could please be worked out to keep it there. My buddy, Mayor Steve Urig, is our representative and the person who should speak for our city. John needs to understand that most of Malibu avoids the park. I've been a stone woman 45 years. I was at the vet over there on the other side. I had to walk my dog around a little bit, went up a little trail, and I was jumped at by a dog, a, a guy out of the bushes. And they have their tents all in there, and you know, so now I, I hear that some residents have renamed it Lunacy Park. How people are afraid to go into it, how unused it is, and it was. How angry people are about the restrictions, how we all, myself included, donated money to buy it, feel alienated from it. And now finally, for the first time since the purchase, people are falling in love with it solely due to the farmer's market. <laughs> they settle down, people. So they are strolling through the park now, soaking in the nature, gently observing and learning how important it is and what a legacy it sets for his family. Residents have, to, have had to fight to keep a farmer's market for over a decade. Everyone is burned out. It should not be a fight. If Legacy Park, we're begging that, that we can work this out. Um, is that it? Okay, almost. So um, if the city could say this, instead of cease and desist letters as have been sent, this is what the residents of Malibu want to hear from you. Dear Farmers Market, we the city will help you in any and all ways that we can to assure that you will be able to bring the residents your valuable Farmers Market for all to enjoy. We will fight for you. We will advocate on behalf of our residents and ensure a permanent location for your asset in our city. Whatever we can do to help, we are there. Andy, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. John G., is there a John G.? What about the guy in the front row? I'm going to Paul, I got it. Okay. Alexander, you're up. Okay, first, then John G. John, you're second. Go hello. ahead, you're up. Hello, okay. hello. Uh, John, grab means... a seat. This gentleman's before you. John can go first. Okay, go ahead. Um, I appreciate the moments. My head looks head like hell. Uh, I appreciate the moments. I appreciate uh, you hearing me, esteemed uh, council, um, elected council. And uh, I want to say that uh, there's a lot of passion here and there's a lot of energy. And I want to just let you know that the farmer's market is a gathering of people. Uh, it's really lacking in community as a whole. Um, not everyone goes to the beach. Um, the farmer's market is a place where we can literally support sustainable agriculture. Uh, we can see each other. We can meet each other. Little children can walk without their shoes on. Um, it is a very lovely event that happens in our community every week. It's a gathering of people. It's a very soulful, beautiful reality uh, that I have not seen elsewhere in this community. 
um, Legacy Park uh, has been unused. Uh, you could drive by it for years and wonder what that is. And now you see people uh, neandering through the, the uh, sycamore trees. Uh, there is available food. Uh, people are gathering, people are sitting together, people are sharing thoughts and plans. Uh, people can come by and pick up a meal on the way home after shopping. Um, we, we, are, we are really promoting uh, sustainable agriculture, local sustainable agriculture. And I know that people are really heated about this, but I ask you to really go there and see what's available and what we're making available and turning that park back into a, a wasteland of, of people not knowing, understanding what it is, is not a great idea. And I'm sure that there are complicated easement rights and so forth that, that we always have to negotiate and deal with. You're never going to make everybody happy, but people are really legitimately, passionately admiring that relationship with that park it's 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 very real and uh, there's not anything like it and it's not replaceable and uh, a parking lot is not going to you know you could argue I could I, I could understand you arguing a bell pepper is a bell pepper right doesn't matter which side of the street it's bought on but that park and that spirit of what happens there is very real and if you go there you will absolutely feel it and I feel that you have the power to maintain it. We see goodness and amazement lost all the time, but you have the power to sustain that, and I hope that you do. John, thank you very much. Again, <laughs> William Miller, Mr. Miller here? No? Okay. You're, uh, then followed will be Louis Rincon. Is there a Louis Rincon here? Okay, can on one second be with you? Uh, Michael Green. Mr. Rincon's here? Yeah. Right oh, I'm me. sorry. Okay, grab a seat up front so you're ready to go, please. Go ahead, sir. You're on. Um, I'm, I'm Alec Ellis, uh, and I just want to echo what everyone's saying about the farmer's market. Everybody, everybody loves it. Everyone loves the new location. Probably the best farmer's market ever. Can't imagine a better farmer's market anywhere else than that location. The, the Legacy Park, like everyone's saying, pretty much just gets used by the non-resident transients who don't pay taxes, didn't really contribute at all to the city being able to purchase it. And um, any argument that it shouldn't be there just seems like an overreach and completely unreasonable. Um, and any laws around the easement and anything legal related around that should be interpreted as we heard from that previous meeting to allow the farmer's market and um, yeah it's the best ever and everyone loves it so let's keep it thank you very much Lewis you're up followed by Michael Granry Michael is there a Michael here no how about a Nikki Corzone is there a Nikki Corzone here no? Okay, how about Catherine Yarnell? Go up after this gentleman, please. Go ahead, sir. All right. Hi, my name is Luis Rincon, uh, a.k.a. Junior. Everybody knows me by Junior here. <laughs> um, but, yeah, uh, I've been at the Malibu Farmer's Market since, like, 2016. And ever since then, it's just been an amazing experience, amazing people. Um, like this gentleman was saying, that the energy has always been right. And we just want to keep the market going. And that's pretty much all I got to say. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you. Catherine, you're up. Veronica. Oh, you, you told me. But. No, you're, you're up. Is there Veronica Trenton? Trenton? No? Okay. How about uh, Melissa's? Melissa? No, I, I appreciate that. I'm just trying to make sure I get it. Melissa, so let's, did you, oh, you filled out again another one. Joshua, Joshua Lester? Joshua Lester? Right, you go ahead. I'll catch up to everybody else later on. Okay. You're, you're on. Go ahead. Good evening, Mayor Ewing and City Councilman. Um, I donated money to 
the park and I have my little plaque there. And sometimes I walk through it when I go to Supercare Drugs, you know, just to walk through it. And I haven't seen the homeless, but I haven't been doing that for several weeks, so maybe they've just moved in. Anyway, I just think it's, it's so nice. It feels like Provence, France on Sundays. Everybody's just out wandering. There's beautiful things, beautiful food. People are just so connected. And it's just lovely. We don't have anything like it in Malibu. And the park is just a wasteland without it. So I think John Perenchio, if he could hear all these comments, and if you guys could go to him and ask him if he can't just carve out Sundays for the farmer's market, because it is a nonprofit. It's not a commercial experience at all. And it's just, God, so after COVID, it's just miraculous. So let's keep it. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Joshua, is there a Joshua? Lester, Lester, no? How about Jim Menzies? No? Uh, Catalo Orion? No, I'm, I'm that is? She donated to Deborah. OK. Then. Did I miss any anybody? You I know what? She's donated to the farmers. Okay. Carol signed in. Can Carol speak? If, no. If once you've done it, you've, you've donated your time. So if I missed anybody, because there's Jefferson, go ahead. You missed uh, Jefferson, you're up, and then young lady, you're up after him. What, what is your name, please? I get Jefferson's got a card. No. Carol Voigt. Go ahead. Good evening, Mayor Urien and Council. Thank you very much for your efforts on behalf of the community. As you can see tonight, we have a wide spectrum of people that have invested their time into the farmer's market. I encourage you to come up with some kind of stipulation or a way we can work with the, uh, the, the lease you know, and the, for their lease through whatever entity we have, whether it's the county or the city. There are other options that have been pointed out to me by others. Uh, the DG compression uh, on Ioki property, moving the fence back 40 or 50 feet. It's another option that you could consider. Uh, as you can see, by how many people came this evening, that this is an, uh, a real asset for the community. You've all visited it. I've visited it. It's uh, terrific. It brings the community together. This is a simple thing that you can solve. It's kind of like the snack shack at the baseball park or the soccer fields. I know you folks can figure it out. You have the capabilities. There are five wise people up there. Make it happen for your community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jefferson. <laughs> Carolyn, did you fill out a speaker slip? Okay, I did, did, not. did you fill out a speaker slip? Okay, then we're just going to have, I'm trying to keep everybody moving. I, I'm done with the speaker slips. How about anybody online? There's Oops. seven raised hands. I I okay, give us. Okay, who's online? When we go through some of those, we'll come back and pick up anybody we missed. First is Tina Siegel. Tina, you're on. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Good. First of all, thank you guys for listening. Um, I'm Tina Siegel. Our families have been owner, homeowners for 50 years, over 50 years. And I want to first thank the council and all of you have been such huge supporters of the memorial that we that work that was constructed um, over the last few weeks um, honoring the four students that were killed and also the uh, 58 other who have been killed over the last since 2013. I just want to thank you for being so gracious and uh, we had whatever we asked of you you were 100 percent supportive um of creating this memorial and i just am hugely grace grateful uh, but i just also know that we have a huge hurdle to overcome um you know uh, malibu residents for decades have been urging uh malibu and the powers that be to make pch safe and ironically caltrans seems to be the largest quote unquote roadblock so to have the California transportation be the biggest roadblock is uh, very ironic. 
And I just want to, it's, it's baffling to me. I, I don't know anything about politics and all, I think you, you know, you're much more apprised of all of that, but as a resident, it just amazes me that we just have this little community of 21 miles of PCH and we are literally the most famous city in the world. Like if anywhere you say Malibu, it's recognizable yet we can't make our roads safe. It's just baffling to me. And I want to support you all in, if there's anything you need to do to override Caltrans, I want you to know that uh, myself and so many of the community support you in doing what you need to do to make PCH safe. So, um, God bless you guys, and uh, we're here to support you in any way to make this road safe. Those four girls were killed right outside of my house, and I've lived here for 50 years, and we just can't have this anymore. So, and we appreciate the Sheriff's Department and their huge support and the CHP being back sort of on, I guess, kind of on uh, duty. Um, I appreciate all these efforts, but it has to be, there has to be more. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Who's, who's next, Kelsey? Barry Stewart. Mr. Stewart, you're on. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. I'm Barry Stewart. I have a short uh, statement. I'll take about two minutes. I'm the father of Peyton Stewart, who's one of the four Pepperdine students and sorority sisters that were killed on PCH Malibu by a reckless driver in October. This month, I came to Malibu for a week. I began working to make uh, PCH Malibu safer alongside parents of some of the other folks who've been killed on PCH Malibu and alongside two traffic safety organizations, Streets Are For Everyone and Fix PCH. I live in Florida, but I wanna do something so the other families don't have to go through what the families of the 58 people killed on PCH Malibu since 2010 have gone through. Mr. Mayor, I appreciate your efforts, uh, those of your council people and the other public and law enforcement officials in support of our common goal. I'm told that Malibu's legal counsel looked at whether the city could unilaterally implement measures to make PCH safer. And that legal counsel's opinion is that the city has to rely on Caltrans to implement those safety measures. Your legal counsel's report cites statistics that clearly show an emergency due to the high incidence of deaths and serious injuries on PCH Malibu. Additionally, a 2015 report made 130 safety recommendations for PCH Malibu. Only nine of those 130 recommendations have been implemented as of November 14th. <clears throat> In short, Caltrans has proven unresponsive. I'd venture to say they've been negligent. I respectfully suggest that the city of Malibu unilaterally take the following measures. First, immediately reduce the speed limit from 45 miles an hour to 35 on the four or so miles of PCH Malibu where most of the deaths have occurred. I'll refer to that as the death zone. If you wish, I'll fly out to Malibu at my own expense to change the traffic signs. And I'll invite the media to film it. Number two, Implement quick build traffic calming measures in the death zone. These inexpensive movable barriers can be quickly installed and they can be reconfigured as necessary to calm traffic without creating bottlenecks. Third, lobby the state legislature to A, permit speed cameras in the death zone with tickets being automatically issued to speeding drivers, thereby freeing up law enforcement uh, officers to undertake other uh, crime preventions, and B, significantly increase the penalties for speeding and dangerous driving. I realize that state legislation is required for those matters. Uh, finally, uh, I would recommend suing Caltrans for negligence, for refusing to implement speed limit restrictions and traffic calming measures that are fully within their control. If Caltrans objects to the city of Malibu taking those unilateral measures, then presumably it would have to request an injunction to stop Malibu from implementing those common sense safety measures. 
I think Caltrans would be hard pressed to persuade the court that a lower speed limit on the death zone and traffic calming measures there are not urgently needed. If Caltrans sued to block the city from making PCH safer, again, I'm willing to fly to Malibu at my own expense and hold a press conference or to ask Caltrans to explain why the city of Malibu should be stopped from making PCH Malibu safer when Caltrans has refused to do just that for at least eight years. Okay, so your time is just about up. And now Thank you very much. Next. Ryan. Ryan, you're on. Ryan, you're unmuted. Who's after Ryan? Georgia Goldfarb. Georgia, you on? Yes, thank you. Um, thanks very much. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, terrific. Um, thank you uh, all so much for, for um, attending to this problem. Um, I, I go to the farmer's market every weekend, virtually, and most of my meals uh, actually come from the farmer's market. So I enjoy it. I like the vendors, and it's a very beautiful setting. Um, so I urge you to extend the TVP for the farmer's market location at Legacy until a permanent location may be decided, perhaps either at Legacy, which of course has, I guess, some legal issues, uh, but it's very beautiful, um, and where it is now, obviously, or at Aoki. There are many merits to the Aoki site. The location is familiar, so there should be no loss of customers. The sidewalk there is perfectly suited to provide access for people of all ages, including those with disabilities. Parking is easily accessible at Legacy, the college library area, and Aoki itself, as it is now used. A multi-use and beautiful location can be created at Aoki by simply moving the fence back 20 feet more, if possible, and if it is, in fact, even needed. Native turf could be planted, as it is by the lagoon. This would maintain the continuity with legacy. Native flowering plants could be added to beautify the area, and perhaps a native vine for the chain link fence. Tables and benches could be placed to be used for the farmer's market, as well as throughout the week, enhancing the whole day-to-day uh, -day use of the site. At this time, along the sidewalk, there is a chain link fence and mostly, if not wholly, invasive plants adjacent to the sidewalk, which require mowing and removal, so there is already maintenance there. It's not attractive. With minimal effort and funding, this could be a lovely extension of legacy, as well as a new home for the farmer's market. Uh, and I have spoken to vendors, and I think they'd be very happy there. The market would then be under city control, which I think it would, would allow it to be run more smoothly, and as in Santa Monica, be a source of delicious food, which a city could be really proud of. And it is now, but <laughs> it might be even better. Um, so this does not have to significantly impact any long-term use of Aoki. It simply allows a low cost to beautification and space for people to eat and read and a home for the farmer's market, a healthy, tasty alternative to industrialized grocery stores and which also import, uh, supports local farmers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Georgia. Who's next, please? Bill Sampson. Bill, you're on. Good evening. I'll start off with a thank you. Sunday morning, early, my wife and I were returning from our Thanksgiving celebration, which took place Saturday in San Diego at my daughter's place. Uh, it was a little before nine because I dropped her off at mass. Uh, just before that, an idiot in a small sports car, some kind of Mercedes, was behaving stupidly, and that's being generous. Thanks to you guys, after I dropped her off, I encountered the same vehicle stopped by one of the highway patrol cars. Uh, that's a good thing. Thank you. 
Second, I would second everything that Mr. Stewart said. As a matter of fact, I would suggest you get a lawyer who's aggressive and will really represent us and get rid of BBK and Mr. Rusin. They don't want to do the job and really go after people and really support us. There are people out there who are competent, capable, and willing to do so and will aggressively represent us. It's time. It's past time. Next, Rosemary and I are probably a minority of two who don't frequent the farmer's market, principally because we don't like being on the highway on Sundays. That said, it looks like a great thing, and you ought to do it. This time, when you go to negotiate with a billionaire, one of the Parencios, I would suggest that someone other than the guy you cannot afford to pay his parking tickets and a homemaker be sent in to do the negotiation. I would suggest Mr. Silverstein. I think he's an experienced negotiator, and I think he's done pretty well. I would not suggest sending in somebody who has a personal and or pre-existing business relationship with Mr. Parencio. The conflict is obvious. If you could do anything, I don't know. Money talks. We do have a lot of money. We ought to be spending it on highway safety first, I think. Personally, I'd rather spend it there than on a farmer's market. If the citizens disagree, that's fine. We did not all vote for the five of you, three of you, and you know who you are. I would rather be waterboarded than vote for you, but you will represent us, and the citizens want the farmer's market. That's fine. But I'd rather spend the money on highway safety myself. If you're going to negotiate with Mr. Parencio, it's probably going to take money. We have quite a bit. Maybe giving him some to release some of the reversionary clauses in the deed, which are going to be tough to beat, I think. And it's not my specialty. Money does talk. We may have to do it. It may be worth it. If the citizens want it, spend the money, have Mr. Parencio and or his interests release us from some of those reversionary interests. Otherwise, we risk losing the land, and we will have another building like that thing next to the lot. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sampson. Next, please. Damien Kevitt. Damien, are you still here? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Please, yes, go ahead. Great, thank you. So my name is Damien Kevitt with Streets Are For Everyone. I think you all know me by now. Honorable Mayor, City Council members, I first of all hope you had a good Thanksgiving, and I want to thank you for your support and actions so far on efforts to make PCH safer. Streets Are For Everyone is part of a Caltrans Advisory Committee on Complete Streets. Complete streets are those roads that take into account both pedestrian and bicycle and all modes of transportation. And this committee met today. One of the primary topics in that meeting was, of course, PCH. In that meeting, we also discussed how long it takes for Caltrans to get roads redesigned to include things like sidewalks and bike lanes on Caltrans right-of-ways. And the number that came up was seven to eight years at minimum. This probably comes as no surprise, considering that it's already taken, I think, what is it, seven years now to get the signal synchronization, the step that it's at, and it's still not done. So I don't think this is some great shock to you. In that meeting, the Caltrans representatives acknowledged that the only reason the 10th Freeway was fixed so fast was that the governor stepped in and removed bureaucracy and arbitrary rules. And those same representatives in the meeting that we had today indicated that without the governor of California personally stepping in, it would probably take years, seven years, eight years, 10 years, decades, for any major changes to PCH that would have been started in October of 2023 to possibly come to fruition. So that means by 2030 or by 2033 or somewhere in that time period, by that time, another 60 to 100 lives will have been lost, another 2,000 to 3,000 more people seriously injured. And I know every one of you sitting right there have been personally impacted by the tragedy on the 17th of October, 2023. The truth is Caltrans has not. We are safe is reaching out to the governor of California to ask for his intervention and will continue to engage news media and other public advocacy actions to raise the issue of PCH safety. I'm not sure how long this will take, 
But Caltrans states over and over that it is a agency that is committed to the safety of people. As an agency, Caltrans is clearly broken. And while we work to get Caltrans fixed, I just want to say that we stand in support of any unilateral action that City of Malibu takes to effectively make PCH safer. We will support you not just on Zoom, but with boots on the ground and if needed in front of the cameras. And we know, because we all know, that without effective action on PCH, many more lives will be lost and we know further inaction is no longer acceptable. Thank you. Jamie, thank you very much. Next, please. Keegan. Keegan, you're up. Hi, can you guys hear me? Gotcha. Good evening, members of the City Council. As a veteran who served our nation and sustained disabilities in the line of duty, I deeply cherish our constitutional rights, especially the First Amendment, and I want to say God bless to all these people speaking out for what they believe in. I enlisted in the United States Marine Corps driven by a profound sense of patriotism. My fellow service members and I took an oath to defend our nation against all threats, both foreign and domestic. However, it appears our national attention leans heavily towards international affairs, overshadowing the challenges we face right here at home. And upon my return from service, I grappled with financial challenges of receiving an initial disability compensation of only $284. And I was not able to feed myself, let alone my family, since my disabilities from my military service keep me from gainful employment. And the farmer's market helped me um, be able to feed my family. It's striking to consider our President Joe Biden as committing treason by sending $75 billion in aid to Ukraine to kill European men, women, and children, while the residents of Maui, for instance, totaling around 165,000 residents, were just given $700 each, and that is only 0.153% of what he sent to Ukraine to kill women and children. Ke or Keegan, the fact Keegan, that we Keegan, keep it close to the topic here, please. Yeah, I would just like to address uh, attention to Section 18 of the United States Code 2381, which outlines the punishment for treason. And okay, states Keegan, that, uh, we're, Keegan, we're not doing treason tonight, so we're, we're, it's either PCH, it's farmer's market. If you can keep it on those topics, I would appreciate it. it needs to be yeah, um, to I'm trying market. to speak about the farmer's market, and you guys are interrupting me. And um, I'm trying to explain how we can fund the farmer's market, and I would like to have my time back. And you cutting me off and um, restricting me of my freedom of speech is against the uh, First Amendment that I signed up to fight for, and I would like time back because I am speaking about the farmer's market and how we should be putting money into it and how we should be keeping it. And I have people like you who are trying to silence me and what I have to say, okay? And that is treason. You took an oath to listen to the residents of this city and how we can provide for our communities and our nation, and you are cutting me off trying to talk about what is stopping us from having what we need to feed our people. And that is against the United States Code 2381, which says that treason is punishable by death. Okay, and Keegan. right now, it is a grave matter, and I believe it's essential to consider the implications of our actions. Keegan, I'm, and you are I'm cutting Keegan. me off as a veteran Keegan. who allows you to be able to serve. As a city council member, and you cutting me off like this is absolutely disrespectful. I do not know who actually voted you in, but you need to sit down and you need to know who you work for, and that is for us and the public. So I would like the next time when I come here to speak for you to shut your mouth and to listen. Thank you. Thank you, Keegan. And next, please. David Rolston. David, you're on, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can, sir. Okay, thank you. I, I just want to remind the council, my daughter, Neve, was killed on PCH, along with, with her three sorority sisters on October 17th of this year. Uh, quickly, as an aside, my daughter and her friends from Pepperdine frequented the farmer's market, and they greatly enjoyed it. Some of the pictures that were taken from her Instagram account spread around the media around the world were actually taken there. Uh, but my main comment is I would like to remind the council that the Caltrans light synchronization project, which is due to start sometime next year, from my understanding, will not be done until 2025. And it's stunning to me that uh, I don't have a Gantt charter or anything. Obviously, there's no visibility to, to me or, or people from the public, but it's stunning to see that a project like that will take an entire year to accomplish. Uh, it's also my understanding that it took seven years to get to the point that that project's actually um, going to begin next year. We all saw what happened when pressure was put on Caltrans District 7 to restore access to the 10 freeway after the fire. 
they restored access in 10 days. Even though it is apparently uh, true that there's additional work that will need to be done that will go on for years, but it gives you an idea of what can be done when Caltrans District 7 is tasked to prioritize an issue. The lack of priority to the dangers of PCH indicates how important the safety of the citizens and visitors of Malibu is to Caltrans, which is to say that they don't seem to take it seriously. And I would urge you to do whatever you deem necessary to proceed with making PCH and the community of Malibu safe from the perils of the Pacific Coast Highway status quo as it currently exists. And I think we all know that there's a, a substantial loss of life and injury that has occurred uh, based on the PCH as it exists today. And uh, specifically, I want to support the declaration of emergency and any unilateral actions that you need to take to support your community. And uh, not unlike my good friend, uh, Barry Stewart, uh, we live here in, in Los Angeles and we will fully support you in any actions that you take uh, in any way that we can. And I thank you for, for hearing me out today. Thank you very, very much, sir. Anybody else? Carla Thompson. Carla? Hello, can you hear me? It's not Carla, it's her husband, Todd. Todd, you're on then. Okay. I just want to quickly read a paragraph that I don't think uh, Mr. Stewart got, Barry got in at the end because he was kind of cut off on accident. Um, his last paragraph was, if a Caltrans sued to block this city from making PCH safer, I am willing to fly to Malibu at my own expense and hold a press conference where I'd ask Caltrans to explain why the city of Malibu should be stopped from making PCH Malibu safer when Caltrans has refused to do just that for at least eight years. And meanwhile, an average of one person is killed every 2.7 months on PCH Malibu. That is how he wanted to end that speech. Um, my daughter is Bridget Thompson. She was great friends. She calls them their everything of these sorority girls, Neve, Peyton, Asha, and Deslin. And their names have to be spoken multiple times because we do not want people to forget about them. Um, she was not only friends of theirs, she was a roommate of three of those. So when we went into her dorm, three dorms were now empty of people living there. And it was heartbreaking for me to go in there and deal with that and have to deal with that with my daughter. So we have to get on this PCH project and get on Caltrans and do what we can. Like everyone brings up the, the, um, the 10 freeway, the 10 freeway, the 10 freeway. It was such a quick relief of getting it done. I know they're not completely finished with the construction on it, but obviously if they can make exceptions there, they should sure make exceptions where we're at on PCH, because this shouldn't happen again, you know? And for these parents, for Deslin's parents and for Ash's parents who can't be here because they live on the East Coast, um, I'm speaking for them as well. So whenever you hear my voice and when you ever hear any of our voices speaking, they're also speaking through us. So we're not the only ones out here that are being affected by it. Um, they are too, but obviously living on the East Coast, it's hard for them to come out and attend these meetings and these ceremonies that we do for them. Um, so I just do want to thank the city of Malibu. I do want to thank Pepperdine University for the great job that they've been doing of taking care of these, you know, the parents that are coming out and my daughter up at Pepperdine. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Do you want to circle back to Ryan? Um, is he available? Yeah, he's here. Ryan, go ahead. Ryan, you're unmuted. Ryan, let's go. Okay, we named this Ryan tonight then. Uh, anybody else? No, those are all the raised hands. Okay. Uh, 
I want to close public comment. I want to thank all the speakers. I know a lot of you have left, but uh, you, you did a great job. So thank you very much for all the information you provided us. Hopefully we'll be able to do something with it. So with that, I'd like to bring it back to the council table. Communications from our city manager, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I'd like to first by just uh, addressing, uh, making a couple comments about the farmer's market. Um, first off, I just want to assure um, the organizers of the market, the members of the community, and suppose the members of the city council that uh, uh, nobody from the city or the city staff is, is trying to harm the market or stop the market from operating uh, in, in any way, shape, or form. Um, I myself have been to the market on several occasions. Uh, I agree that the setting that it's at right now is, uh, is beloved by all, um, and it makes a, a great spot for the market. I don't think anybody is, is denying that at all. Um, and, I, and I also wanted to point out that the city has um, put a lot of efforts uh, to uh, work with the market and assist the market. Uh, if you would recall back in September of 22, uh, when they ran into some issues with the with space across the street, um, the market um, on its own relocated into Legacy Park. Uh, at that point, we, we worked with the market to to basically legitimize that and get that permitted. Uh, and we also waived fees uh, for the market that totaled uh, over $34,000 to date. Um, so the, the um, and the other issue is it's not with the, uh, with the nonprofit status of the, of the, um, of Cornucopia. We, we know that the market is a, is nonprofit. Um, the issue with Legacy Park is the, uh, is the deed restrictions that are placed on it. Uh, as well as the, the zoning of the property as well. So those are a couple of the obstacles that the, that the city has. I uh, also just wanted to address, um, just very briefly, uh, you know, this, this issue has been brought up several times with, with Nobu. Um, and I just, for the record, the city did not permit Nobu to um, shut down or do anything that evening, uh, that weekend of July 4th. Um, I found out about the event when I was contacted by an angry driver who was not a Malibu resident who was driving through the city uh, and alerted me to the issue. Uh, and that was what then subsequently led to an investigation uh, and a citation and issuing of a fine. Um, it was for one event, and that was why the event, why the fine totaled that amount. Um, the issue with the farmer's market is that they've now been out there eight times. Um, after the expiration of the TUP, uh, and that is why they've racked up that, that level of fines. Um, I just want to state to the council that um, we, I believe we've been very responsive uh, to all the emails and communications that we've received from Cornucopia. Um, and I just have to say that I, I think it's what we've not gotten back as much communication um, back from the organizer, so I, I believe we've been responding and we just have not been hearing back. Uh, having said that, we're more than willing to continue to work with the market and the organizer to, to find any type of solution uh, that we can, but as I explained to the council, the, the issue uh, right now is, is with the deed restrictions and the zoning on the property. So i um, happy to, uh, with council direction, continue to explore other options. Obviously, we can't get into a discussion tonight because it's not on the agenda. But if council would like, we could we could bring it back uh, for discussion at a future agenda. Um, moving on to the rest of my report, I wanted to just uh, wish everybody, hope everybody had a, a pleasant and relaxing and safe Thanksgiving holiday. Um, it's been a lot happening, obviously, with um, um, P PCH and CHP. Um, it seems like it's been a month ago, but we had the PCH task force meeting was held here on November 14th. Uh, we heard presentations at that meeting from our law enforcement partners, the city, Caltrans. Also want to thank Senator Allen, uh, Assembly Member Irwin, and Supervisor Horvath uh, for, their de for their questions uh, and attendance at the meeting. Uh, the task force meeting was uh, uh, videotaped and it is available for viewing on the city's website. Uh, staff is building uh, an information page uh, on the city website just to uh, document everything that we're doing uh, with regard to safety on PCH. Uh, and we'll, we're building that and we're going to highlight that a little bit further uh, at the next regular meeting on December 11th. Also, as, as I'm sure uh, council is aware, on tonight you have uh, on your consent calendar 
uh, ratification of a short-term agreement um, between the city and the California Highway Patrol. Uh, staff is also working right now with the California Highway Patrol on a longer-term agreement uh, to bring in a task force of CHP officers that would start after the first of the year, and we're working on bringing that forward to City Council at the next regular meeting. Um, that's it on uh, PCH for now. Um, we're continuing to meet with uh, Caltrans, and uh, we will continue to, to keep you informed. We're also continuing to make sure that we work with, uh, with our legislative partners uh, to continue to, uh, to get their support and see how they can assist as well to continue to, to, push, um, to push for some real solutions here. I also want to report that uh, I did reach out to our representatives of Southern California Edison uh, regarding um, if they could give us an update on what's happening with the public safety power shutoffs. Uh, they have agreed to come out and give a presentation to City Council at one of our meetings in January. So watch for that. Uh, I just want to report that uh, we had um, great co a good couple of workshops for our coastal vulnerability assessment. We received some really good uh, feedback and input from the community. Uh, they were pretty well attended. We had 43 attendees at the in-person workshop and 41 attendees at the virtual workshop. Um, so uh, we're also working on a um, frequently asked question sheet that will be emailed to stakeholders and attendees and also posted on the city's website uh, and all on regard to coastal vulnerability assessment. Also, our environmental um, sustainability department hosted a uh, West Basin Municipal Water District drive-through rain barrel giveaway event uh, last Saturday, or excuse me, two Saturdays ago, November 18th. And we gave away over 150 gallon rain barrels within uh, one and a half hours. Uh, so I just wanted to thank Mayor Erring for stopping by at the event and also all the volunteers with the Boys and Girls Club who helped put that together. I also attended um, uh, two dedication events for the, uh, the ghost tires at uh, PCH and Webb Way. Uh, one was held on the November 14th, and then also I attended the one on Sunday, November 19th. Uh, it was a very well-organized event, very moving, very powerful, um, and very scary to see the four tires yet to be assigned to future victims of PCH tragedies. I uh, wanted to thank Damien Kevitt with uh, Streets Are For Everyone for putting together the event. I also attended a mediation session for school district separation. Uh, we have a follow-up session scheduled for later this week. Uh, also um, attended our first meeting with our City Council Ad Hoc Policy Committee to follow up on our goal for work workplace culture. Uh, we had a good first meeting and we will be scheduling a subsequent meeting soon. I also want to acknowledge um, a hardworking staff with the city's public works department. I know a lot of their work goes on behind the scenes. As a result, they don't always get the necessary recognition, uh, but the department has really gone above and beyond re uh, in, in recent months and weeks to address several challenges, uh, including the handling of our uh, public safety power shutoffs and getting the message boards out to everybody, uh, all the work with the department to address PCH safety, the coordination of the ghost tire memorial, uh, kicking off of the PCH traffic signal, signal synchronization project and also the work on phase two. I just want to thank uh, Director Rob DeBow and our very dedicated and talented uh, public works department staff for all their work. And um, also wanted to acknowledge um, we had uh, Rob Houston who had been serving us as a interim deputy city manager for a number of months. And um, unfortunately, we're going to be losing Mr. Houston's services. Uh, he has been picked up as a city manager for a, a city in L.A. County. And so uh, this is going to be uh, his he's wrapping up his service here with the city of Malibu. But I just wanted to uh, recognize Mr. Houston for all his great work and assistance. And, and we will miss him here. So and that is it for my report, unless you have any questions. And also, I know we do have. Sergeant Soderland here from the Lost Hills Department. Any questions before we go to the sergeant? Bruce? Yeah, I have one question. This is about the farmer's market, which I'll be talking about. Uh, well, I'll be talking about, I'm sure, more later. Uh, how did we get consent for it to be conducted at Legacy Park for the time that we authorized it? What, so, what was the process and what was required? If I recall, we came, what, what we did is we adopted, the city council adopted an urgency ordinance which permitted it to operate at the park. 
Right, but did, did we also receive the consent of the the party to whom the obligations under the deed are owed, or did we just disregard that? We 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 did contact them. Um, we were able, never able to get um, any type of approval or consent from them in terms of short term or long term. I, I can tell you in my direct conversations that I had with 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 at least Mr. Princio, they indicated they did not have any concerns with the with the market being there in the short term situation that had been. Um, at, and at least at the last conversation I had with him, which was probably a couple of months ago, at that point they, they, he was not interested in, in looking at, you know, discussing some type of change to, to the restrictions. Okay, so it was only informal? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Questions? No? Right here. Ready to go. You're on. All right, good evening, City Council. Um, <clears throat> hope everyone had a nice Thanksgiving weekend. It was pretty uneventful for us. Um, so as you know, the City of Malibu um, has been funding additional uh, traffic enforcement on PCH, so that started at the beginning of November. So I wanted to give you guys an update now that the month is almost over. So um, I've been able to hire um, 10 shifts of deputies and in those 10 shifts um, we've issued 120 citations a majority of them are for speed uh, we've made 10 arrests and we towed seven vehicles um, one of the highlights was a street racing operation which we did on the 14th of this month we had two sergeants and four deputies out on PCH uh, patrolling and doing enforcement uh, we were taking a zero tolerance approach out there so that night, um, we issued 33 citations and 31 were for speed violations. Uh, two drivers were cited for driving on a suspended license. Uh, and one driver was arrested for DUI. And in this particular instance, we had the VOPs with us. And one of the VOPs observed this DUI driver uh, near Point Doom and was able to radio it into us. And we were able to intercept them near Canaan. And in addition to being arrested for DUI, he also had two outstanding warrants for his arrest for DUI. So we got him. Um, and then also we arrested two 20 year olds for reckless driving and racing on PCH near Topanga Canyon. Uh, one was driving a Corvette and the other one was driving an Aston Martin. The uh, driver of the Corvette had rented it uh, an hour and a half prior and came out to Malibu. So both those vehicles were impounded for 30 days and they were arrested for reckless driving. Uh, so like I said, we're out there. We're trying to make a difference. We're taking a zero tolerance approach. Um, <clears throat> another uh, topic that I wanted to talk about is uh, radar LIDAR uh, handheld units. So you asked us if there was anything that you can do for us. I have a request. Uh, we are sending deputies to radar LIDAR training um, and we're running out of radar LIDAR units for them to use. So I'm submitting a bid to the public safety uh, department and hopefully we'll be able to accommodate that. Um, also, we are meeting with Caltrans this week, uh, the Sheriff's Department of the city and some of the stakeholders um, to talk about PCH safety. And they're actually gonna come out and be on foot and see it firsthand. So hopefully they'll approach it with an open mind. So I wanted to give you an update that they're being responsive. So uh, hopefully we'll have good news from Caltrans. Um, and along with talking about PCH dangers, two days ago in the 21,000 block of PCH, a deputy conducted a traffic stop on a vehicle and he was hit by the side mirror of a passing vehicle. So fortunately, he wasn't seriously injured, just the minor bumps and bruises, but um, that just highlights the dangers out there on PCH. And also, I wanted to talk about there's a actual law. Uh, it's called the move over law. Um, it's 21809 of the vehicle code. So basically, it says that if you're approaching an emergency vehicle with their lights on, you need to move to over to a lane uh, away from where the vehicle's at, 
or slow down if there's not an opportunity to move over. So um, I wanted to re reiterate that uh, we have to be out there on foot on PCH and it's a dangerous job. So I want would like the motorists to see us out there and slow down and move over. Uh, finally, uh, the holidays are here. So um, we've seen a, a slight uptick in DUI uh, arrests. So I wanted to remind everyone, don't drink and drive. There's no excuse with Lyft and Uber or taxis. Um, so please have a designated driver or think ahead. So that is all I have. I'm open for questions if Thank anyone you, has any. Comments, questions, anybody? I, I just want to thank you for all you're doing out there and to tell you that uh, I've been following Doug Stewart's advice to set my cruise control for the speed limit and I've had to go back and forth to Santa Monica several times in the last few days and it's amazing the number of people who are getting stopped in that, se that section where I've never seen anybody get stopped in years and it's also amazing how grateful I am that I'm already just going the speed limit. And they're, they're hiding in new places, guys. So you're, if you're thinking about speeding because it was a safe place to do it before, it's not anymore. So go the speed limit. Anybody else? Bruce? Yeah, for, first of all, I think it's sad that you need to explain that people are supposed to move over when emergency vehicles are on the shoulder because you're supposed to learn that in driving school when we get our license. Um, how, you know, speed limit is the law, as it is people are going above the limit we have, which is too high, but how do we stop, how do we slow the cars down, not as a legal matter, but as a practical matter? I mean, what is going to, what do you believe will work the best to actually get people not to violate more laws so that we have to find them more, which I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about that later, but what's actually going to work to slow them down as opposed to just telling them to slow down? That's the million dollar question. If I had that answer, we wouldn't be here right now. So there's no studies, nothing that helps I us mean, understand it's, that? it's a host of multiple factors. Um, enforcement, like the captain talked about, enforcement, engineering, education. Um, it, there's no ma one magic answer to it. It's, it's a combined effort. Do you have a view as to whether more traffic signals would be helpful? Uh, so you have to I, stop you more know, often? You know, I don't want to speculate because, you know, there's so many different factors involved, but hopefully we'll we'll get to the root of it. Okay. And, you know, and the other comment I have is the, the, the arrest for DUI, the arrest for the the reckless driving. I mean, it's, it's great that people are being stopped. It's, it's, it's even better that the cars are being confiscated. But, these are all arrest and release, right? So they get arrested for DUI, they go get drunk, they drive again. Is that, that's how it's working? Well, yes, these are sight and release. Uh, okay. the, if you're arrested for DUI, you will be booked into jail, though, until you're sober enough to leave. So, Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you, Bruce. Anybody else? You said you hope you're making a difference. You are making a difference. Okay, I mean, it. It, 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 yes, there have, you have changed some of the, not all of it, but some of the behavior on PCH, and you've made it as safe as you can with the resources that you have. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any commission community updates? No, you don't have any commission or committee updates. Yeah, I want to bring a motion back next meeting to say we should have one committee update, one commission update every month. Right. It's, it just tells what the heck they're doing. I think the residents would like to know. I'll do that. I'll, I'll get you. I'm not going to do that tonight. Okay. Uh, back to the co council table comments. Anybody want to start? Marianne? No, we start. No, you didn't. And Paul, go ahead. Uh, like everybody else, I was. Uh, I had a great Thanksgiving. I had relatives come visit, which was wonderful. Uh, I also uh, had a multiple multiple meetings at, relative to school separation, which we spent a lot of time on, and I think we're going to do some more this coming week. And we are feel like we're making progress, but it's never fast enough. Uh, and. Uh, I just am grateful for living in Malibu, and I, I think that 
The other thing I want to point out is that when you actually go the speed limits, it's actually possible to drive from here to Santa Monica and not hit a single red light. Amazing. Give it a try. Um, I want to thank all the speakers. Uh, one of the things I want to say to all the Malibu residents is please call and write to your state representatives and Governor Newsom to make changes to the laws allowing for reduction in speed. I'd like to see it from uh, eastern city limits to Webway and also from Keenan to Trancas Canyon. And I think those are our commercial areas. Those are their most dense areas. But they need to hear from you in Sacramento. That's where the decisions are made. You've got to call and put the pressure on them up there. So please reach out, call, write over and over and get all your friends to do it too. Um, I want to thank Steve McClary and all the staff for getting CHP back in Malibu. That has been something that has been desired since we became a city some 32 years ago. And it's great that he and um, all the staff members were able to do that. I know that I'm sure the mayor and mayor pro tem had a lot to do with um, helping that along. But I just wanted to acknowledge our city manager and the staff for the great work and that how important that is to us. Um, the primary view determination, I guess I'm a little confused by that. I know that it was something that was paused during Woolsey, so I don't know if that's something we need to look at. Um, I don't know if we have a consensus from council to get a, at least a presentation on what happened and if it's something that we should be looking at or not. I'll leave that to the other council members to jump in on. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna talk. Um, with regards to farmer's market, um, I'm a little disappointed there aren't more people and that the um, the leaders of the farmer's market aren't here. Um, I guess I'm a little confused what's going on with the county, why they can't go back to the county. And uh, it's my understanding they do have a CUP issued from the city. And I think there are outlines of exactly what the size is. Um, are the sizes that they're talking about just coming into conformance with their conditional use permit. Um, so maybe we need to bring that item back also. Maybe we have a consensus from the, the council to agendize that for a future meeting. So. And as Paul said, we attended school separation. We're continuing. Um, hopefully we're going to have um, a resolution to that in the coming years. Um, and just uh, hope everybody had a great time with Thanksgiving and that they've enjoyed themselves. And I look forward to the holidays and I hope everyone stays safe and happy and be careful out there. Thanks. Mary Ann, Bruce. Okay, thank you, Mayor. I'm not gonna be brief. Uh, so there's, there's two hot topics that were the subject of discussion, unsurprisingly, in which I came prepared to talk about as well, the um, dangers of PCH and the farmer's market. Um, I know most of the people that spoke today spoke about the farmer's market, and I, I want to honor them by speaking first about that, but I think PCH safety is more critical, and I'll, so I'm going to speak about that first and then come to the farmer's market. And I'm going to echo also um, what Marianne said. I'm a little disappointed that so many people who spoke didn't stick around to hear what we had to say about what they had to say to us, because um, we're not ignoring you at all. But I guess you can watch the recording. But, you know, Four weeks ago or five weeks ago now, the first meeting we had after the um, devastating event on PCH, I proposed promptly that we agendize a declaration of, pub of local emergency and that we authorize various um, unilateral activities by the city of Malibu that would make PCH safer, or at least would, would try to make PCH safer. And I welcomed um, thoughts from others as to what um, measures might be taken besides those that I specifically identified. Um, there was resistance to even doing that. There was concerns that we would be pissing people off. Pardon my, pardon my saying that that's not the accurate way to say it, but at, you know, disturbing um, legislators or others who might help us, which I don't believe. You know, it's like the, when you call the fire department because your house is on fire, I don't think they're angry at you because you start, because you spray it with a hose until they can show up. Um, they're gonna come and do their job but until they get there, you got to do what you can. 
But anyway, nobody, nobody proposed anything. There was some opposition to it, but notwithstanding that, three weeks later, we had a meeting and we did adopt an emergency declaration. I advocated that it have teeth. It didn't have teeth. It's just a bark. And uh, that's, where we are today. that's where we are today. And I'm going to ask that we come back with something. I'm going to explain why and what we should come back with. And I'm going to keep proposing this. Every meeting, I'm going to propose this until it either gets done or I can't talk anymore or I'm not here anymore. So um, I'm going to ask for a consensus that we bring back um, a further declaration or an urgency ordinance or some other resolution, something that will have the effect of creating traffic calming measures on PCH, such as restrictions against driving in excess of a specified velocity that is less than the posted speed limit, requiring drivers to stop at specified locations where there is no crosswalk or traffic signal, in order to create our own further places where you need to stop. Um, possibly other measures, and again, I invite other council members when we have that discussion, if they're willing to bring it back, to propose other measures. Um, I submit the city council has the power to accomplish these objectives through a combination of the following sources. And I was, I was so glad to hear, you know, I'm sorry that I have to, we have to hear from them, but I was glad to hear from the parents of some of the um, young women who were so tragically killed because you know, they're, they're advocating this too, and, and I think we owe it to them, we owe it to our residents, we owe, it to, we owe it to the people who visit the city to do these things. First of all, in order, quote, to mitigate the effects of man-made emergencies that result in conditions of disaster or in extreme peril to life or li property, that's a quote, section 8550 of the California Government Code finds and declares it to be necessary quote, to confer upon the governing bodies of political subdivisions of the state the emergency powers provided and then in that code. More specifically, Section 8634 says, during a local emergency, the governing body of a political subdivision may promulgate orders and regulations necessary to provide for the protection of life and property. And we have made such a declaration. We've promulgated that there is a local emergency. For purposes of the foregoing laws, the term political subdivision includes any city, so we, we have the authority, statutory authority to do that. We're the, city, we're the governing body of the city of Malibu, so we're conferred with the powers in a, in a local emergency to promulgate orders and regulations necessary to provide for the protection of life and property. We have not promulgated them. We have simply said there's an emergency. The United States Supreme Court has held that personal liberty of the citizens may be temporarily restrained as a measure of public safety during a public emergency. It's in a case that was decided during World War II. The period of emergency there was the war. Subsequent to that, however, the Puerto Rico Supreme Court, and you know, I've been criticized in the past where someone said, what do we care about other states' laws? It's because they're, they're um, informative of what the law is when we don't have dispositive law here. The Puerto Rico Supreme Court has explained that the type of emergency giving rise to police powers that the Supreme Court was talking about in that case is not limited to war, and it stated that um, the inherent extraordinary police power of every legislator to confront an emergency of war exists also in civil emergency, and I think that's the point of our state statute. In that case, the emergency was the incidence of fatal accidents on the roads. So the, the, the legislature there adopted special rules to deal with the incidence of fatal accidents on their roads. Without regard to whether we have the statutory right to adjust the speed limit on PCH, we have the extraordinary police power to restrain the personal liberty of individuals within the territorial jurisdiction of our city to reduce conditions of extreme peril to life or property. We can do this by restricting the right of people driving on PCH to drive the speed limit, not lower the speed limit, re and restrict the right to drive the speed limit. We can restrict the right of people to drive through areas that lack a Caltrans-approved traffic signal. By the way, I'm going to back up for a moment because I forgot to say. I didn't attend, but I watched the PCH task force meeting, and it was very clear that Senator Allen, Assemblywoman um, Irwin, and um, Supervisor Horvath want to help and, and want to do a lot of the things we want to do and would do them tomorrow if they could, but they can't. It's going to take time, and they may not be successful. They have to, they have to persuade other legislators. 
Caltrans is not doing anything. They're not going to do anything other than pay lip service and drag their feet. But again, like the fire department, if they eventually can help us, great. But in the meantime, until they can help us, we need to help ourselves. So I believe traffic calming measures that I'm proposing and others that I hope others will propose are, quote, necessary to provide for the protection of life and property, close quote, during the local emergency that we have already declared. Second, Section 8634 of the Government Code specifically provides that the governing body of a political subdivision may promulgate, quote, orders or regulations imposing a curfew within designated boundaries where necessary to preserve the public order and safety, close quote, during a local emergency. Pursuant to that section, we could impose a blanket curfew against driving on PCH within the city limits of the city of Malibu. I'm not advocating that. I'm just noting that this law would permit that, it expre expressly permits a curfew. Um, and a subset of that was actually done by the sheriff during the Woolsey fire. They shut down PCH coming into Malibu, and they wouldn't let anybody into Malibu during the fire and after the fire for a period of time. They didn't have Caltrans permission to do that. Um, but in any event, as a general matter, when a government body has the power to create a blanket restrictions, it also has the authority to create exceptions and conditions to that restriction. So we could impose a curfew against driving on specified segments of PCH during our duly declared local emergency, with the exception being that it's permissible to drive on those segments of PCH at a specified velocity, no more than 35 miles per hour in certain instances. So long as, and, also, and so long as drivers stop at specified locations where we tell them they must stop to preserve the public safety. So these could be exceptions to a curfew, which we are expressly permitted to adopt. Third, although the government code doesn't explicitly state the city's police powers during a duly declared local emergency are greater than otherwise exist, multiple explanations of that law state that the police powers in such circumstances are, quote, extraordinary, close quote, not just the normal police powers. That's a statement right out of the Cal OES um, website. LA County has declared this, Santa Clara County has declared this, and multiple other cities in California, all of these. And I could provide citations to where they all state this. Lastly, Section 22350 of the California Vehicle Code provides, no person shall drive a vehicle upon a highway at a speed greater than is reasonable or prudent having due regard for weather, visibility, traffic on, and the surface and width of the highway, and in no event at a speed which endangers the safety of persons or property, close quote. That's clearly going on routinely in Malibu. People are driving not prudently and not reasonably given all the conditions, the engineering of, of the highway in Malibu, the homes on the, on the road in Malibu, the fact that pedestrians are walking on the shoulder along, along PCH, the fact that cars are parking parallel, backing up, stopping traffic in the, in the right lane. All of these things make it prudent and reasonable to drive below the posted speed limit. The posted speed limit is not the authorized speed. It is the limit that you may go, and it can be further limited by the circumstances. So we could declare in a, in a um, urgency ordinance or in a proclamation um, that the circumstances are such that it is not prudent or reasonable to drive at the posted speed limit in specified places. Now, that's, I asked, this is why I asked the question of Sergeant Sutherland. I mean, I don't know whether these will do anything. I think I know we can do them, but I don't know whether they, can do, whether they will be successful in accomplishing anything. But there must be things that can be done. And a little pain for us in terms of congestion and it taking longer for us to get around is a small cost to pay for the safety that it'll bring on. So again, I, I, I'm, I'm asking, Actually, I'm pleading that we bring this back at the next meeting, if not sooner, um, for discussion and hopefully approval of an urgency ordinance or a further proclamation that will direct the city to impose traffic calming measures. We can discuss what they should be. We can bring in some experts, perhaps, that can help us understand what they should be. But we need to do this sooner than later. We're not, we can't wait for um, Caltrans. It's not going to get us anywhere. Can I get support for that? Bruce, if you can tell me who's going to enforce it, I'd be more than willing to listen to your argument. It doesn't. Well, first of all, we can discuss that during the um, during the meeting. Well, no, but I, whether think, it, I think we need to know who's going to uh, pull people over on the side of the road 
and tell them they're driving too fast. Last time I checked, we have a sheriff's department for that, and they have the laws and the rules to do that already. The question is, do we have enough people out there to do it? We don't need to have another system. We need to have the people and the structure we already have in place to enforce it. Okay, so I'll take that to be you don't support having the discussion I'm asking for unless I can adequately answer that question, which I can't. Can I get support from two other people? Yeah, I mean, and, and I, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, we've talked to, again, when we were doing the uh, memorial out there for the tires for the people who got, uh, died on PCH, while well, we're everybody standing around talking about how we're, you know, we want to save or make PCH safer, the sheriff and Chip, the highway patrol guy were picking off people left and right who were speeding on PCH. So even though we were standing there saying how bad speeding is, it didn't impact the drivers one iota. Uh, and and I think there are things above and beyond having the sheriff enforce things that we can do on PCH. You know, one of the things I'd be doing is what, is what they do on uh, PCH going into Santa Monica. I'd put a crosswalk in there with a light that says if someone was, wants to go across, they hit the thing, the light lights up, and it stops the cars. There are things that we could probably do, so I'm going to support. I think it's a good idea. Let's bring it back. Do it. Look, I think our job, well, let me go back. You know, everybody complains about PCH who says that their motto is safety is their first objective. And uh, we all know that's not correct. So I think safety should be our first objective, and I think we should show that to the residents by doing something to try and make PCA safer. So I'm with you. So can we get one other person to support bringing it back for a discussion? We may not get support to do something. Can we get support, though, to have it as an agenda item so that we then can approve something if we decide to do so? Because we can't approve something when it's not on an agenda. I am not going to support it right now. Um, we already have studies. This is the 2227 PCH Public Works Department Capital Improvement Plan that includes many of the items from the 2015 program. We're going to be approving some of those items on tonight's agenda. Um, the other, you know, in addition to enforcement, who's going to be monitoring and installing these traffic calming measures throughout? the days and the weekends and everything else. Uh, typically, Caltrans is the one that does the work on PCH. And I don't know. I, I, I mean, I would look to the city manager and the city attorney. Is that even something we can do on the highway? So um, unfortunately, I'm not able to support it. Uh, but I think that we are taking steps to do quite a few things that have been outlined to do improvements. And we need to work on the legislature and the governor to allow the speed laws to be changed so we can lower the speed limit on PCH. So I'm, I apologize, but I just I can't support it right now. So, Paul, can we get you to support it or does it go down and we won't have a discussion? At the present time, Bruce, I've found that by driving the speed limit, I'm, there's plenty of people out there who are not driving the speed limit for them to stop and ticket. And I think that stopping and ticketing those people is probably the best way to slow traffic on Pacific Coast Highway and get people to realize that this is not a topia at Disneyland where it's fun to drive fast and run, bump into the people in the cart ahead of you. This is, this is not, it's pretty basic stuff. And our... The, the accident that happened wasn't really an accident. The guy was going almost two, he was going almost two and a half times the speed limit. If he had been driving the speed limit, would he have lost control? Probably not. If whoever was chasing him would have caught him very quickly. But this is, this is the reality we have is for many years, Starting with the pandemic, people just decided that this was a great place to drive as fast as they wanted to, and we just have to train them. And that's what's going on right now, training them. Okay, so um, thank you all for the consideration. Um, I will bring this up again at the next meeting and ask for consensus, and I will continue to do so, and maybe after the next person gets killed, we'll actually have a consensus to bring this forward and take unilateral action. Bruce, um, I have been. Bruce, yes. Ed, one thing. I mean, we we discussed this issue, and Doug, you were with us. Uh, 
with the consultants we have up in Sacramento. And my recollection was they thought it was a good idea. But to do an emergency ordinance and get something in place. To have an emergency ordinance and put it in place for what we're allowed to do. No, yeah. that, that's not, we, we said okay, something well, is going to let us It do remains some. to be seen what we're allowed to do. The right. only way we're going right. to find out what we're allowed to do is by doing it. And if somebody wants to sue us for an injunction, I think like, I think it was Mr. Stewart that said, I agree with that. Let them sue us. Let them explain to the public that they're stopping us from saving lives. Let them do it. What's going to happen? We'll be told to, if we lose, we're told to stop doing it. If we win, we actually accomplish something. I go back to what Mary Ann just said. We have items on our uh, public uh, capital improvement plan, the capital improvement plan for the city, which address several of the issues that are in the uh, study for 2015. Exactly what uh, the two parents talked about. Having Caltrans uh, projects completed, the city's doing them on our own. Okay, well, I'm going to move on to the next item. The last thing I'll say about this, this isn't about bringing it back. Um, like Paul and Doug, I have also been um, making sure I set my cruise control when I drive through Malibu. Just the other day, I pulled out of the street where I live, and another car pulled out of the same street. I was so disappointed. And I put the, my, I drove the speed limit. The person was on my tail. They were aggravated. They almost ran me off the road. They finally swerved around me and almost cut me off as they got back into the same lane I'm in. It's absurd. All right, farmer's market. First of all, bravo to the residents. I mean, that was such a well-orchestrated um, presentation tonight. I mean, I, I love the order in which it was done. It's a shame that that one um, video was missing. But that, that was phenomenal. Um, I'm going to ask for this one. I'll, I'll, uh, first of all, I, as a lawyer, I, will, I, I won't and I can't advocate doing something which I believe to be unlawful. And by the way, I don't believe the, the traffic calming things are unlawful. If I, if I thought they were, I wouldn't advocate them. Um, so I, I can't advocate for just allowing the farmer's market to be at Legacy Park when there's clearly a legal instrument, a deed, which prohibits it without the consent of multiple parties. Um, I've read that the document. I'm not an expert on deeds, but I've read the document backwards and forward over again. Um, I don't think there's a loophole that says that we can just unilaterally authorize that. I wish we could. I am happy to have conversations with the various parties whose consent would be necessary, and I think we ought to have those conversations. But um, in the absence of consent, I don't believe we can accomplish that. Notwithstanding that, I would like to ask for a consensus to bring back an item at the next meeting to direct the staff to take whatever action is necessary to permit the farmer's market to operate on whatever part of the county parking lot the county is willing to make available, plus Civic Center Way between the entrance of the Chili Cook-Off lot and, at a minimum, the eastern entrance of the county parking lot and further down Civic Center Way if we're not legally required to leave open at least one entrance to the county parking lot. Kelsey or somebody, can we put up the diagram that I provided you? you know, and, and this is what they do. Santa Monica, Culver City, multiple other places just close down a street for their farmers markets. So the red area that I've put a square on, that begins past the entrance to the Chili Cook-Off lot so people could go in there and park. And it ends, the red one ends right before the one of the two entrances to the library. So it would, it would not be impeding anybody from accessing any of the properties. It wouldn't impede people from parking. The only thing it would do is impede people from driving from Cross Creek over to Webb Way, which they don't have to do 24-7. Um, most of the people driving there on Sundays are going to and from the farmer's market anyway. So I'd like to, and if we're legally allowed to do it, and I don't know the answer one way or the other, I, I suspect we have the power, but I don't know. I'd like to extend it possibly even further. And they wouldn't even need to use the county parking lot if we had that much space. And again, it would be just like they do in Santa Monica, just like they do in Culver City, and just like they do in many other cities whose um, farmers markets I have not attended. So um, can we get a consensus to bring that back as an item for approval so that we can save the farmers market? I think we could bring it back. Let's don't restrict ourselves uh, to just that one idea. I think there's 
I'll be a discussion about uh, where we are with the county and so forth and my comments will talk about that but I do think we need to bring this back for a review uh, at the first opportunity this is a possible suggestion although the first first question I think is going to come up is where's everybody going to park but that's beside the point at this point parking is exactly the same place chili cook-off lot it's right there it's open yeah I think you block it if you go much further I agree that's why it starts there I'll, I'll second or third wherever we are to bring it back yeah is, it, is that to uh, bring back a, re a report and um, possible options for um, the operation of the farmers market bring we back an be. item that would permit us if we choose to do so at that meeting to direct the staff to take affirmative action so it, it might even be to adopt an urgency ordinance but get it on an agenda so that when we discuss it we are empowered to act rather than just empowered to talk and it's it's for not just that option but other options for whatever the, options uh, will save the farmers market yeah. for other options for operation of the market okay. uh, so we have three so far can we at least get it unanimous I'd like to point out that they they have the option right now of of putting it in the parking lot for the college they need to fill out the forms they, we, they need to if they want more space they need to negotiate for more space but they need to fill out the forms okay so you don't favor having the discussion I didn't I did not say that that was the only question that's pending should we have the discussion is this an agendized item no I'm asking for a consensus to bring it back we already have three people and I'm just asking I, whether we can get it unanimity now sure bring it back um, yeah I'm fine with bringing it back I would like to have um, a more robust report why it's not back at the county um, have there been issues and things I know I'm getting a single here that they're making it smaller but they do have a conditional use permit from the city that stipulates exactly how large it can be so that's what I want clarification on if it's the county is saying that it's this is what the conditional use permit says so that's what they're allowing them so I want that information um, I also want a pretty um, robust information from Public Works as to exactly what that means to close down one of our streets and what the requirements are I know in Santa Monica they've had to install barriers um, I don't know if that's K rails I don't know what that is so making sure that we're taking we have the proper safety things and how that's going to be implemented mm -hmm. um, in order to accommodate that but I'm open to exploring it yeah you know, all those things will be part of the discussion I think those are great ideas okay so um, thank you that that concludes my remarks okay I'll try not to be as long as Bruce um, first off uh, things I did those last few weeks uh, similar to other people ad hoc policy meeting uh, we worked on the code of conduct for the commissioners and the council members uh, PCH task force meeting I was at that ghost tire ceremony ghost tire ceremony on the 14th and the day of remembrance on the 19th coffee with the deputy and uh, let's talk about a few things uh, going on I wish Dick Van Dyke had been here tonight wish him uh, good health and we hope to see him at the next meeting uh, as far as CHP coming back absolutely I think that uh, that's excellent work on the part of our city manager public safety director and uh, all the other people that work for us on that this is not something that was easily accomplished this has been from the top down the governor's office our legislators city man, uh, county supervisor it has been everybody pulling together to get that done and that's what it takes to get these uh, changes on PCH we need everybody pulling together not uh, unilaterally making our own decisions uh, as far as um, uh, emergency approval for LIDAR I believe the city manager has got uh, authority to write a check um, I said to him when uh, I said to the uh, sheriff's deputy or sergeant on traffic what do you need he told me he needed four LIDAR guns um, I think they cost about four or five thousand dollars a piece hopefully we can find that in the piggy bank all right um, I will say that things have changed for the better in uh, Malibu the last month I know the mayor talks about uh, not hearing cars on PCH I live on Latigo and I can tell you in the middle of the night whether those are Porsches Ferraris or Lamborghinis that are going down there at usually 10 to 15 cars at the most it is amazing what they were been running they're not running them anymore 
Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, Highway Patrol. Um, Rob Houston, hate to see you go. You've been a nice addition to the staff here. You filled in well until we could get a full compliment at the uh, city manager's office. And um, I wish you well in your, your future. You're, you're a good ad. And um, I know anytime we need somebody to help us out again, I, he'd be top of the list if he's available. Um, farmer's Market. You know, I'm disappointed that the key people left. Uh, we say been here. Um, I happen to be a person that thinks the Farmer's Market Legacy Park is an excellent choice for it. And I first time I went over there, first time I went over there after it moved, I said, this is the right place for it to be. Uh, but that's not the way the game is played. The Farmer's Market, just like uh, everything else, a deal is a deal. The people that uh, we bought the Legacy Park from had a stipulation as to what it could be used for, and that was part of the consideration for the purchase price. I'm sure that's that's how it was negotiated. Uh, and when a deal's a deal, it's the deal that says this is what you can use it for. We had a deal with the farmer's market that said you could move over to Legacy Park on a temporary basis because we wanted to help keep you open. We extended our hand. No charge. If you can see the emails that I've received about how greedy the city is on fees, how we're going to shut down the farmer's market, all the misinformation that's out there, this is sad because here we are trying to do the right thing and help everybody out. And we're being uh, pillared for it. Now, the deal was it was supposed to be off the Legacy Park and back at the county lot uh, I think mid-summer. We gave an extra two months uh, extension to October 7th. That was the deal then, that was the deal when they moved in, that was the deal by October 7th. October 7th came, they didn't move. Now I've seen the maps that show that yes, the county wants to shrink the area for the uh, uh, vendors. I counted 76 vendor spaces, spaces on the map. Now when I talked to uh, Deborah last night, I said, Deborah, how many spaces are you getting? Oh, I don't know. Well, how many spaces do you have now? I don't know. How many spaces do you think you need? I don't know. I got nothing but I don't know. And she's trying to negotiate with the county, and she's also trying to tell us that we need to get her farmer's market at Legacy Park or not shut it down. I understand they have a deal on the table to be at the county lot. Now, maybe it's not the deal they want. Maybe it's not the deal that was promised. But the deal is a deal as far as where they're going to locate in a the Problem today is probably what they're having to deal with the county as to the number of spaces that she wants versus what they're making available. That's where we need to negotiate with the uh, for the farmers market is with the county. That's where the space is, and I think the city manager has pointed out we have a deed restriction, and we also have a zoning issue at being at Legacy Park. So let's don't play with fire here on a deed restriction. Let's get these people on the farmers market open at the county lot where they used to be had been for what 16 years 13 years whatever it is it worked fine over there it's not as nice as legacy park but legacy park's not available right now and i agree with the mayor uh pardon me the uh, former mayor council member silverstein if we can do something to help them out we should but the first place and the best place to help them out is to get them back at the place where they have an <clears throat> agreement and that's the that's the uh, county lot if it's not enough space, then tell us. But don't tell me I don't know. And that's what I got last night when I said, how many spaces do you need? I don't know. So, Deborah, if you want to help, want us to help you, you got to help us help you. Um, lastly, I'll give you the comment that I've made every time we've had a meeting here, and I think a couple of people, people have mentioned it, set the pace on PCH. If you ask us what can you do to make PCH safer, it's right in front of your steering wheel. Look right down at your speedometer, set your cruise control. You do 50 miles an hour, 45 miles an hour, whatever the speed limit is. That sets the pace for uh, Malibu. It says that we, as citizens of this city, are going to obey the laws. It starts with us. Everybody else will follow behind you. They may not like it, but this is not a racetrack. Okay? That's it. Yes, yeah, Steve, just one thing. Thank you for the, the, the time. I, I, I had it in my notes, and I forgot to read it. Trevor, are we allowed to ha can the city of Malibu put autonomous cars on PCH? 
self-driving cars? Yes. Very much. There's state regulations about how those operate. I'm not familiar exactly. with um, all the rules and regulations that apply to them. Cool. I, I think they're also site specific. I know they can operate in, in Santa Monica. Waymo has ones going there. I know they have in, in, in uh, San Fran. They have special legislation. I don't know in Malibu. Can we, can we look into that? Because that's one of the things I had as the various ideas we could do, and, and this one doesn't even re run afoul of anything for Caltrans, is we could put self-driving cars on PCH in tandem. They could drive on both lanes. They could drive 35 miles an hour or 40 miles an hour, and you cannot get past them. So um, I'd like to look into that, and if it's legal, I'd like to explore with the city council doing it. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Okay, uh, I'm not going to go through all the I did show up at the giveaway for the buckets last it was two Saturdays ago, and, and like I was there like at 9.30. They were all out of them. So, it, it, And I think that just shows that the residents are now becoming more aware of what's going on and are, you know, trying to deal with global warming and, and the impacts of that and trying to save some, some water out there. I think that was good. I did the, our PCH task force meeting, and I also attended the memorial for the tire uh, for the students, for the people who got killed on PCH. A couple comments. I am disappointed with my fellow council people. When, PC, when we did it at the PCH task force meeting, and we said it to everybody we've talked to since those four do girls died on PCH, we committed to do anything and everything we could to make PCH safer. Anything and everything. Makes no, our job is to make it safer. Now, whether Bruce's recommendation is going to help us solve that I don't know but I think it's criminal not to try you know I mean I used to, I'll take it back to my business life all right I mean I've always said I for a handful of one dollar bills I can fill the room with people who tell me I can't do anything all right uh, they're easy to find let's let's figure out what it is we can do pursue whatever the hell that may be because I think we owe it to our residents we owe it to the people who died uh, and I think that's what our jobs are. So for that, uh, farmer's market. Uh, I've been trying to get some research to figure out, I mean, just to get smarter on what's going on with the market. Uh, I know that there is a deed restriction, and I disagree with my fellow Councilmember Paul. There is no specific call out for the farmer's market in that deed restriction. Uh, doesn't, it's nowhere in there. Uh, I also know that the, the conditional use permit that the city issued the farmer's market gave them and I'm, I'm, about 1,500 linear square feet, linear feet of space to put uh, tents up. I have, I have had three different stories now in terms of what the county is providing the farmer's market. In one case, they're, they're saying that the farmer's market is asking for more space than they previously had. I don't think that's correct. I've had another story that they're reducing the amount of space. So I've asked somebody to let me know how many linear feet the county is actually providing to the farmer's market. And, and I don't know how you guys negotiate, but it's sort of like uh, if, if I send them back there before they get the space that they need, the chances of them getting that space are bad and none. It's like, you know, I'll go back to Paul, the real estate agent, it's, you know, move into the house and then try and negotiate the price. I don't think it works that way. I think it would be helpful if the city could sit down and talk to the county, figure out what the hell they're actually giving us so we know what we're sending them back to. Right now, I have no idea. Uh, and it may, it may improve the farmer's market, may, could destroy the farmer's market. I don't know. But let's find out before we send somebody marching down that path. Uh, that's all I got for tonight. Okay. Any, any other comments? No? All right. Let me close that down. Uh, we got a consent count. Let's go through the consent count, then maybe we'll take a break. How's that? Uh, anybody, I got two items pulled. I got 3B7 and 3B5 pulled on the consent calendar by the, re the speaker residents. Anybody else want to pull anything? There are, there are two raised hands, but I think there's a call in user, but I think it's Ryan. And there's another raised hand from Ryan. Mayor, do you want the speaker to indicate what item they yeah, would like to speak on? Yeah, this would be wants to pull an item, which one it is. Ryan, do you want to pull something? Hi, this is Ryan. Can you hear me? Barely. Hello? Yeah. You want to pull anything to the consent calendar? It's 3B5, 6, and 7. 
guys six and seven. Okay. Anybody else at the council table want to pull anything? Bruce? I just want to indicate my vote no without comment on 3B4 for the same reasons at the last two meetings. Yeah. Okay. Can I just get a clarification? Can I get a clarification on 3B4 real quick from somebody? <clears throat> uh, this should be the last one we're going to be doing because it ends uh, January 1st. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. There'd be no need to reauthorize after this one. And on uh, 3B8, uh, we have a one-year maturity on that. Is Do we need to address that in this section or is that somewhere else? That's the one on the Film Society where we said we would do a temporary approval of this waiver. I'm looking at Trevor. Uh, I'm sorry, what's the question? All right, well, I'll tell you what, let's pull it, and then I'll ask the question. Okay, okay. so we're going to pull 3B5, 3B6, 3B4, 3B5, 3B6, 3B7, and 3B8. Okay. I don't Go. think, do we need four? I don't think anyone said four. No? Just five, just six, scratch seven. Scratch four, five, six, seven, and eight. For four, we're just noting my, yeah. <clears throat> okay, five, six, seven, and eight. Can I get a motion to do that? I'd like to make a motion that we approve items 3B1, 2, 3, <clears throat> and 4, recognizing that Bruce is going to vote no on four. I'll second. Okay. Roll call, Kelsey. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Mayor Yearing? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, 3B5. Do we need a staff report or questions? Who pulled it? Be happy to give a report uh, if, if you'd like. Public. Ryan. Uh, give us a quick report. Huh? <clears throat> I don't know what the comment is yet. Sure, Mr. Mayor, uh, this, this item uh, is, is on the agenda tonight for the City Council's ratification. Um, this contract was approved by myself as your City Manager using the emergency powers that the City granted me at the uh, most recent regular meeting. Uh, this provides for up to $50,000 uh, for the City to purchase uh, CHP officer time on, a, on an overtime basis. <clears throat> Uh, this will serve as a, a short-term or interim contract until we can hopefully work out a longer-term contract with the CHB. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Joe. I think you're the one that pulled this, right? I'm sorry, I didn't. I was looking at the top sheet and it's the bottom sheet. So, Ryan, Ryan did too. Thank you for bringing the CHP back to Malibu. We are in an emergency <clears throat> state, so I thought it would be covered by the state. To bring it back quickly, obviously, we need to allocate funds to this if this isn't the case. On PCH every week, there's someone going over 100 miles per hour, and they usually are not residents, and they don't obey the speed limits no matter what it is. We need a certain law amended and fines increased because our city of 10,000 people cannot handle all these visitors and all these traffic violations, accidents, and deaths. We heard that there have been 53 deaths in the last 10 years, and that is insane for this stretch of highway, especially with seven lost lives just this year. We need to lobby Senator Allen and the county supervisors and amend Section 2400.6, the California Vehicle Code, to just have these terrible statistics stop and bring CHP back permanently to the PCH. Basically delete everything after the word city and not force our city to be in any contract with them and to require CHP to resume patrolling PCH funded by the entire state's collection of taxes as it did when the county was keeping 100% of our property tax, not just the small difference of 93 to 94% now. Please get the senator to bring this bill and pull support for it when session restarts. If we don't find alternative funding, our city will go broke or continue to exploit and punish small resident projects like mine with exorbitant fees. So another alternative can be to tell the county that we will no longer fund the LA County Sheriff's Beach Team for their county beaches and save millions per year that can go towards funding this CHP. Over 50,000 vehicle trips per day on PCH is a disproportionate economic burden for traffic law enforcement on PCH for a city of approximately 10,000 residents, but 50 million annual visitors compressed mostly into three summer months minus commuters. We should not be funding these months on the beach. Caltrans needs to make active changes physically to the PCH, so not a highway where kids want to go 100 miles per hour or even 45 or 65 miles per hour, but to reduce it to at least 40 miles per hour and engineer it this way, such as Lance Simmons, etc., have been lobbying for years. Whether it's medians or roundabouts or narrower lanes, it needs to be bike-friendly and pedestrian-friendly with no more big commercial development along PCH that just brings more traffic and visitors. 
Caltrans needs to step up and take, as it takes them 10 years to even fix a pipe along the PCH on Malibu Road, so I hope they act quickly. The city should write to the governor immediately to get a rush order for Caltrans to complete this. PCH remains an ongoing hazardous emergency, and the city as well as residents need to request the governor to send mutual aid. If you can give a direct email address for the governor's address, as I could, as I could only send a generic request message via the governor's website. I don't understand why the entire council doesn't unanimously do something to slow down traffic with emergency measures as council member Silverstein has suggested to be even discussed, as we will likely have to wait more than 2.7 months, and that means an average of one more person will get killed. The sheriff in Malibu is underdeployed now, so relief from PCH by getting CHP is currently the only option. So we appreciate you bringing them back at any cost, but the long-term plan needs to be cost-effective and funded by agencies other than our city. And in the okay. short term, the council needs to approve temporary speed reducing measures on PCH. Thank you, Joe. Did Brian, Brian pulled the C on 35. Go ahead, Brian. <clears throat> Brian. Brian, we've asked you to unmute on both of your devices. Ryan, you are unmuted on your computer. Okay, well, not sure where Ryan is, but. He's happy to put Well, yeah, maybe. Okay, let's move along. It's 3B5, I need a motion to approve 3B5. I'll make a motion to approve it. Second? There's nothing to approve, it's a receive and file, but we have, I have comments. Okay, Bruce, I'm sorry, go ahead. So, first of all, actually, um, Steve McClary earlier said that we were gonna be ratifying this. I don't believe we're being asked to approve anything or ratify anything. This is just a receive and file. Um, I just want to call the council's attention to two provisions in this and the public's attention that bother me, and they're not, but, but first of all, this is a contract that's already been entered into. We're not, it, it's not even something that's being proposed. Um, but there are two provisions in this that trouble me, not enough that I would say we shouldn't do this because we need to do it, but they're, they're unfair and inappropriate, and I, I don't believe the state should be doing this to us. The first is provision five, which requires the city to indemnify CHP against and hold the CHP harmless for any kind of claim that might be against them, including for their own negligence. I think that's absurd that um, we are being forced to pay to get the police protection here that, we're, that we should be entitled to, and we not only have to pay them to come here, but we have to indemnify them for whatever they might do that's wrong that might result in their liability. That's crazy. Um, we're also being required to pay overtime. And, and again, we, we, you know, that statute that a lot of people think was a penalty for us becoming a city, in, in some sense it was, but it wasn't because anybody was angry. The CHP does not patrol um, non-expressways. If it's a state highway, they don't patrol a plain old state highway. If it's in a municipal, um, if it's in an, an incorporated municipal area, which P, PCH in Malibu is, um, that statute that a lot of people think says that we are segregated and don't get their protection, that's actually not what the statute does. It was requested by our city council. It requires them to provide us with patrols if we enter into a contract to secure it. We shouldn't have to agree to exorbitant and ridiculous provisions to get that statutorily entitled protection. So um, I just think that this is these are, some of these provisions are ridiculous, but we need to do it. I'm glad we're doing it. And I hope that we look into at some point in the future getting reimbursed by the state for the money that we shouldn't have to pay. Thank you, Bruce. Anybody else? Marianne? I would concur. I, I, I understand for the short term um, this is an emergency provision that we need to get this going. But given the, the amount of money that... Um, the, the, the state and the county takes from our property taxes in addition to the amount of people that use our local areas that are not residents here. Um, it would be nice to explore ways that we can get either some type of reimbursement or a change in the tax allocation from our property taxes because uh, it does seem like an undue burden between the amount we pay for sheriff and now um, taking on the fees for the CHP. Um, it's it's going to be something that future councils are going to wrestle with because 
we're going to have to start choosing between providing law enforcement and things for our residents. So I am concerned, but I uh, recommend that we um, accept this. So uh, <clears throat> anybody else? Do we need a motion to approve this one? Just receive and file. Uh, yeah, under the done. It needs to be reported. Three B six. Who pulled it? Who pulled three B six? Ryan. Ryan, you around for this one? Ryan, we're asking you to unmute you on there? both your devices. We can hear you yeah, on the can phone. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. What? Yes, we can hear you. This is 3B6. Okay, finally. Um, sorry, Wait, it's you, not been working tonight. No. I wanted, uh, well, on the prior item, I wanted you to actually authorize the city manager to extend it to 10 days because there's a typo in there. It's, it started on the 6th of November, and it, then it says on the 16th on the next page or until the money is depleted. Um, but anyway, he could come back to you for that before February comes on the end of that agreement. Um, for, for this item, 3B6, is this the, the one for the medians? Yes. Okay. So it's $2 million, and the medians extend 500 feet on either side of Paradise uh, Cove Road. So if you do the simple math, that's $2,000 per foot for a center median. That's quite a lot of money. And the other point is this is a funding agreement, but when it comes to um, the completion of the project and, and certifications that it's done, we need to make sure that the city of Malibu has not joined the state of California at the hip for liability on the constructed improvements in the middle of the highway. Um, this is a big deal. It'll come back to haunt some future city council someday. And we realize we're co-funding, helping uh, uh, design or giving expertise of the staff time toward this project. But this is a state highway. They can't keep having it both ways and asking for us to chip in uh, to fund a lot of these projects. This is probably the fourth project. And I also wanted to say the MOUs with Caltrans, they should all be reviewed um, for legality and for being appropriate. We have several MOUs going on for traffic signals and other things um, that are not in the city's best interest. So if this project came back twice because of the funding limit and is how did this compare at $2,000 per linear foot compared to when this thing was first bid and it came back? Uh, or is this just the same bidder with a height with the same price tag? Um, so those are my main comments on 3B6. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Need a motion to approve 3B6? I have some oh, questions. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Doug. I was going to say, do we need a uh, staff presentation or not? Staff comment? You want? I, I have questions. I don't know that I need a. I don't know. I mean, I don't, does anybody need a staff report? We just go to questions. Go ahead, Moran. So um, my questions are the um, the bus stop was talked about near Paradise Cove to be relocated. Is that included in this? And where is it going? So we'll look at that during the design process. There's going to be an evaluation of um the actual design and, and what elements are going to be put in there and, and if there's any conflicts with the with the existing bus stop we'll look at um, provisions on how we can relocate it okay is there um also more area that can be carved out for that because i i did notice in the the pch safety study that that bus stop was con discussed with concerns that um there may not be enough for people getting on and off the bus, um, having safe space there. So we'll, we, yeah, we'll and be And I'm talking about the one on the north side. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we'll be looking at all that when we do their, do our design, and what uh, the design elements, how that affects any existing improvements, what other improvements need to be added to that to make that a safe area. Okay. Um, my other question in that particular area was, um, it says that the median's going to extend additional, um, is there more, what is the interaction with uh, West Winding Way? Are they gonna have plenty of room to be able to come out? There's not gonna be any impacts to West Winding Way 
being able to enter with that turn pocket being extended and where's the median going to be in that vicinity? So but once again, that will be like all those details will be will be hashed out during our design process to okay. look at those things. But yeah, it, it, any existing turn turning movements, any existing left turns going into certain side streets will be evaluated during the design process. Okay. And then I guess my other one's going to be down. Um, it talks about from Bush. So where exactly is this area in the Bush um, PCH? Is it just from the signal to the west, or is it going to encompass um, between Westward Beach Road and P uh, Bush Drive? From from what I recall, it's it is. I, I believe it's right next to Bush and um, the area you just mentioned, the second area you're talking about. Okay. Because I know, I mean, my experience has been coming out of Westward Beach Road. There's oftentimes when you have to go into that double safe area um, just because of the yep. traffic impacts in there. Yep. So I just want to make sure that we're not going to be putting a median and then nobody's going to be able to turn out and have any safe refuge. Right. So um, coming out of Westward. So all those will take it, will, that will be in consideration to design that we'll look at those safety elements to make sure that the improvements make that safe and uh, do not pro provide any unsafe conditions for people okay. to return left. And uh, yeah, the same consideration for the left turn into Zuma Beach, um, given the state of the undercrossing for now. So, okay. Thank a you. Any other, Bruce? Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, I, medians are good. Medians are a further safety measure. Uh, more medians would be even better. Um, Ryan was, com I, if I understood his comments, he was saying we shouldn't have to pay for this kind of thing. If I understand this, this is coming from Measure M, the entire amount. Do, does, does that cost the city anything? No. Okay, I didn't think so. And, and, and is there any material work being done by you and other city employees, or is it all done by Caltrip? Who does the work? It's it's all funded by Measure M, and so we manage that project with those funds. Uh, we go to Caltrans and get the necessary permits based on design to to build these improvements within Caltrans right away. So I guess his complaint is just that we're we're using city time to manage the project. Yeah, yeah, there are some elements that where we get our staff time is reimbursed. So so yeah, there is that element too. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Paul, uh, Rob, uh, there was a proposal to ch move the entrance to Zuma Beach to be directly opposite from Bush Drive so that it could take advantage of that light there. Is that going to be included in this project? Uh, no, it isn't. Okay. I'll make a motion that we approve this item. Well, I was just have one more comment. Is there some way that we can look at that as a possibility? I mean, it seems like it's a. I, I, it's this agreement is pretty sound with Metro and the funding. We would, if we have to change the agreement, that we would have to go back to Metro and, and amend our, our agreement with them to do this. I'm not saying we we can't. It's it, it would take time, and we would have to really look at and evaluate it and, and make sure that that what we're doing or adding to the project meets their meets their funding guidelines for a project. So, I guess, um, so there is that ability to do that. We just have to evaluate it. So maybe my, the, the, my follow-up question would be, is there anything about this possible design that could severely impact the ability to do that work in the future? No. Okay. Thanks. Bruce, you would make a motion? <clears throat> yeah, I move that we approve item 3B6. Need a second? I'll second. Kelsey, roll call, please. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Mayor Uring? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, 3B7. Uh, Joe, you pulled that. You need a staff report? I'm commending the Public Works Department and Rob DeBoe on activating so many projects that were recommended in the 2015 PCH safety study. 
All of these need to be completed. I do especially support the signal synchronization program, including the red lights being triggered by speeding to slow and stop people speeding on PCH. I do think that there's one item that needs to be reassessed. I don't recall hearing on Public Works Commission about so many electric vehicle chargers being allocated along Civic Center Way, taking up a majority of the public parking, for instance, for the farmer's market. There are several shopping centers surrounding that can provide these hours longs of electric vehicle parking charging, so please consider removing this from the capital improvement plan to be discussed further at our commission level or at least by Public Works with public input. There must be better options or just don't put so many, maybe just one or two. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Did Ryan pull this one also? Is he guys, is his hand still up or is he done? There are no raised hands. No raised hands. Uh, motion? I'll make a motion to approve. Need a second? Second. second. Kelsey? Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Mayor <clears throat> Uring? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Doug, you wanted to do 3B8? Yeah, it's just a clarification point. When we originally approved this Film Society uh, grant update, uh, grant, the idea was we were going to have a one-year uh, time limit on the, I'll call it a waiver, and just want to make sure that's still in place, and does this need to address that, or is this over? No, there's no change to the action that was taken by the okay. council previously. That, that's my question. Thank you. Okay. It's just receiving file. Receiving file. Receive and file. So that should take us to item through the consent calendar over to item 4A. Let's take, what, 10 minutes? Good idea. All right. 10 minutes. We've got a lot to do yet, so keep it close. Real tight to 10. Thank you. <coughs>
I want you to ask any question you want of me while you're back in the podium. No, no question is out of bounds. Okay, actually, this is the only meeting that's free to do. I don't imagine that trace of the source of this garbage statue that you have in front of you for attention tonight. The wholesale effort to hide behind every unity restriction in your LCP and apply it. All right, item 4A, the amendment to Title 17 Zoning Melbourne Municipal Code and Local Coastal Program to update regulations related to accessory dwelling units. Joyce, you're going to give us a staff report, I assume. You and Richard, whatever your team is down there. 
Thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. The item before you is consideration of the City's um, Accessory Dwelling Unit Ordinance. I'll start with a little background. The Planning Commission held several public hearings on the ordinance. Uh, September the 4th, 2018, May 20th, 2021, and March 7th, 2022, they held uh, public hearings. On the March 7th meeting, they directed staff to complete additional uh, studies. And then on March uh, 14th, 2023, they recommended approval of a draft ordinance. The City Council on August the 22nd, uh, 2022, reviewed the Planning Commission's request for additional studies and uh, determined that if the uh, ADU ordinance was like and similar to the second unit ordinance, then the additional studies would not be needed. And then on September 11th, 2023, was the City Council's first public hearing on the uh, ADU ordinance as recommended approval by the Planning Commission. And the hearing was continued uh, uh, to allow staff uh, to do some additional resource, research and uh, provide additional information. I will go quickly for these next two slides. These uh, slides uh, the council has seen uh, in the past, but they just give you a snapshot of what is uh, in the ordinance. The uh, attached, detached, and converted in accessory buildings and any uh, conversion of non-habitable space would require an uh, accessory uh, administrative coastal development permit and would be processed under the LCP if for some reason it was uh, processed under the MMC, which has to be consistent with state law, so those provisions have to be included in the MMC. Uh, there are several uh, categories, and one is a billing permit only or an administrative plan review, so th uh, those uh, depending on the project type, it would depend on the type of permit uh, should they be processed under the MMC. However, um, in all instances, it would be the LCP. Uh, the ADUs in inside multifamily uh, dwellings would not be allowed in the uh, LCP, and in the MMC, it would only be allowed in non-habitable space, such as garages and storage. And since those are non-habitable space, that kicks them to the LCP, so they would be uh, processed, uh, or they would go back to the LCP and it would not be allowed. The attached ADUs on multifamily uh, properties are not allowed um, in either the LCP or MMC, and detached um, are uh, require an ACDP uh, in the LCP and a uh, building permit only in the municipal code. Uh, but again, since it's a detached new ADU, it would be processed under the LCP. The decision authority in both uh, uh, approvals is the planning director. And um, that uh, decision is reported to the uh, planning commission, and it is appealable. <coughs> Excuse me. The, uh, in the MMC, uh, it is, uh, would not be, approval under the MMC would not be uh, reported to the Planning Commission and it is not appealable. For junior ADUs and ADUs inside of an existing single family uh, dwelling, those would be processed under the MMC with a building permit only. Those are considered uh, not development uh, for Coastal Commission purposes. So they would be processed under the Muni Code, and that would be, a, again, a planning director uh, decision. A few of the development standards. Um, the ordinance that you have before you and what was recommended by the Planning Commission has uh, 1,200 square feet uh, for the size of an ADU. Um, I, that was one of the items that the Council uh, asked us to uh, bring back for further discussion. On the, in the MMC, consistent with state law, it's eight, 850 for a studio or a one-bedroom or 1,000 for a two-bedroom unit. And um, this would be the same for a converted accessory building. So, for instance, if somebody had a pool house or something and they wanted to convert it to an ADU, in, under the LCP, it would be 1,200 square feet. And under the MMC, it would be uh, limited to the uh, size of the accessory building. Uh, in terms of the size of uh, an attached ADU, it's in the LCP, it's 50% of the living area of the existing primary dwelling or 
1,200 square feet, whichever is less. Uh, in the municipal code, it's 850 uh, for a studio or one bedroom, and then the 1,000 for two more bedroom, or 50% of the existing uh, single family dwelling, whichever is less. Uh, the size for the junior ADUs, which again will be processed under the municipal code, is 500 square feet. ADUs inside of an existing uh, single family house that are converting uh, uh, habitable space, there is no uh, size limit under the uh, municipal code. The uh, setbacks uh, under the LCP, same as the second unit, um, and that is the same for. Um, regular setbacks, and then a, de a demolished accessory building. In the MMC, it is four feet rear and side yard. And uh, if you if it was processed under the MMC, uh, it would be, and if a building was demolished, they could maintain the existing setbacks. Under the LCP, they'd have to um, increase the setbacks, but again, those are provisions in there because they need to match state code and it would be processed under the LCP, which would require same as the second unit. The height um, is 16 feet. Um, I believe one of the council members wanted to uh, discuss the possibility of uh, making that uh, higher uh, 18 to match um, the existing uh, code. Uh, 24 feet high with a site plan review and in the uh, municipal code, it's 16 feet high, uh, and there are exceptions up to 25 feet. And then the uh, all of the development standards, they are the same, except for the access requirements. Um, if, uh, Council will recall the Planning Commission had recommended a 20-foot wide street requirement, and the uh, Council um, were, uh, wanted to explore the 20-foot, uh, two means of access with a 24-foot wide street. And the same with the MMC, all of the standards uh, are as allowed by state law, uh, except for the 20-foot wide street uh, requirement. At your uh, last meeting on September 11th, uh, there was consensus reached on owner occupancy um, to require an owner in either the uh, ADU or the primary dwelling. There uh, was a discussion about two means of access, um, and this is only in the municipal code, not in the LCP. The, uh, that two means of access has always been in the MMC, but has uh, never been proposed in the LCP. Uh, this um, staff had done some research on what that means in terms of how many uh, properties would be impacted, and uh, maps were included as attachment six in the uh, City Council report, and I have those at the end of this presentation should the Council want to look at, at each, uh, any of them. However, it would mean that 80 to 85 percent of properties in Malibu uh, could not have an ADU, uh, basically all the canyon roads and cul-de-sacs. Um, HCD uh, will review um, our, uh, or has reviewed uh, several other cities and will review ours. Uh, we, we'll need to send it up to them. and. They, in all instances, have asked for evidence as to uh, when a city is proposing uh, provisions that are not specifically call, uh, outlined in state law. And our AD ordinance, of course, uh, has to be consistent with state law. If the council um, determines, staff is recommending that the no provisions uh, beyond what's in state law, uh, meaning no um, 24 foot, no two means of access or even a 20 foot wide street. But if the council wanted to do uh, uh, two means of access, uh, one thing um, to consider is that there are portions of Malibu Road and Morning View which are um, have two means of access that are less than 24 feet wide, and that would mean that anybody that relies on those two streets as one of their means of access would need to widen those streets or the portion of those streets that were less than 24 feet uh, before they can have an ADU. Excuse me, Joyce, your staff is recommending we don't do the two routes of access? Is that uh, correct? That's correct. Okay. We, we are... We, we are uh, recommending that no additional 
uh, given the fact that HCD will be scrutinizing this and we need um, a certified or an approved AD ordinance, um, our thought is that since all, most all, um, attached, detached, and converted will be processed under the LCP anyway, that uh, perhaps there's no need to put anything in the municipal code. The municipal code is what gets sent up to HCD uh, for review. So it would, uh, so that that's staff's recommendation. The other uh, item the city council wanted to discuss is a unit size. Currently, uh, the options 900 square feet is the guest house, uh, 1,000 square feet is the maximum in the MMC, and 1,200 square feet is for uh, what the city allowed for temporary housing. We did some research on how many uh, temporary housing permits were issued. We found 14 permits that were over uh, 900 square feet. We don't have any way of knowing whether those are, still exist, um, because some of them may have been removed when the um, property owner got occupancy to their main house. So we don't know that all 14 of these are still out there, but that was the number of permits that were issued. Um, the council wanted to know if there were additional regulations that could be added uh, <coughs> excuse me, to increase safety. And uh, staff has found none that would um, increase the safety uh, beyond what is uh, allowed in state law. And um, <clears throat> finally, the council wanted um, to discuss the terminology of guest house. Uh, we did a little research on that, and uh, it was difficult to come up with a, another term that was not, that didn't have, um, that would be clear that no bathroom was allowed in a guest house. Um, kitchen, kitchen, guest kitchen. quarters could be used. Um, but uh, another option is to add uh, the no kitchen um, prominently in the definition of a guest house uh, and prominently in the definition um, of an ADU so that if anybody looks at those definitions and the provision in the code, they will see right away that no kitchen is allowed. Uh, this slide, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Housing and Community Development, or HCD, review. Within 30 uh, days after the City Council uh, adopts an ADU ordinance, uh, staff will is required to send it to HCD. And um, so uh, they will be looking at it to see if it's compliant with state law. The staff is in the, is in the middle of updating the housing element, and 15% of the ADUs uh, uh, are, can be counted toward the city's regional housing needs uh, allotment or arena, and uh, that can be counted in the low-income category. So ADUs are an important part in helping the city meet its arena, and obtain a certified housing element. And <clears throat> that's why um, staff has, has made the recommendations we have, uh, because we want to get a approved ADU ordinance uh, to help us get a certified housing element. And with that, I think, no, just a couple of other things that I'm gonna turn over to Tyler. Uh, there has been some co correspondence and meetings. One was with uh, the Malibu Country Estates Overlay District. There was a discussion about this uh, at your last meeting, and um, staff wanted to uh, just be clear that there's no way in this ordinance that you could amend, you could allow ADUs uh, that are off the main building pad. So that overlay allows only one building pad per lot. So somebody in the uh, overlay uh, can have an attached ADU and they can also convert their inside of their house or their garage, so they can do that. And if they could attach an ADU on the one building lot, they could certainly do that, but I think the, the desire is to create a second building lot at a lower elevation. In order to do that, the overlay district would need to be amended, and that um, is not on the agenda tonight. On um, another piece of, a couple pieces of correspondence is with the two means of access. And so staff just wanted to um, be uh, clear 
and they were referring to the county codes. Um, there are two county codes. Um, one is uh, um, for all Los Angeles County, uh, which would include the north area plan, which is uh, adjacent to Agora Hills and, and that area further north. Um, that uh, is not in the coastal zone, and that is where the two means of access is found. In the Santa Monica Mountains Local Coastal Program, which is directly abutting the city, that act, uh, they actually have a 60-foot-wide uh, uh, requirement to have access and no ADUs within uh, 2,200 uh, square feet of uh, PCH for those that are on PCH. So that's much more restrictive than the North Area Plan. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tyler. All right, thanks, Joyce. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Tyler? No, that's it. Yep. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> So between the publishing of uh, this staff report uh, and the last one on September 11th, there was a clerical error that occurred uh, in which part of the um, part of the sections of uh, Ordinance 510 were deleted accidentally. And so we are recommending to add those back into uh, the, the item before you tonight, uh, Ordinance 510. I'll go through them very quickly here. Uh, the first is to amend the action of Ordinance 510. Uh, as follows, an ordinance of the City of Malibu approving Local Coastal Program Amendment 18002, an amendment to Title 17, zoning of the Malibu Municipal Code related to definitions, guest homes, and changing the term second units to accessory dwelling units, and to the Local Coastal Program to update accessory dwelling unit regulations in determining that the amendments are exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act. Uh, the next is to add back section four, uh, which is the findings necessary to make a zone text amendment uh, per our municipal code. Uh, so uh, finding A and B are uh, uh, recommended to be added back to uh, the ordinance. Section, section six is also recommended to be added back to uh, this ordinance. Uh, most of these changes, it's a few slides, but they're all basically cleanup items. So we're changing the term second unit to accessory dwelling unit. And so throughout uh, chapter 17, there are uh, many areas that kind of just need to be cleaned up. This first one is to uh, add um, definitions that will match our local coastal program amendment changes, uh, just to be consistent uh, with those changes. Uh, these next ones, as I mentioned before, are just basic cleanups um, in these various sections. Everywhere it says second unit, we're just changing with the term uh, accessory dwelling unit. Again, more cleanups. This one's specifically for the uh, Malibu Coast Estates overlay. Um, this one here is to add uh, guest houses, uh, guest house language, which is consistent with the LCP uh, recommendation uh, so that the MMC and the LCP have the similar language in regards to how guest houses are treated uh, for development standards. And lastly, a couple of sections uh, to amend um, the principal residence definition, again, changing uh, uh, second units to accessory dwelling units, and also amending our permitted use table, uh, changing again, or adding this time, uh, accessory dwelling units and removing uh, second units from our permitted use table. So with, with that, um, staff is recommending um, after uh, the city council provides direction on uh, changes, we are recommending um, the adoption of um, resolution 2343. That was uh, exhibit one in your packet. That would amend the land use plan of the local coastal program. And after the city attorney reads the title of the ordinance, introduce on first reading ordinance 510. Uh, that was the one Tyler added the um, language to tonight, and that would approve uh, um, <clears throat> an LCP amendment and, <clears throat> I'm sorry, a Malibu uh, Municipal Code amendment. And then number three is after the city attorney reads the title of the ordinance introduced on first reading, Ordinance 511. That was Exhibit 3 in your packet. 
and that would approve the zone tax amendment uh, to adopt the accessory dwelling unit uh, regulations. And then number four is to direct staff to schedule a second reading and adoption of ordinance 510 and 511 uh, for the December 11th, 2023 meeting. And that uh, concludes uh, my meeting, I mean my presentation. Sorry, I, if I'm, I'm just at the tail end of a bad cold, but fortunately I'm at the tail end, but <laughs> I Thank actually you, feel okay, just sound bad, so Thank my you. apologies. Mr. Mayor, just, and, yes. just wanted to clarify that um, the changes were typographical to Ordinance 510. The red line that was in your packet is accurate of all the changes, and uh, it does reflect the changes that were um, discussed in the staff report. Okay, thank you, Trevor. Uh, any questions before we go to public comment? Right. Just a quick question on the uh, uh, presentation. All right. Paul, you want to go first? After you. Okay. Um, you had a comment in there that 15% of the ADUs uh, can count toward the um, uh, awesome. whatever it is. The, yeah, Rena. I can't keep all the acronyms right there. But uh, I thought you said that only the MMC is going to the um, state agency to be reviewed. So that would mean only the um, uh, junior ADUs, correct, would be subject to that? Um, no, so the housing element, um, the municipal code matches the LCP in terms of um, all of the standards for ADU ordinance. Mm -hmm. It's just that um, they would be processed under the LCP. So when the state l looks at the city's municipal code, it will have all the same provisions to allow a all, all types of ADUs, okay. attached or detached, it will be a complete um, ordinance. Okay, then I'll come back to that later on. Okay. All right, but I want to make sure it wasn't just the junior ADUs. Okay. Paul? There, there's some confusion in my head about why the MMC says a limit in size of 1,000 square feet and the LCP has a limit of 1,200. So the uh, MMC uh, has to meet state law, and, and state law says the it's, it's, um, cities can go um, higher than 1,000 square feet but cannot get lower. And so uh, cities have to, for a two-bedroom or more, have to allow at least 1,000 square feet. So but that's they could a minimum. allow 1,200 square feet. So the 1,000 square feet in the MMC is a minimum for a two-bedroom. Right. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Bruce? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still confused about the MMC versus the LCP. Um, I understood from previously, and I think maybe again today, the as a practical matter, is it correct that the MMC only governs junior ADUs in Malibu? Uh, junior AD, ADUs and ADUs um, inside of an existing single-family residence. And so an, an, um, junior AD is limited to 500 square feet. It's usually a, a, a bedroom. But if someone were wanted to convert an, um, another part of their house and, and have more than 500 square feet, they could do that. Okay, so interior ADUs. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, but the MMC purports to address the ones that it has no control over or it doesn't? Uh, uh, yes, it it has to address all of the, of the different um, MNC because while we don't anticipate that um, it, you know there would be a, an occasion which somebody uh, would uh, be able to process their ADU under the MMC, uh, we have to allow for that uh, possibility. Can, can, I think. Can, Oh, so ahead, yeah, if if we don't make those changes, then the default is that um, any provision of MMC that doesn't comply with state law, we would have to follow the state law defaults by putting these provisions in. Um, if those provisions are ever put into effect, then it, it does provide more um, uh, compatibility with the city's uh, um, with the city's um, guidance and policies okay. towards ADUs. D do we have the capability of just saying in the MMC? Any ADU that is governed by the LCP is governed by the LCP and not, yeah, and there's no need to state anything about it in the MMC for that reason? Or, you know, words to that effect. 
I'm sorry, what was, can you repeat the question? Given, given that the LCP does, in fact, under state law, govern anything that is outside the residence, why can't the MMC simply state that those things are all governed by the LCP, pursuant to the MMC? Is the, the LCP is a self-contained document that, that, um, that supersedes our municipal code by its own effect, and it um, determines what is exempt and what is not exempt by its own provisions. Right. So, um, so when you draft contracts, you often say, you know, such and such shall be in compliance with securities laws X, Y, Z, or environmental law X, Y, Z. You don't set forth what they all mean in your agreement. Can't we in the MMC simply punt all the things that are covered by the LCPA, the LCP? I, I, I wouldn't suggest doing that because the when they, it's, it'll be number one, it'll be confusing for HCD if they pick up the municipal code provision. They're going to say these sections are missing. Um, it you know these are don't comply, um, and it, and they make it confusing. They get pushed over to the to the LCP um, provisions that are in the code, so I would suggest that you keep them separate and self-contained. There's also the possibility, you know, in the future that, um, you know, state law will, 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 will could change, um, you know, in terms of how the Coastal Act and how, you know, the ADU provisions interlock. Okay, so do all the other coastal cities have municipal codes that address the things that they have no binding effect over and are covered by the LCP? Well, most municipal, most municipal codes that have a local coastal program are not entirely within the coastal zone. So number one, um, they need to have separate sections that deal with the coastal zone and with and and, uh, and then a separate section that deals with the area that's- What about those that are? And, and the city, I was gonna also say that the city is unique in terms of our local coastal program was completely s drafted by the Coastal Commission as a totally separate self-contained code versus being integrated into a zoning code, which is uh, what is done in most other jurisdictions. Okay, so, are, but there are other jurisdictions that are entirely comprised within the coastal zone, or no? There, the Coronado, uh, sorry, not Coronado, um, Avalon um, is within the coastal, please, the coastal zone, I believe, and I think there might be one other. And do there non-LCP provisions purport to govern the ADUs that are governed by their LCP provisions? I couldn't tell you right here. I'd have to, I would have to go look. Okay. The also, just want to let the council know, uh, Todd Leishman is also available. He's, he's called in um, on Zoom. If you... The other question I have is, um, there are three reasons stated at the end of the report as to why CEQA is excused or why, why we need not, why this is um, exempted. Are they uncategorically the case, or is it subject to interpretation? Page 13 of the report that gives three reasons. The third, because because I don't agree with the third reason, but are the first two dispositive, and there's no room for interpretation? The staff's staff's assessment is that this um, these changes would be exempt from CEQA for multiple um, reasons. So any of the of, of those listed would be sufficient. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Can I revisit for Paul? a second? Uh, can, can we go to page 94, which is in 17.44.090, uh, specific ADU requirements? Here it says the maximum square footage of an ADU shall be 850 square feet for a studio and one bedroom or 1,000 square feet for two or more bedrooms. So how does that interact with that the 1,000 being a minimum under the MMC? The the A50 is for one bedroom or studio. Right. So that's... That's a maximum. Um, this is the no, you could, uh, the city could also allow, um, increase that number as well. You, you could, it's more of a minimum. You could not go lower than 850 for a one bedroom or studio, uh, and you could not go lower than 1,000 for a two bedroom or plus. Those well, are the minimums. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just burdened by having been an economist, and if, if I want to say something's a minimum, I say it's the minimum, 
And if I say it's the maximum, I say it's the maximum. And this clearly says it's the maximum for each of those two. So I'm, uh, I'm not understanding something. Yes. So for the city purposes, it is the maximum. We are establishing a maximum. <clears throat> we could establish another maximum. We could establish 1,200 square feet if, if the council wanted to. And so for the city, these are maximums. And <clears throat> the minimum is in state law. And Tyler, can you so state law says I, that I'm as confused as Paul. I was going to come back to this in the rest of the maximum. presentation, it's but I'm as confused minimum. as he was because uh, it looks like we've got different sizes for LCP product projects, MMC projects, and guest houses. And maybe I, I guess one of the things that would make it clear to me if there was a table, but I'll leave it up to the discussion later on. It does say on page 94, it says maximum. So um, the city has the ability to to allow uh, larger units. And right. so the planning commission and staff, uh, staff first and then the planning commission, had recommended the 1,200 square feet. And they could have recommended the, that number as the uh, maximum in the municipal code as well. But they felt that um, in the municipal code, we should just follow state law. State law says we have to allow at least 1,000, so we're going to allow at least 1,000, but we're not going to go over. Uh, we don't, we're not going to match the two documents. Okay, I'm going to come back to this later about where we have uh ability to avoid the state law or not on the LCP. Anybody else? Marianne? No, I'll wait for public comment. Okay. We, Thank you. We'll move to public comment then. Uh, got four speakers. Mark Bowdy, you're first. Is there a helmet there? Yeah, helmet Meisner. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, Mayor Uring, uh, council members, uh, please allow me to bring an aspect to your attention that caused uh, the council at the September 11 ADU hearing to wrongly dismiss a request I had made during my comments. Uh, to recap what this was about, uh, I was quoted the written response. I was uh, quoted in the uh, hearing the written response our family received from planning about our ADU application, which said the only issue with the proposed ADU is that the rules of the Malibu Country Estates Overlay District only allow one building pad per lot. And you discussed this before today. Um, but in the subsequent discussion, Council Member Riggins inquired how the single building pet rule became part of the MMC. She asked whether this was based on the neighborhood rules established by the original developer. At that point, Ms. Parker Bozelinski provided a legally misleading and essentially wrong guidance. She said, I quote, if the HOA wants to initiate a code amendment, or if council directed staff to initiate a code amendment to allow two building pads, that would be a separate process from the ADU ordinance. I would now like to explain the relevant legal provision that was ignored for this guidance. Section 4751 of the Civil Code deals with governing documents of HOAs and says that any HOA provision that effectively prohibits or unreasonably restricts the construction of an ADU on a single family residential lot is void and unenforceable, as long as the requirements of the state ADU laws are met. The overlay district rules in the MMC are essentially a copy of our HOA rules. The type of rules that are covered by the civil code section I mentioned before 
Therefore, there is no reason for the HOA to initiate a code amendment about the single building pet requirement because this requirement is unlawful anyway. It's not unlawful in its entirety, but it is so to the extent it impacts slash prevents ADUs. Hence, this should not be a separate process as noted by Ms. Parker Bozelinski. It should rather be part of the ADU ordinance. After all, section 4751 of the civil code explicitly covers ADUs. So council members don't make the life of your planning staff unnecessarily complicated by asking them to enforce an MMC provision which California law explicitly qualifies okay. as unenforceable. Thank you, sir. Your time's up. Who, which one do you want to go next? Good evening. Um, the proposed ADU ordinance in front of you contains a lot of restrictions and penalties against home, homeowners that would want to build a small one-story ADU. For example, of the restrictions and penalties, one, the homeowners building a small ADU for their, um, I'm sorry, their lot is encumbered with uh, permanent deed restrictions. Homeowners building a small ADU, they can never separately convey or sell a lot that contains the ADU. If a homeowner builds a small ADU, the proposed ADU ordinance requires the, the owner to report to the city the amount of rental income. If the homeowner builds a small ADU, they are required to try to provide additional parking, even if the ADU does not require or involve any using, usage of vehicles and despite plenty of street parking. Move, move that After, microphone down just a little bit. Oh. Yeah, there you go, go ahead. After January 1st, 2025, an ADU must be owner occupied. This prevents a homeowner from renting an arm's length to a tenant with a modest income, which can prevent the ADU from qualifying as an affordable housing unit and makes no sense. You are requiring a meter for a separate meter for the ADU, that makes no sense at all. It's another anti-development tactic. I'm not, an, I'm not a lawyer, but the source of penalties and restrictions are clearly designed to discourage the construction of a small-scale ADU, when what you should be doing is encouraging and incentivizing the construction of ADUs. I remodeled my house three years ago and decided to add an ADU, and the reasons are very simple. It was, first of all, my retirement home, small enough to clean on my when I'm old, and the renters in front would provide additional protection and security. My nep nephew currently lives in it, and whenever I'm away, I can text message him, and he's over my house in five minutes, and I also don't have to see him every day. Due to, the, due to my experience with ADUs, it is my understanding that those sorts of restrictions that are in front of you are illegal and violation of ADU statutes. When you drive around my, my Malibu, it is striking to see how many mansions there are, and, so, and now few one-story small homes and ADUs. By discouraging ADUs, I will have to assume that the real reason behind ADU ordinance is that you want more mansions, so that regular middle-income people cannot live here. Thank you. Your next speaker. And you're Anna? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Um, at the last city council meeting, road width, two roads, and fire risks were mentioned as reasons to adapt this bad ADU ordinance. The arguments were apparently that without blocking and discouraging ADUs and without restricting them and penalizing owners who try to build them with all kinds of abusive conditions in your LCP, that there would be an increased risk of fire or fire safety. Those arguments seem entirely fake to me, and here's why. 
If you continue to discourage the building of small one-story housing, owners and developers will just go big and build more mansions with larger homes and larger roofs, holding more people and more cars. These larger roofs for man mansions and large garages are clustered structures holding more people and are more likely to catch fire than smaller roofs with smaller garages and that are not clustered next to each other. Larger mansions and garages also involve more cars and more traffic jams that exist during fires. Your proposed statute actually increases the risk of fires spreading from mansion to mansion and more cars being stuck on the PCH during the next fire. If you read pages three and four of your full-time staff report uh, in this evening's presentation, you'll see that your full-time staff knows that your two roads needed, wider roads needed, or fire risk arguments are fake reasons. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Mark Bowdy. I'm a downtown troller and I do a lot of real estate and land use litigation. Uh, I've had some meetings with Paul, Marianne, Doug over the last couple of years. By the way, congratulations on getting elected. And to staff, Joyce, Tyler, and Richard, thank you for your help on this. Uh, I hope that we can come out of this meeting with some real guidance because uh, the goal, my goal for tonight is for you to not only not adopt this ordinance, but to send it back to the Planning Commission. And I want to educate you as to the reasons why, and I hope you'll ask me questions. Uh, I know this ordinance cold, along with other ordinances adopted by coastal enclave cities. On the bullseye issue, uh, and I'll try to work in some vignettes that relate to the homes that I own, although I'm not a developer, half my family lives here. What you've got in this statute, and we refer to it as the illegal Maza ADU ordinance, and the reason is when you look back at the history of why it was adopted, only one planning commissioner or council person provided guidance to BBK in the drafting, and it was Maza. And after a filibuster of 20 fake questions, which staff generously answered with their time, the only suggestion that was made was, can't we hide behind our LCP? Can't we use all of the NIMBY anti-development tactics in our LCP to block, discourage, and delay ADUs? That's what this ordinance is. Every single page of it is designed to discourage it. If you have any doubts about that, I'll, I'll speak to you as to one of my four homes in Malibu. I'm just going to go big and max out TDSF because you've made the entire ADU process such a royal pain in the ass and so restrictive that I'll just do what everybody does. Danny Errico, everybody, just build big. That's what all the architects are telling their owners and their developers. That's why when you drive through this city, you see nothing but mansions. That's why your arguments about fire safety and road widening and two roads are either outright fake and deliberately fake, or you just don't know anything about development. So you posit these arguments because you have the his this history of NIMBY politics. And Paul, you pledged you weren't gonna do NIMBY politics. Let's go through the restrictions so you have a clear sense of what's embodied in this horrible Byzantine statute. Deed restrictions, TDSF, 50% square footage cap, that'll guarantee the destruction of all small, home, small homes. Extra parking spaces must be owner-occupied? Really, must be owner-occupied? Who are you trying to discourage from being here? Ask some questions. This statute is not going to be adopted. I'm going to notify the HCD and the Coastal Commission, it's exclusionary, racist, and anti-development to ensure that it is not adopted. And Mr. Meisner, if you don't waive that requirement, which is a NIMBY LCP unrelated to coastal resources, you're going to get sued and lose again, Time's and you've up. lost Riddick. Thank you, sir. You've lost Riddick at the trial court level. You're Thank going to you. lose it at the court of appeal level. I hope you have questions now. Thank you very much. Joe, you're up. Hi, I don't care too much about the owner occupancy, um, but I do care about the two access requirement within the proposed resolution after your serious direction to planning staff from the last council meeting on this needs to remain. The staff report mentions a random letter from State Department of Housing and Community Development to Rancho Palos Verdes that they would need to provide evidence that this restriction would be required to protect public safety. This is evidence that we have. Rancho Palos Verdes does not have as many deadly and devastating wildfires as Malibu, and the whole city is not designated a very high, 
high fire hazardous safety zone as we are. We are officially a higher risk fire hazard prone area. The cities of Los Angeles, Oakland, Angels Camp, and Corte Madera all restrict ADUs similarly in high fire hazard zones and have so far suffered no ramifications. HCD also granted the city of Portola Valley permission to continue restricting ADUs in fire hazard zones. Portola Valley provided expert analysis and robust scientific evidence to support the need for the restrictions. And they have three egresses out of the city. We only have one, the PCH. The ordinance states that ADUs are prohibited on parcels smaller than one acre whose direct vehicular access is from a road or cul-de-sac which one has a single point of ingress egress, and two has a width of less than 18 feet. The ordinance findings go into detail explaining the nature of fire risks and the town's approach to risk management, outlying a fuel hazard study specifically mapping where evacuation could be constrained in an emergency. They speak to the great care and consideration the town put into risk management. So please use some of our existing flame mappers, study findings on this, etc. after the Woolsey fire and include this in the ordinance, keeping this restriction. LA County planning also gives two access restrictions in very high fire hazard severity zones and should be adopted by our city as well. During Woolsey, traffic was backed up Big Rock Drive and other canyon roads for hours, not to mention the PCH for a minimum of five hours, putting evacuees' lives in jeopardy. This kind of traffic trapped and fatally burned many victims of the 2018 campfire in paradise that could easily happen here. 83 people died in that fire. And not all the stars in the report Joyce Post mentioned are all correct. The stars that are correct could hinder evacuation down these small windy roads to the PCH, so they should not be discounted just because there are too many, there are so many limited access roads in our city. This is why we are such a fire prone city. To accommodate the very few people who need ADUs in our eight neighborhoods without two egresses, you can do as Oakland does and provide approved application for reasonable accommodation requests due to a disability of an ADU occupant or a need to accommodate a live-in caregiver for a person with a disability, i.e. for aging in-laws. The reasonable accommodation request must include a reason for the exception as you can limit square, and you can limit the square footage to these to be a max of 800 square foot or 16 feet high. Thank you for fixing the ordinance adding the required studies to keep all of Malibu safe. Thank you, Joe. Thanks. All right, let's bring it back. Getting, any... There was one raise, yeah, one raise hand on Zoom from Ryan. All right, Ryan, go ahead. Yes, I would like to say that um, of the 104 condos at Malibu Canyon Village near City Hall, uh, all but 11 of them are under 906 square feet and is perfectly possible to have two large bedrooms and two full bathrooms in 900 square feet. And if it's a 1,000 minimum, I would suggest uh, not going above that number because beyond that provides for a third bedroom. You have a third bedroom, you're increasing the problems of having three adults, three cars in the neighborhood added to all the ex other uses that are already existing. And noting that there is no limit, um, maybe there should be a limit on how much of an existing uh, resident can be devoted for an, atta uh, an attached ADU. It could be 1,500 square feet from what you were told. And so to avoid the parking problems on what may already be uh, narrow streets or congested streets, and I'm thinking about the Ramblin' neighborhoods, I'm thinking of some of the Big Rock areas, and whatever section of Malibu Road needs to be widened, that you take into account those fire risks and extra vehicles and extra people that would have to be evacuated or tended to in case of a problem in Malibu. So um, 1,200, I think, is way too much uh, because, again, you're, you're inviting that extra third bedroom. Anything over 900 square feet, you're, you can calculate three bedrooms there. And under the state limit, though, of 1,000 for two, I can understand that. But I think that's for a full residence. I'm not so sure that's for um, an additional dwelling unit or if you could call it a, a, a junior dwelling unit. But uh, 1,200 feet is way too much. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Anybody else? That's it. Those are all the raised hands. Okay, we're going to close public comment, bring it back up to the council table. Anybody like to start? I'm ready. Paul? 
Can we start by asking uh, Mr. Meisner to, is he, can we connect him? I'd like to ask him a couple questions. Is he out there? Helmut Meisner, we're asking you to unmute. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. You have two items on in your in your house right now. Sorry, you were just breaking up. There you go. Okay. Uh, for starters, uh, I'm familiar with Malibu Country, uh, and your your CCNRs say only dwellings on the on the building pads, correct? Only one um, building pad is allowed per lot. That is correct. Right, and it, does it say only one building is allowed per lot? Per building no, pad? No, it could be more. It's just that um, the neighbors that I know and my own situation, uh, there is simply due to um, utility easements, no way to use the existing building pad for an ADU. So there is the only way is to go uh, on a second building pad. And um, I'm, I'm quite frankly, I'm very confident because of section 4751 to sue the city if this does not get uh, uh, resolved because it's so evident that um, a specific section of the law clearly says that an HOA rule like this is null and void. So okay. uh, leave it leave it in. Um, I would just prefer that we come to a sit to a conclusion. Can I ask the follow up question? Absolutely. Those are engineered pads. They were certified before any any of the houses were built. The slopes were not certified for the purpose of holding up dwellings. Is that true? Uh, that is true, but we have uh, engineers, uh, even the city engineers, everybody ticked it off that the uh, area at the bottom of, of our slope is fully capable of handling this ADU. And I know from some neighbors that they have even larger uh, flat areas that have absolutely no problem to be developed for an ADU. It's just that... But we aren't um, talking about the people who have flat areas. We're talking about the slopes, correct? Well, this is not uh, a uh, application that uh, would impact the slope. The slope remains untouched. Paul, it's on a section of vantage point that borders John Tyler Road and is flat at the bottom that all the neighbors supported. All the soils and geo came back positive. So you've already done the soils and geo on that site? Uh, absolutely. Everything's ticked off. It's just the... Um, How are you on the setbacks? Within the state law, four feet. Uh, Mark, I hear you, Mark, but Mark, you, I'm not asking you questions yet. Okay. I'll get to you. Okay. Uh, for the, uh, I, I don't remember the first lady who spoke's name. I'm sorry. Yoon. Yoon, uh, the uh, requirement for separate meters is primarily a an energy saving device as someone who's managed a lot of units when you rent people a house and include all the utilities you suddenly discover that the utilities are quite high when they pay their own utilities that that only goes on for a month and and with the and as far as the owner occupancy requirement for an ADUs, they're talking about the owner has to be on the site. So the I think the the intent here was not for people to buy houses to rent out and then build ADUs so that they would have two rentals. If you want to live in one, either one, and rent the other one out, it's fine. Okay. But the meter still, I you don't, that means that you would purposely want to segregate If you're going that, to right? rent out the ADU. If you're not ADU. going to rent it out, what, I mean, if you're going to rent it out, then that should be a requirement, but, or maybe not even. Like, <laughs> If you're not going to rent it out, then I could see what? that you're, you're perfectly comfortable with having a family member use as much as they want, but mm -hmm. it, the, uh, the requirement is, 
is there for a reason. So I don't know if that's correct or not, but that's what I believe the reason is. Okay. You want to follow up? I, I think within the state um, ADU law, it actually allowed for the ability um, because I think previously the utility companies were resistant to having multiple meters on a single family residence property. So I think that was actually put in there with the intention um, to allow for the occupant of that unit to be able to pay their own utilities and track it and everything. But it's an option, not a requirement. Yeah, you made it a mandatory requirement for every ADU. Mark, please. Staff, could you? I couldn't find where that was written, but the. I, I was doing a cursory review. I mean, I'd rather not charge my mom for water and utilities. Well, I mean, you can pay the bill. It, it's not the, uh, you don't have to put it in their name. I mean, you could still pay it. It's just a matter of tracking it. Yeah, but. And it you... also, it puts you in different tiers. So by having one meter, you actually end up in higher tiers because you're not getting the benefit of just tracking those lower ones. So by having separate meters, it can um, lead to a lower bill altogether. Because each allowance, each home is entitled to a certain amount of energy before it gets charged into higher ones. And when you have one property that's on one utility, you're likely to go into the next tier, tier three or four or whatever mm -hmm. just by... What would be the, co what would be the um, breaking point of... You'd have to ask the utilities. I mean, look at your electric bill or your water bill. Mm -hmm. And it gives you a certain amount of units for just the base use. Yeah, but, but how once much you is use the that cost base, of the additional meter versus... You'd have to talk to the utility companies. It, but it, as I said, I believe it's the, my understanding that previous to this, it was um, the utility companies were resistant to allowing multiple meters, and this just allowed the property owner to be able to select having multiple meters. Okay. So I'm just looking to staff to, to verify, is that... That mandatory that it's required that you have separate meters? So it is in our proposed uh, MMC changes and this language was supposed to mimic the state law so I, I do want to ask um, Todd if he can if he has the answer for this question. Good evening uh, members of the council this is Todd Leishman from Best Best and Krieger lurking on the Zoom. Um, it, the question is about utility connections. Yes. State law does not require the city to in turn require separate utility connections, but state law does allow it in certain situations. So whether to require that or not is a policy choice. Okay. Got it. Okay. Do we know where in the document that we provided that it states that? Yeah, so it's um, the amendment to chapter, uh, it would be new, 17.44100B uh, uh, is utility fees, and it's B3. That says, oh, 96 of your uh, report. At the bottom. But it only applies to separate ADUs, not the ones inside a dwelling, right? Right. Richard or whoever. Yes, that is it, that's correct. So B three, um, there's an exclusion in the front where um, the ADU is constructed within, uh, within a house or standard utility connections. And then um, the ADUs uh, that are they're not required, we cover that in section two, and then section three, uh, which is the new the new ADUs shall that have um, a separate utility connection, are the ones that are specifically of concern in the comments from the public. So did we just uh, find a another typo in in B one? Should be. Should that be ADUs constructed within a single family dwelling? Mayor and Council, no, that is not a mistake. It says B1 B1 says 
exactly what it should say. It's not an, it's not for ADUs constructed within a single family dwelling. It's for ADUs that are constructed with a single family dwelling. So if it's built at the same time as the, as the house? Yes. Okay. B1, 2, and 3 are all allowed by state law. All of those, uh, well, the state allows the, the city to be, shall we say, more generous toward ADUs at, on any of those points. You can choose to not require a direct utility connection or not require any fee. That's a policy choice. What is reflected in B1, 2, and 3 is exactly what state law allows. Okay. Oh, you're still on, or you, you got more? I got hijacked along the way there. Mr. Bowdy. Yeah. You want to approach the, the microphone? Absolutely. Thank you, Paul. So, it says here that the Coastal Commission's executive director has already rejected. On This is on page. It says where? It's item number Roman numeral four on the third page. I've got nothing to say with Roman numeral four on any page. It's uh, oh, the thing that Mark wrote. He didn't. I didn't yeah, get a so copy the, of that. So the, the quotes. Huh? I, I don't have a copy of that. Yeah. Nor do I. I might, I might have two extra. Oh, was this submitted what, as public what, comment? Yeah. Look. No. This is no, he. What's the question? No, 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 no. What, before we're not doing the question until we figure out what the heck we're talking about. And I don't have a copy of that thing, so I don't know how you you can ask me to understand what you're doing. So well, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm may or may I approach? I'd like to know who got this and how. Yeah. May or may I approach? We're not done yet. We got to answer his question first, Mark. Sure. We're going to answer his question first. In the bathroom break. To whom? Paul, Marianne, and Doug. Why were we not given copies? Okay. You've been sitting here for how long? Whole meeting, I believe. Mr. Trevor, what do we have to Thank do you. with this document? You don't have to do anything with it. It was submitted after the public so hearing. So we can began. just ignore it completely? Yeah, it wasn't submitted before. Done. Beforehand. Okay. Well, I, so what is the question, Paul? And you can't represent a document, Paul, because that's... So the quotes are taken from Jack's, Jack Ainsworth's letters. He's the executive director of the Coastal Commission. And he was. What, the he was. was. Right. He was directed by the state of California, by the governor's office, to provide direction to coastal enclave cities in the context of making sure that they didn't try to hide behind their LCPs and make a legal argument that their local coastal plan controls or preempts the state ADU statute. That is an incorrect legal argument that the city has already lost on the Riddick case. The appellate argument was on November 20th. You're going to lose at the Court of Appeal level. And the reason is what the Coastal Commission has said in these letters, which I've just handed to all five council persons, is please recognize the importance of this affordable housing policy. Do not just hide behind all the anti-development NIMBY tactics in your LCP. Harmonize your LCP in ways where you incentivize and encourage ADU development. I think the Baker Tilly report also focuses on this. It says, learn how to differentiate mansions from small-scale one-story housing. If you create an environment where small-scale one-story housing is encouraged and incentivized, you prevent mansionization, you get small-scale housing units, lower density, and a wider range of affordable housing. Further linkage, you've got this strange language in there about rental rate reporting. I had to watch a video of a planning commission meeting where 45 minutes was wasted on rental rates in the context of regional housing needs assessment units. It's the income levels of the tenants, the occupants, that can qualify you for 15% or more of your arena units if you do it right. For By way of example. Okay, Paul, is there a question? That, this that is, is, otherwise, we've got to open it up for people. Sure. No, I'm happy no. to wait for questions. All right. My, my question is, what, what 
you've you've seen our package yes. what in here is illegal every single component of your ADU ordinance is illegal and the reason is this specific okay. sure a sure one okay. happy to do it your effort to adopt your LCP as the controlling document and all of its restrictions is illegal and is explicitly negated by the state ADU statute and by the Coastal Commission's directives, which is why if you adopt it tonight, it will be rejected by both the Coastal Commission and the HCD, probably without even a letter from me, but I'll make sure I get my letter in. Here's the reason why. What the state statute says is, we recognize there's a massive affordable housing crisis and we want to incentivize one-story ADU construction that's small and modest. And so we're going to, in writing, tell you all the things that you cities absolutely cannot do to block, discourage, and delay ADUs, such as deed restrictions, TDSF constraints, impermeable lot coverage constraints, setbacks. The state statute says all of these things that you're doing, including Helmut Meissner's case, which is the perfect test case for suing the city, even better than Riddick. Riddick's a win for Riddick. You're going to lose that case. Helmut's case is perfect because you have a provision relating to building sites that has no nexus or connection to protecting coastal resources. And the lot faces a cement parking lot at Pepperdine for a basketball gym. And all the neighbors support him building a 600 square foot ADU. Thank you. So all of those things that you have in your LCP, absolutely verboten. Thank you, Mark. Sure. Any other questions? No, you can be seated. Thank you. None? Doug, you concerned about the LCP? My turn. Mike, it's my turn. Okay. The, the public hearing has been closed. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I, we're not going to open this thing up again. Go ahead. Who wants to go next? Bruce? The Malibu country estates, is, what is the um, legal basis for the um, single pad requirement? Um, Richard, do you know that? That's, so that ordinance was, um, maybe Marianne knows, it was put into place, um, I think, when the city, shortly after they incorporated. And the purpose was to ensure that each of the lots up there had an ocean view. It's, it, I'm just asking what the legal bit. It's an ordinance? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, Mr. – what's his last name? My, Meisner. And, this is your client, Mark? Yes. So you can answer the question. I'm sure you can answer it better than he can. And I, but I'll, I, I think Joyce is correct. But, uh, but I'll, I'll ask, I'll ask you to – I want to give you the courtesy of being able to answer questions, and I have a number of them, but I only want to give you that courtesy if you're going to answer the questions and not make speeches. Great. Fire away. Okay. So the statute that um, your client cited to us, he said HOA provisions are unlawful. Was he speaking just general, gen, in generality, or does it apply to statutes as well? The state ADU statute specifically calls out and negates ADU uh, restrictions in HOA CCNRs. Okay. So things like this provision what, about what if they has. does it does it specifically apply to a restriction that is in that is put in an ordinance? Does the state ADU statute? Does it expressly say that a provision in ordinance that does the things that an HOA cannot do cannot be done through the ordinance? Yes, it does. Okay, expressly says that. Yes, it does. Can you read me the language that says that, please? No, of course not. But the okay. It's, it's, okay, fine. It's, it's That's general fine. legislative if, if intent. It's if very you clear. If, if you can't, you I, no. Like I said, I, I would. I'm going to ask you questions, but I'm only going to do it if you're going to answer the questions and not launch. The answer is yes, it does. Thank you. But you can't quote me the language. Um, what percentage, to your knowledge, and you don't have to give me a specific number, what percentage, to your knowledge, of developable parcels in Malibu do not have a home? Do not have a home? Don't have a pro don't have. You a mean structure. like a vacant lot? Yes. I'd say less than 8%. Okay. It's what, a guess. What percent? Less than 15%? I, I'm going to stick with 8%. Okay, great. What percentage of... Um, Parcels in Malibu would be that would be eligible for an ADU if we adopted the provisions you want would be able to have an ADU that don't currently have one. Well, that question makes no sense. Every lot in Malibu is eligible for an ADU. Okay. 
Um, Under the statute. So, so, so. I mean, 90, they're not all practical. So, but. so ninety-two percent of the parcels in Malibu, give or minus whatever ones already have an ADU, could be could have an ADU added. Only eight percent could develop from the ground up a brand new mansion without taking down the pro the building that's on it, right? No, not quite the way you framed it. Okay, how do you I, build I can think it? of two examples that might be useful. Go ahead. So one of the issues you have in your statute is a, is a kind of a odd non sequitur that, that attacks small homes. And it says, we want to cap your square footage at either 50% of the size of your main home or 1,200 square feet, whichever is less. <coughs> so, so if you look at... No, it, it's relevant to that. Yeah. Yeah. So if you look at these neighborhoods, um, I'll pick three that have the largest chunks of housing stock in the city, Malibu Park, Point Doom, and the Escondido Bluffs. There's a lot of old product that's one story that's from the 40s and 50s in those neighborhoods that's kind of cute that's still there. If you actually want to incentivize retaining that, when raw land is selling for five to eight million per lot, you kind of have to give the buyer or the current owner a real reason to keep the old home. If you propose and adopt a statute that says to the homeowner, you just need to tear this down immediately because I'm going to cap out your square footage for your ADU at 50% of your main home or 1,200, whichever is less, any owner, buyer, developer is just going to scrape it. And that's kind of what we see in these neighborhoods. Okay. And I happen to Okay, I understand, I understand, I understand yeah. that point. I appreciate that. What percentage of properties in Malibu do you think that adds to the 8% that are undeveloped? It's not really the properties in Malibu. The general plan requires that the statute be sort of specific to each neighborhood. And so what you have is a situation where spot neighborhoods, like the neighborhoods that were devastated by Woolsey, have large lots, lo plenty of room it, for it, ADUs. So I, in I those just, neighborhoods, I, don't care I, I realize you, you live in the Malibu Knolls, so wait, may I don't, not be suitable. I don't care whether you think my question is relevant. I just want to know what percentage of additional properties your argument adds to so where... If I understand the question correctly, I would say that in Malibu Park, Point Doom, and the Escondido Bluffs... No, I want to know all of Malibu. No, you can't really. I, I couldn't do that. Because most of Malibu doesn't fit what you just described, right? Well, no, the statute I proposed... S says Stick basically to the question. No, no, not most. No, incorrect. In terms of actual housing units, the neighborhoods that are dense and canyony, let's say Big Rock, Malibu West, uh, you and Steve in the Malibu Knolls, uh, you could include Latigo. Those are neighborhoods where the best statute would say your maximum is in the state ADU statute. That's all you get. But You've got neighborhoods where you could generate a whole bunch of general fund revenue by allowing absolutely invisible ADUs that are 1,200 plus a 400 square foot garage that nobody would ever see that would trigger a reassessment, keep the existing home intact, bring in more general fund revenue, and nobody would ever see the ADU. I, I but to do that, you have to let's, escape let's the mazanimbiism. Okay. First of all, you can sit down. Thank you. Sure. Can I just ask Todd a really quick question? Go ahead. Todd? Are you there, Todd? Todd on the phone? Yes, I am. Hi. Um, what does the state statute say with regards to the square footage amounts? What does the state statute say regarding the square footage of your house? No, of the amounts that the state ADU statute, I, it was my recollection that it gave a maximum square footage or 50% of the existing single family residents. So are we not just copying the language that the state ADU ordinance says? That's correct. The city's MMC ordinance as proposed mirrors what the statute requires in a sense that the statute requires the city to allow or to allow a maximum. It, it's, it's kind of a minimum maximum because the, the state law says the, the city has to allow a studio or one bedroom to be up to 850 square feet. So in essence, the state is imposing a minimum maximum. 
same with a thousand for two bedrooms or more. So say you and had a fifteen hundred. Is an additional um, standard that the statute describes that the city may impose, um, but it must yield in, in when necessary for a, a unit to be up to 800 square feet. So if you had a 1500 square foot home, then you could only propose an ADU with a maximum square footage of 750 square feet, even though the statute says 850? Well, actually, because of the interplay between the 850 and 1,000, which is the starting point for ADU size, and the 50% limit, which is an additional restriction, but then there's this carve-out that says that for certain standards, including the, the percent-based size limitation, those standards have to yield to allow the ADU to be up to 800 square feet. So really, even though the general standard is 850 and 1,000, somebody with a 1,500 square foot home would normally be limited to just 750 square feet, but that percent-based standard would have to yield another 50 feet to allow the ADU to be up to 800. Or 1,000, I'm sorry, or 1,000 nope, for a two-bedroom. Not 850, not 1,000, just 800. Okay, thank you. Okay. So Here's a comment I have. You know, I don't have any objection to finding ways to have lower cost housing available in Malibu. And it would seem at, at first blush, small ADUs would be the perfect vehicle for accomplishing that. You know, if, if, if we could get a whole bunch of 800, 900, maybe even 1,000 foot ADUs, square foot ADUs, and they would be rented out at the kinds of rentals that low cost housing, um, people that need low cost housing could afford, that would be a laudable objective. I don't believe for a second that anyone who builds an ADU in Malibu is going to be renting their ADU out at the kinds of um, rentals that low cost um, individuals can afford. These are, these are supplemental income, well, either for family members, which is, which is perfectly fine, um, or they're, they're going to be rented at significant prices that aren't going to help um, underprivileged people. I am very concerned, and it's not a make weight argument, I'm very concerned about fire danger as, uh, you know, we, 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 we tend to have major fires here and we tend to lose a lot of properties and luckily we haven't lost lives. The reason that we spoke last time about the two entrance requirement was not for the purpose of precluding ADUs and it certainly wasn't for the purpose of precluding low cost um, housing in Malibu. It was on the theory, which I think is a rational one, albeit one that doesn't have a study to support it, um, that you create bottlenecks when you add more people to a road that only has one entrance and exit. And especially when it's large neighborhoods, like Big Rock's a perfect example. I mean, it, no, I'm not asking you to speak. And you know, and I think we're entitled to the same respect you would give a court. And I can't believe you act like you do in court, so I would appreciate if you'd act like you do in court. So it, Big Rock's a perfect example. It, it is difficult as it is in a non-emergency situation to drive in and out of Big Rock. I, it is, to me, I, I guess maybe it's, an, it's, a, it's a catastrophe in waiting even without additional homes in there now, but with the potential to dramatically increase the population in that area, um, to me it's just unfathomable that we would do that when we're concerned about safety. Now I hear the argument that if you don't, if you limit the ability to build ADUs because of fire safety, that's not going to accomplish anything because people are just going to mansionize everything. That's why I was asking the questions about percentages. Um, if the, I, I suspect of the 8% or so of undeveloped parcels or vacant parcels, um, there's a good number of them that will never be developed. Um, but even if they were all developed, that's not a material difference in the, in the grand scheme of the city. 
even if you tear down some and build bigger. And that's a huge complicated mess for someone to do and it takes years to accomplish. That's not going to materially increase the population and the danger of getting in and out of the city. But if you make it super easy to build ADUs everywhere in the city, as much as that's a laudable objective for low income issues, which I don't think are solved in any way, shape or form in Malibu, you're creating a huge fire danger or evacuation danger. And that's, that's the thing that's driving my analysis of this and all the reasons that I, and, and I'll state this so that when you bring your lawsuits, you can, you can quote me on it. I actually do want to use whatever vehicles we are permitted to use under state law without going, without violating state law to limit the number of ADUs that can be built because I think they're a fire danger in Malibu and I don't believe that they accomplish low cost housing in Malibu in any way, shape or form. So that's, that's the quandary I have when I'm looking at this statute that's being proposed to us. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just stop at that for now. Doug? All right, uh, I'm going to take a little different spin on this than some of the other questions, perhaps. And um, I'm going to go granular, then I'm going to go global for a second. Um, there's one question I have in here on our, the page two of the staff presentation about owner occupancy number seven. It says a natural person. Um, when I read that, I went, wait a minute, what about uh, Inter Vivo's trust? Uh, and I know we don't want to have LLCs owning these properties. But if I've got it in the name of a trust, is that a natural person or Trevor? I don't know. Sorry, can you repeat the question? All right. Uh, we say a natural person with legal, uh, with legal or title to the property must designate the property uh, in either the primary dwelling or the ADU as their permanent residence. Well, a natural person if they're owning the property and if the title is in the name of, say, a, a trust, a family trust, is that a natural person or not? Well, the, the Mayor and Council, would you like me to chime in? Sure. Todd? The beneficiary of a trust would qualify. Okay, so are we excluding anybody? I, I was trying to think of examples where it wouldn't be a natural person, but it would still look like a natural person. Well, I think it was a trust. No, nope. nope. as long as it's a real, live, flesh and blood human being that has the the interest, and not an LLC, not an Inc., not a limited partnership. Okay. All right. That's what I want to know. All right. Then going back to the uh, Malibu uh, country estates, that started out as an HOA uh, provision. I know the HOA I live in, HOA I live in, has the same provision, only one dwelling per lot. We don't have an overlay. Are you saying the overlay is what is the uh, legal restriction? Yes, I am uh, not uh, familiar with uh, the source of the overlay of when it was created, uh, but it, um, it does not have a restriction on the number of um, houses or structures on a lot, it, it just says you can only have one building pad, and it's very specific about the uh, building elevation. So in the ordinance, in the overlay, so there's an overlay uh, uh, over the Malibu country estates, it says you have one building pad, and then it gives by lot the elevation. And so it's very specific because, again, it was written to ensure that each property owner out there um, had and maintained a view of the ocean. Okay. And so it's the pad is what they've permitted in the HOA, and the overlay carried that to the city, yeah. correct? And I, I don't know that I would say that it was um, the HOA that allowed it. Uh, while they may have been... Typical of, of any overlay, generally it's the neighborhood that gets together and decides they want that, right? And they come to the city and the city adopts it. So it's the ordinance is an ordinance. It's not an HOA provision. It's, a, it's an ordinance adopted by the city, the city council, it's a, a legal overlay that has standards much the same as any overlay. Uh, I would not consider it 
HOA rules or in any part of HOA standards? Okay, well then let me take it to where I live. Um, our HOA says dwelling, one dwelling per lot, as opposed to one uh, dwelling per pad. Is, does this mean that the state law overrides that and you could put a uh, ADU on it Correct. or not? So, uh, Mayor and Council, if I may. It's Todd. Uh, again, this is Todd from BBK. Um, and HOA's rules are completely separate from the city's rules. Completely separate. The city has no enforcement authority over those CCNRs. The HOA has no enforcement authority over our rules. The HOA enforces its own private covenants and what they do in their silo um, is completely separate from the regulation and the ordinance that you're talking about today. Okay. The that's civil what code I... section that was referred to earlier hmm. uh, might very well affect what an HOA can and can't do with its own members through its own CCNRs, but that has no bearing on what's before you tonight. Okay, that's what I wanted to, I, I know the HOA people out there would probably have a question about is this overriding their ability to control density in their uh, HOA. And that's a great question for them to ask their own attorney. Got it, all right. Um, Mark, if you could come up to the podium. <coughs> I wanna take you back to a letter that you provided me earlier and I didn't pay enough attention to it some months ago, but you have provided it to me today. And I'll re reference this Jack Ainsworth letter of January 21st, 22. Uh -huh. And I want to highlight the fact that I wasn't on the council then. And I wasn't also involved in the planning commission at that time. Um, the title of this is Implementation of New SB9 Housing Laws uh, in Sea Lives Vulnerable Areas. And I'll only read the first uh, part here. It says, according to the certified local coastal program provisions, continue to apply but in most places will need to be updated to conform with SB 9 to the greatest extent possible while still complying with the Coastal Act. Can you give me a quick summary of what you think those kind of changes would be? Sure. Uh, and I don't need, don't need a, you know, a book, I just, some highlights, because you know where I'm gonna go with this question next. Yeah, so what the Coastal Commission is instructing coastal enclave cities to do is to modify their LCPs consistent with the way this Baker Tilly report reads to streamline and incentivize the construction of small scale ADUs that do not implicate harm or have a nexus to coastal resources. And what you've got in front of you for adoption tonight is exactly the opposite. Okay, but give me some examples of what should have changed in the coastal provision. In, in our you mean in the process. LCP? Yeah, LCP for us. Sure. So there's a, there's a better statute in front of you put together over the last four years for Malibu, customized to Malibu's neighborhoods. And ironically, Bruce and I agree on something. Neighborhoods like Malibu West and Big Rock and Las Flores, all these neighborhoods with skinny, tight slopes and streets where it's hard to park even for a dinner party, the better statute which I had a role in drafting, says in those places, you're bound by the state statute, that's all you get. You get nothing else, period. You're capped out. What do you mean capped because out? Because that, that capped. right on the part of anybody in Latigo or Big Rock or Las Flores to build an ADU under the state statute under those minimum standards exists. The reality in those neighborhoods in terms of highest and best use and the reality of real estate development standards is Nobody wants to build a guest house. That's why the sky has never fallen. This statute's been in place for five years. Anybody who wanted to build a thousand square foot, two bedroom guest house could have done it already. It just so happens in neighborhoods like Malibu West, the only person who was willing to sue over it and, and wanted one was Riddick. So what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to look, follow the general plan, look at the customized individual neighborhoods. I know from my phone conversation with Todd from three years ago, that the current statute that's in front of you is a one size fits all, just hide behind the LCP. What you're supposed to do is look at your individual neighborhoods and say, wait a minute, 
in these neighborhoods where the lots are two to five acres and we can get a reassessment and nobody will see the guest house and there's no view impacts on neighbors and we can get more general fund revenue, incentivize it. And you know, recognize that and this is tricky. Uh, I think Bruce and Steve, you said at the last meeting, you've never really built a house from scratch or developed anything. That's why you make some of these statements. I'll give you an example. Hold on, Mark. Mark yeah, sure. Let's get back, let's get back to the ch things that right. that need to change. Because what I want to do is I want to go to the planning director, Richard. I'm going to put you on the spot, and ask you what did we do to comply with Ainsworth's direction? Nothing. Oh no, I, I didn't ask you, Mark. Hold on. Yeah. Our I, choice. I just, just, just tell me what we did. We we follow the direction of coastal staff. The distinction from what is um, reviewed under the LCP is whether it is defined as development. Any anything that is new development is processed under the LCP. That was a direct. Um, decision um, from coastal staff, including um, it was it, it, they, that's what they told us when we started this whole process. They said anything that's new development, and they went back and forth on it, checked higher up. Um, I think maybe even checked with an attorney in San Francisco I, at one point, and we were very clear, um, they were very clear that if it was new development, it required an administrative coastal development permit, and it was required to be processed under the LCP. So we are consistent with the coastal direction. And that's for SB9? Uh, no, not SB9, from the uh, ADU ordinance. Okay. SB9 is the duplex statute. Oh, duplex statute. Yeah. I'm sorry. All right. Um, Ainsworth's letters are come out at the same time, they're parallel in January 2022. Mark, there's, there's no question being after, just yeah. relax, please. Go ahead. All right, so that, which one was uh, the uh, ADU statute? Was that, it was the AB something else, wasn't it? Uh, assembly bill, I'm gonna get the number Todd, wrong. which one it's was it? It's five years old. Todd, what? Thank what, you for asking the city attorney. <laughs> <laughs> Senate right. Bill 9 is much All right. newer. We'll do this Mark is not the city attorney. Right. I'm happy to answer that question. The legislature has touched the ADU statute almost every legislative session since going back to before 2017. The most recent one is 897, but that didn't make any changes that are really that relevant here, except that it took owner occupancy off the table under the MMC. So, so owner occupancy is not required under the yeah, but you don't need to change the draft ordinance that's in front of you because we anticipated this possibility and F3 says as required by state law, or I'm sorry, that's the wrong section. I still have that up from the other. It says F2, unless applicable law requires otherwise. So, so you got you that got a, provision in there. You got a big um, out there. Ensures that you're compliant. Okay, um, I'm sorry I put you on the spot for SB9, but on the uh, ADU provision, have we done anything to change any of our LCP uh, uh, rules and operations to comply with what Ainsworth said relative to ADUs? Yes, it's expressly drafted with that in mind. Okay, but I was asking uh, Joyce and Richard. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't that's, all right. that's all right, Todd. Yes, yes. So um, what I had indicated before is that we got uh, direction from coastal staff mm -hmm. was not related to the SB9. It was related to the AD ordinance. Okay. You, I'm glad you, you kept me on the straight and narrow okay. on this. Okay. Uh, Todd, do you have any, um, or uh, Trevor, before I ask the staff, how close is our, we know that the MMC is supposed to be in conformance with the ADU provisions. Is that correct? We think, we think we've think crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's. Is that correct? Their yes. heads are yes. nodding yes. Yep. Trevor, Todd, do you think we're all right? And yes. Hold on a second. Everybody's got, I want to hear a yes or no. Yes. 
and I didn't say you, I didn't say you certify. I said you think we did. Uh, it's, it's good enough for me at the moment. So, our LCP. Are we in compliance with the ADU provisions as you see it? And I want to do around the robin the three the three wise groups here. Mark, do you think our LCP is in provision is in compliance with the ADU? Not a not a chance in hell, and no changes were made to the LCP to harmonize it with the state ADU statute at all. You did just the opposite, and you've already lost on it on the Riddick case. Okay, you literally made yeah. no effort you, you to do it at all. You made your point. You made your point. Made your point. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, staff, do you think we're in compliance with the uh, ADU provisions? Uh, yes, for the LCP, uh, yes, I do. The only um, question that uh, coastal staff had, coastal staff has reviewed drafts of our ordinance, and the only um, uh, statement they made is that they uh, thought we should uh, harmonize our parking requirements uh, closer to um, state ADU law. That was the only comment they had, was that uh, at one time uh, the ordinance allowed exceptions if you were in a certain distance from a bus stop or something like that where you did not require, didn't, were not required to provide a parking space. The Planning Commission and I believe um, uh, the City Council had indicated that uh, because of the high fire hazard area that it would be important uh, to have uh, everybody have a parking space so that people are, are um, not parking on the street and blocking up the street. Okay. Todd and Trevor, you think we're in compliance with uh, ADU on the uh, LCP? I just want us to go on this record. is Todd. I'll, I'll chime in. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Subdivision L of the ADU statute says, and it couldn't be more clear, nothing in this section shall be construed to supersede or in any way alter or lessen the effect or application of the California Coastal Act. Okay. And Mark? Sure. The reason that has no meaning here is the Coastal Act as a generic reference has nothing to do with your LCP and because Bruce That's is a not true. Bruce is a lawyer. I'm not going to get into that. time it this way because I think Bruce and I may agree again. Mr. Mayor, we, we did close the public hearing. Yeah, I if, if, if you want to ask, ask questions, I just wanted, you should go I wanted, to the mayor. I just want to yeah. get a question. We've got to give you an answer. I, I, know. You got, I got the answer, you, and you said it well. It's the Coastal Act, not the LCP. All right. Yeah. All right. Todd, um, you already got the blurb out from uh, Mark Bowdy. You say you don't agree. Can you? Absolutely not. And the, the Coastal Act is implemented through the LCP. The LCP is part of that. Okay. The LCP is the implementation right. of the Coastal Act in Malibu. Can, okay. It's, it's All right. tailored specifically to Malibu. All right. Thank you, Mark. That's no, you can sure. sit down there. All right. Um, then I want to go back to one other thing with the staff. Free to go, right? I've answered everybody's question. <laughs> I, I think you should stay. Okay. Uh, on this part about the two ways in and out. I took great comfort in supporting that the last time around because we just had the fire uh, liaisons give us a heads up that we had areas that were uh, in a high risk because there was only one way in, one way out. Big Rock, uh, Trancus, Trancus uh, Malibu West, those areas uh, were immediately a concern. I didn't realize we had 85% of the properties that way. Can you tell me how we came up with that? Is that something that, that you're, that was a, a swag or did a study or what? Uh, uh, that was uh, the maps that were attachment six in your report, um, which I, I could run through real quickly. Um, but uh, I, I basically went through and X'd out every street that had only a one-way uh, street. Got it. It's in our package. Uh, yeah. So okay. this, as for example, that shows the Big Rock area. So you see the, the star there. Um, there's Las Flores uh, to Sweetwater. Every place there's a star. There's only one means of access um, into that uh, property area and not uh, two. Civic Center area, everywhere there's a star, only one means of access, uh, not two. Latical Canyon, that's, uh, everywhere there's a star again, uh, no one could have an ADU. Uh, there's a Zimmerus Drive area, again, the red, looking for the red stars, no one 
past that red star could have an ADU. Uh, that's a point dune area. All of those um, cul-de-sacs or dead end streets could not have an ADU. Malibu Park area, quite a few areas up in the Malibu Park area. And then the Broad Beach area and Insel Canyon. And so I did a rough estimate of 80 to 85 percent. It could be even higher than that. Okay. All right. Um, I will just close this out and say as much as I would uh, like to not block out 85 percent of the homes or the spaces, this is really troubling to me about it having only one way in and one way out. Uh, I'm a survivor, I'll call it that, of the Woolsey Fire, because I live on Latico, one of the streets you just pointed out here. And as the fire chief said, Drew Smith, this was the largest uh, fire evacuation that had ever taken place in the United States that 250,000 people got out in six hours. Now, we may have been on PCH for six hours, but we were out. And I'm highly concerned about this access points because anybody that's, that's stuck behind, and I'll give you a better example, Two weeks ago, we had the Topanga, or a few weeks ago, we had the Topanga fire, um, and because it wasn't windy and the moisture conditions, kept that fire from being at PCH in a half an hour. Having one way in, one way out would be a terrible uh, issue for those people that were in Topanga or Big Rock. So I am concerned about this and adding additional residences in there. So with that, I'll turn it back over and let people ask a question. Okay, Bruce. So. I may be misunderstanding one of the things Mark's advocating, but I, if, if I understand it correctly, I'm not asking you to stand up yet. We'll do it as a courtesy. Okay. I get that our city attorneys are telling us each line item that's proposed, each, re, each restriction or permission fits within the different provisions in the um, ADU law that, you know, what you can permit this, you can permit this, you can't permit this, you have to restrict that. Th those things all, at, those all can be matched up to different sentences in the, in the code. If I understand your argument correctly, you're saying that the, the gestalt, the, 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 the whole thing is designed in a way to violate the spirit of the act, and that's, that's your problem. It's not that, we can't say this sentence says you can limit it to 1,200 feet or 1,000 feet, so therefore this sentence is wrong. You're saying when you put them all together, they're designed to, um, to prevent what the law was designed to create. I, I think you're on the right path, but I'm saying both. I'm saying... Okay, fine. I'm, I'm going to accept our council's sure. view that the, that the individual ones match up. But I, I get your point that um, you, you believe it violates the spirit of the rule. And your, your point, if, if I understand it, about the Coastal Act versus the LCP, and I wrestled this with, with this when I came on council, um, you're saying, you're saying that, like, if the Coastal Act says something like X cannot occur, that's a Coastal Act restriction. But if we've adopted a restriction and they've approved it pursuant to our LCP, but it's not an explicit restriction in the Coastal Act, then that's not something that's inconsistent with the Coastal Act to change now. Uh, and more importantly, it wouldn't uh, negate the ADU yeah. statute. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I get where you're coming from. Um, I come back to that, – that, that's all I wanted to know from you. Um, first of all, you know, I was opposed to us approving anything last time this came around because I didn't think I had adequate information yeah. and I didn't think we had adequate input to make a decision. I, I still favor more process over less process. I understand there's also some kind of timing issue that we've been told we need to get this done. So um, that's something that needs to be balanced. Um, I, I, I want to come back to one other issue, which is this, this two entrance thing. I am a little disturbed process-wise with the fact that the staff didn't come back with that included in the proposal because we made it very clear that we had a, we had at least three people on this council last time, so that we had a consensus to bring this back with a provision that didn't allow an ADU when there was not two entrances. And I've I've had this problem in the past. It's not it's not the staff's position to disagree with that and give reasons why it doesn't work and not do it. You can, you can you can put it in and say we think this is unwise for the following reasons, but it troubles me that it's not in there. 
Joyce, I see you want to respond to that, so go ahead. Uh, just just a, a point of clarification. We made uh, no changes to the ordinance um, because we wanted to – so the ordinance that was before you was the ordinance recommended by the Planning Commission. So – I understand that, but the direction of the council was to come back with a revision that included a restriction without two entrances and to come back with a provision that it would be deed restricted to require that the owner be living in at least one of the two right. dwellings. And it was not a direction to come back with discussion of why those things are good or bad alone. It was to put them in there and you could advocate why they should be excised. So I, I, that, that troubles me. I'd like for future, if we give direction to put something in, whether you think it makes good sense or not, you put it in, and then you can argue why it shouldn't be there. Um, I still believe it's, I, I'm, I'm troubled by the 85% as well, and I'm just, I'm very torn with this. I'm very torn with this. I, I, I do have one more question for you, Mark. The the January 21, 2022 letter that you that Doug was asking you about, it, it states that there's a strong support for strategies to increase access to affordable housing. How are how are ADUs in Malibu going to increase affordable housing in, in California? You would be shocked to hear how many people on Point Doom want to move their mother, their mother-in-law, or their divorced kid or the worker at the Starbucks into an ADU. And no bullshit, they will qualify as RENA units. This is not okay. all profiteering. I know you think that's no, no, what good, it no, is. No, no, fine. It's can not. We, can we, in your opinion, can we put a limit on the amount um, of rent that can be charged to live in an ADU? It, well, sure, because but there's no reason to because the entire arena structure has nothing to do with the rental rate. It creates five income categories. So I'll give you this. This example plays out in Malibu all the time. Somebody who's wealthy decides they want to put their mom who's disabled in a one story ADU. OK, the mom has no significant income other than Social Security. Under Rena, she qualifies for the middle category. Okay. You've just met, instead of building an apartment building below the Malibu Knolls, you've just met 15% of your units if you do that 15 okay. uh, times. Wh whether, wh but ca can, can we lawfully put a restriction on the amount of rent that could be charged to live in an ADU? Uh, well, I suppose, but why would you? Do, do you really want to be the first council that does rent control in Malibu? Does that make any sense at all? I, I, okay, thank no, you. No, you wouldn't want to. There's no justification I, I, for it related to I affordable housing. I didn't ask you whether you think it makes sense. I asked you whether you thought we are legally allowed to do it. Todd, can you answer that same question? Mayor and Council, there's nothing in the state law that prevents the city from, from imposing uh, an income restriction. Okay, so if the, the no, no, not an income restriction, restriction a, a, a rental price restriction. But it would be, um, it might be complicated uh, by the implications of essentially having an inclusionary housing ordinance. Okay, because it would okay. kind of amount to. Okay, because so, I, I, I just, again, I said this before, I'll say it again. I, I, I support a strategy if there were one to um, increase affordable housing, I don't see that allowing more ADUs in Malibu is going to create affordable housing. Um, I understand the argument that it will in some respects for people who want to put their family members in there, but I just, I just don't buy it. Um, I do want to see that whatever we appro approve, if we do approve something tonight, include the two entrance requirement. Uh and I want to see it include the deed requirement that if you put an ADU on your property, um, the owner of the property must reside in at least one of the two build homes that's on the property. That's illegal. Oh, I thought we were allowed to do that. You did that last time. No. Todd, did, uh, this is Doug. Didn't you just say that uh, having an owner occupancy requirement was not permitted? No, you said yes, that. recent changes in state law, I believe it was um, SB or AB 897, took away the possibility of requiring owner occupancy after 2025. Oh, I misunderstood that. 
Thank you. One other just idea that might be helpful, you're, I don't know where the time pressure comes from. You're not required to adopt an ADU ordinance at all. The, the state statute does not require you to. It says you can simply go by the state statute. Please. Rather than adopt you, something you, that thank will you. be rejected, thank you'd you, be better Mark. off doing nothing. Mark, thank you. Well, appreciate it. Okay, guys, it's 1139. I haven't asked anything. Okay, go ahead. You're on. Um, so, you know, I, I understand everyone's concern with the two entrances, but I want to remind you that currently second residential units are allowed in Malibu, and a property owner can apply for one right now, and there's no restriction. So we would suddenly be taking the rights away for a vast majority of the city, and we have nobody here. Um, I think we need to do a little bit more outreach before we make such a drastic impact to property owners um, by doing that. I think we just, there aren't enough people that are aware of it or have voiced their opinion to that. So I think we really need to see the Malibu population and where they stand on that. Um, so, uh, gosh, it's so late, I'm sorry. Um, the owner occupation, I guess we've kind of taken care of that. Uh, my question was an LLC. I know there's a number of people in the city for various reasons choose to put their properties in LLCs, um, not for um, corporations or anything like that. It's just because that's how they choose legally to hold their property for whether you're a celebrity or you're some other reason that, that does that. Um, I do have concerns with the height restrictions. I think that uh, by having it at 16 feet, we're limiting the ability to build a unit over a garage. Um, I think that you know our current rules are 18 feet, and then if you're gonna propose something taller than that, either 24 feet for a flat roof or 28 feet for a pitch roof, you do a site plan review. And so that proposal can be evaluated for that particular property by that um, requirement. The size square footage, I understand the 1,200 square feet, so those property owners that um, chose to do a temporary housing can just try and convert that to a permanent foundation and keep that unit um, as a second unit. I do still have, um, you know, there was an explanation by the staff on the guest house with the no kitchen, but then I didn't see that reflected in the ordinance. So I just want to make sure that when this is put into practice, if that's um, adopted, that future staff members can explain that, exactly what that uh, nuance is between those different structures. Um, because in, you go to page, the LUP and the LIP, um, it talks about, and this also goes into setbacks, but limiting the maximum number of structures to one main residence, one accessory dwelling, or one guest house, and accessory structures such as stable corral, pasture, workshop, gym, studio, pool cabana, office, detached garages, tennis courts, provided such accessory structures are located, within the approved development area and structures are clustered to minimize required fuel modification. So how does that um, work with the four foot setbacks allowances? Where in one section in the LIP and the LUP, it says you want to cluster development, especially those larger properties on the western end of Malibu, we've got a lot of ESHA and everything. But then we have another place where four foot setbacks are allowed? Am I just tired and I'm not processing yeah. it right? So four foot setbacks are only allowed in the MMC and so okay. only the you know ADUs that get through the MMC would be subject or allowed the, the four foot minimum setback. Okay um, and then to comments about that this isn't streamlined you know if you're gonna put a septic system on your property I don't see any language where that's changing the LCP to not require a coastal development permit for an ODBTS. So 
you're going to have to do a coastal development permit anyways in order to get the septic system for your, your ADU. So this is just combining that into one administrative coastal development permit. So the only difference in that is that if your ADU can be processed under the MMC, but it triggers a new OWTS, the OWTS still needs a CDP, but the the you cannot weigh in on the merits of the uh, ADU if, okay. it, if it qualifies for MMC. Okay, so if you're converting a portion of the house and you have additional bathroom plumbing fixtures in that house now to accommodate these extra areas and you have to upgrade your septic system, you process the coastal development permit for your septic system and then you process the MMC provisions for the conversion inside the house. That's correct. Okay. Um, and also, um, one of the things about our existing rules is there's a maximum allowable square footage on every property as it sits right now. And if you're already maxed out on your square footage, there's no allowances in any codes that allows you to exceed that just to, in order to have an ADU. That's correct. So if you're in Big Rock and you're already, because of the restrictions of that neighborhood due to, um, help me, the, um, TDSF. no, not TDSF, but the, because um, of the, the, no, um, Richard's got it. I can the, see the uh, factor of safety. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you wouldn't necessarily be able to add this extra square footage because of the fact that you're already restricted on other means. Correct. All standards of the uh, LCP would still apply, including TDSF okay. and, and the other factors. Perfect. Um, that's all I can think about right now. I'd like to make a suggestion, not necessarily a motion, but a suggestion at this point. I think this is probably one of the most consequential pieces of, of ordinance or actions we'll take in this whole council cycle. Council 17 will be known for what we produce here. And I don't want to rush it. I think uh, Mark is correct. I don't know that anybody has a, a rush to get this done for a particular deadline. But at the same time, we don't have the public here. And I'd like to have at least one more round where people have a chance to uh, hear what we've talked about and put the input in and make sure we've got a consensus bill. I will also tell you that uh, on this uh, two ways in and out. I'm having second thoughts about it. Uh, if it had only been, you know, three three locations in the city, I probably could have swallowed it. Uh, I could live with it. But I think it massively covers the city. And, and Marianne, you're absolutely right. People can do it today with a uh, second unit designation. So we're not really changing anything for the better. We're just keeping ADUs out. So if um, everybody's got their questions, I'd like to suggest we carry this on to the next meeting, but uh, that's just my suggestion at this point. I'd, I'd like to talk for just a second about what has changed in my position from the last time. The two entry requirement, like Doug, th I thought that it was going to be a limited number of people and, and from looking at the maps, I got to admit that you're probably right. It's probably 80 to 85 percent. And I think that that probably is going to cause problems with us when we're trying to get approval from HCD. I think also that we have to realize that some of the properties that we think are, are inappropriate are not going to be able to do this because of the septic limitations on any given lot. And the septic systems are going to be a, a, a large additional expense for these properties. So I'm willing to vote in favor of something without the two entry requirement. And uh, so I would okay. like very much to make a motion that we pass this. That, I'll okay. second. That's a motion for staff's recommendation. That's a motion for staff's recommendation. Including the uh, adjustment shown by uh, um, Tyler to uh, to account for the type the type of logic, for uh, the, the, the typographic yes typographic error um, in ordinance five ten correct 
Yes. And the only caveat I have is just training materials for staff so that they understand the nuances of these different types of structures. And um, I did like your reminding them to just write no no kitchen after guest house in the okay. in the thing because that's. Make it easy for people to understand what we're talking about. So just okay. FYI, currently we don't have that. So it's currently mark, you mark. don't have that, but that's that's an easy thing to add. Yeah. So and I would like to see it added. Okay. Oh, okay. If you can't have a cooking facility, tell us. Tell the tell the people five years from now when they they're looking through the code book, why can't I do this? Okay, Bruce, and then I'm sitting here, so. I'm Chime in here or something. Yeah. So um, just two, two comments. Um, one is the HCD issue. Am I correct in understanding that that only applies to the MMC? The, the, the need for their approval. Uh, on the ADU ordinance, yeah. uh, yes. The, but we need uh, uh, their approval on our housing element, of course, which uses ADUs. Okay, uh, but but they're but right now they're only going to be approved. They're only going to be looking at and approving or rejecting our municipal code provision, not our LCP. On the ADE ordinance, that is right. correct. Okay, and there's no requirement that our LCP ordinance and our municipal code ordinance be the same. No. Okay. Oh. Um, I'm I'm still torn about the two entrances, but where I actually was coming out when I after. The last meeting when I heard from a lot of people who were disturbed that they would lose their ability to build an ADU, which I still think is a justified result for safety reasons, uh, would be if, if we're going to not impose that provision, we should at least just leave the maximum size at 900 square feet, not give people the ability to build what Doug described at the last meeting is basically a duplex by having two 1,200 square foot homes on the property. Or well, I mean, one 2,400 and one 1,200 square foot house. So I would I would reluctantly support keeping the leaving out the requirement of two entrances if we didn't increase the size of the ADU that's permitted. I'm not willing to I'm, accept that change. Okay. I'm surprised. All right. At the last meeting, when the five liaisons that uh, work for uh, Susan came up and, and explained to us that there were all these streets that you couldn't get out of, okay? It, the decision that says keep it to two roads came up, came up pretty quickly. Uh, we said safety is, a, safety is our most important issue. And somehow that's gone out the door tonight, all right? I remind, you know, there was the, the evacuation last time took five hours. I'll tell you what, Big Rock. Okay, if you got PCH crowded, you tell me how the hell you get out of Big Rock if there's a fire. You ain't, it's not going to happen. Well, the people toasted all over the place. And I'm sorry, you're right. There are some people that are going to complain and say, you know, I want to build an ADU and the fact that you guys won't let me. I'll tell you, I'm not concerned with that. I'm concerned with the, all the people I'm going to save by doing the right thing. Right? That, to me, is the most important. Look. That's our job. I mean, we keep talking about public safety. The safety of the residents is one of the primary things we keep talking about, whether it's on PCH, whether it's about fire. What, and the minute somebody stands up and says, well, you know, I can make a couple of bucks if I put this ADU in, we, we fold up our tent and go home. That's nuts. All right? I mean, and, you know, this, this process. You're right. It's not going to be low-income housing. I mean, Airbnb right now has got to start in another division that is building ADUs. All right. I mean, so their plan is that they're, they, I don't know whether it's a um, prefab where they drop it in there, but their idea is to build as many ADUs as you can, turn them into short-term rentals, and make a ton of money off of that thing. And you think that's not going to happen here in Malibu? You're dreaming. All right. So I am. I don't know what we're going to do tonight. I mean, it's getting a little late, and I don't know if we want to postpone the vote to another time, uh, you know. But I'm, I'm, I, we need to, I'm sticking with the two exits, two roads. I mean, that is what the last time we heard from the people that knew about safety, that's what they told us we should do, and we agreed with it because we were thinking clearly. Maybe it was earlier in the evening, whatever, and I don't think that's changed. So I, I want the two exits. Well, I, I'd like to bring up the question, can we really approve this tonight? Because uh, Joyce said the 
resolution we have on our package does not reflect the uh, two entrances in or out, or does it? No, it doesn't. Well, I, my, my thought is what we want to do, I mean, I, it would seem to me that at some point in time, before they come back and with another version that says we didn't change anything, we ought to give them a little bit of direction that says, you know, do, do we think we want to have the two entrance, two, two road piece? If so, when it comes back, let's make sure that's in there. Do we want to limit the size of the thing to 900, 1200? Let's make it and, and get that in there. So we got some of this stuff resolved. Can we, I'm, I'll get you know, some of this stuff resolved. And I'll go back to jo Joyce's argument that said, you know, if we, the, if we do the two road thing, we're going to have to come up with an explanation uh, to somebody that why we're doing it that way, because the, the housing has, has written a letter to Palos Verdes uh, that says, you know, we're not going to let you do that. That's nuts. Palos Verdes isn't Malibu. I mean, let me ask a question. If, if we do the two road thing, the, the rule or the, the Direction from Department of Housing and Community Development said the, the, the county may not deny ADU applications in very high fire severity zones due to a lack of, of two vehicle or means of egress without making the necessary findings to justify such a restriction. So if we're going to do it, we got to tell them why we're doing it, right? We got to give them a justification that says this is why this is important in Malibu. And if you think about it, all right? I mean, we lost a quarter of our homes in the last fire, right? It took five hours to get a goddamn evacuation out of the city. Uh, we can't get insurance in the city. We can't get insurance, right? The insurance guys are telling you it's too, too risky. Uh, Southern California Edison shutting off my damn power every time the wind, you know, someone farts someplace. That, that, that wrong, bad language. But I mean, if a little wind, they, they turn it off. Okay, water. Eastern Malibu doesn't have any water. All right. You, you think we don't have reasons why we want to protect our residents, okay, by, by making sure they can get out of the city if something happens? I think we got a whole bunch of reasons to make that case. Bruce, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's good. Well, so, you know, we have a motion and a second on the table to approve this as is. Um, Steve is clearly going to vote no. Right. Um, I, I assume the motion and the second vote yes. Steve's going to vote no. I'm going to vote no because at a bare minimum, if we're not going to have two entrances, it's going to not be reduced to 900 square feet. Um, and I'm still on the fence on that because Steve makes good arguments. But so, you know, Doug, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but it, we have two choices. We're either going to we're either going to approve this tonight if you're inclined to approve it or we can put it off to another meeting where we can give it some greater thought, get some more community input. Um, but, you know, you're either going to vote it up or vote it down, so you might as well just let us know where you're coming. I'd, I'd rather postpone this. This is, okay. this is way too important. And I think there's good arguments on all the way around here, but this is way too important to do at 11 or at midnight. Midnight, yeah. And, look, we've all got good reasons for the pieces we're coming up with. And I'll, I'll tell you on the two ways in and out, I was, I was with it for as long as it was big rock and some places I think are high risk, high fire prone areas. But when we've got it in Point Doom, I'm having a problem with that. In well, point, we can, 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 we can, I, we can specify where I, it can be. Well, I know, but that's the reason why this doesn't, you know, one size doesn't fit all. Can I and, just ask a question sure. that may make your decision easier? Richard, do you know of any guest houses that have been permitted in Big Rock? I, I, I can't recall any at this time. I know that we've, there's a controversial development in the end of the street there that proposes uh, guest units uh, at Seaboard there. But other than that, I, I can't think of any permits we've issued recently. Paul, I understand what you're saying, but you know this isn't about what's today, it's about the future. Right. And I... The same economic conditions are, are that have been uh, in existence are going to continue to be in existence. There's a lot of people in Big Rock who would like to be able to build a guest house. I'm sure. And when they get into examining what it's going to cost, they go, "This doesn't make any sense." And and this doesn't make any sense is is a large component of what means people don't do things. 
I mean, look, I don't, I don't think being in a hurry is going to, okay. going to help us. And look, it, I use this phrase in business: let's don't be in a hurry to make a mistake. And I, I just think we need to think about this, make sure we haven't missed anything. The discussions we've had tonight have been excellent, but at the same time, you know, there's still, still pieces to be sanded down or cobbled together. And let's, you know, one more week, two more weeks is not going to kill us. And I think if we make sure that we've got the, uh, all the input from the population and we also have had a chance to read it and discuss it with other people, can't discuss it amongst ourselves, but anything that we can do to uh, fine tune this a little bit better so that we're comfortable with what we're passing, I'd feel much better about it. Uh, it doesn't mean I'm not going to vote for exactly what's on the table tonight, but I guarantee you, I think I'll be more comfortable doing it if we've got another couple of weeks. I don't disagree. I just would recommend that if we go back and we think about it, think about the Wilsley fire. Think about five hours on PCH trying to get the heck out of the city. And think about if you're in Big Rock, how you get on PCH when there's five hours of cars packed up there. I mean, to me, again, you know, we, we, we complain about Caltrans. They, we, they say they, were, they take care of safety, and we say, ah, oh, no, safety's not their issue. We're doing the same thing. We profess safety, but let's live it. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's good. So, you know, I, I would think that if we do bring this back, we can consider compromise provisions such as here are places where you're not going to be able to have an ADU. Here are places where you can have a 1,200-foot ADU. Here are places where you're limited to a 900 square foot ADU, all based on a genuine observation of what the e ingress and egress of the neighborhood is like and how likely it is to be a fire danger. Um, that, that's just a general comment. Um, Paul and Marianne, I mean, do you want to have a vote on your motion or do you want to withdraw the motion and we'll continue this? Well, if we have a vote, I think probably it's going to turn out that Council member, your microphone. I'm sorry. It seems to me, from listening to what I'm hearing from the other end, that if we have a vote, we're going to be soon looking for another motion. So, so the question is, do you want to why withdraw don't you the propose motion? a right. substitute motion, and that will have to be? Are you withdrawing the motion? I don't have to for him to propose a substitute motion and find himself a backer. Do I? And we have to consider yours first. Is that how that works, Trevor? We withdraw the motion and we can all go home. No. no I, I don't like the concept of, of over-motioning somebody. I don't yeah. like it when other people do it, so I'm not okay. going to do that. I, okay. I'm going to give you the option if we're drawing it or not. We can vote it, up, vote it down if you want to vote it down. It's up to you. I'll take back my second. Okay, and I'll take back my motion. Okay. So I move that we continue this to a date certain to the next meeting um, and revisit it. Cool. I got one question from the staff down there. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you. Uh, what is it uh, that the council would like staff to bring back? Just the a motion we can vote on. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I think we're. We, I guess we were. Well, we can all vote. I don't on think we're it. looking for anything different. Yes, okay. just, I don't okay. think we're looking for you guys to do anything different. Because okay. last time it seems we may have mis misinterpreted the direction, so we just want to be sure what yeah. you guys yeah. want. So bring back I, the same just, thing. I'm, to me, it was, look, the earlier comment I, I asked when Joyce said, you know, we're going to avoid the two street option, the answer you gave didn't, because the housing may not approve it. We got to, I mean, the question is, can we come up with a reason, can we come up with findings that makes it reasonable that housing is going to approve that thing versus just saying, oh, no, somebody's going to ask us some questions, so we've got to take that out of there. Right, let's have some good, solid reasons if we're going to make changes and why we're doing that, which I didn't think we got this time around. So, Let me just uh, maybe give you guys some direction. I think the question about two ways in and out is an issue. I think yeah. the height uh, is an issue. I think consistency on square footage is an issue. To me, uh, you know, defining an ADU versus a uh, uh, junior ADU versus a guest house Almost to the point, I'd, I'd love to have a matrix on that for simplification for everybody going forward. 
Um, I think we've already resolved the ownership issue. It's not an issue because it's illegal in the future. And uh, as far as reporting the rental income, probably doesn't make any sense since it's supposed to be for uh, uh, gross income of the occupant, not the rental income. So I think those are the things I would consider to be open items. I don't know about anybody else, but that's where I would narrow it down a little bit. Uh, well, I had something that went past. It was too late. I went in one. You know, just went, <laughs> I lost it. <laughs> uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, if I may, are you, is perhaps the council's motion to bring back the same ordinance uh, as we have proposed. However, in the staff report, provide options on the items just mentioned? Yeah, that, and think about the fact, you know, I mean, and, and Bruce has probably got the right idea if we had, a, had our druthers, you know, to be able to go back and pick out a neighborhood and say, I can do it in this neighborhood. But I don't know how complex that's going to make what you guys have to do. So just, yeah, make sure that what we're, if, if we're doing something that's going to make everybody's life totally miserable, tell us. <laughs> because we, it's easy for us to do that. <laughs> well, look, You're going to make everybody's staff's I, I, life miserable by having multiple different yeah, things. I, I, I made a motion. I'm not sure I got a second, but just to be clear, my motion is not requesting that the staff do a lick of additional work. I, I think that as a practical matter, you're all overburdened. And we've all discussed this enough that we know what we're talking about. So my motion, whether I get a second or not, is simply to continue this to the next meeting and bring back the exact same package and start the hearing afresh. I will a make second. a second to that. Uh, and I just think my comments to you were just to give you some heads up and some direction of where I think we're going to be going. It's not necessarily the yes. boilerplate and gosh knows what we'll end up with. I'll agree to it with one stipulation. Can we do it before public comment on items not? I'm going to move 2A to after this. Well, let's, let's see when we when it comes back with what else we got with, as opposed to. It really doesn't matter what else we got, but I think I think that tonight we spent a lot of time up front when our brains were fresh, and it's it's not. I'm not extre extremely productive at this point in the evening. I and agree. Although I'm, I lack sleep, think of all the millions of electrons that we're dis that we are making less life less convenient for right now. You know, they're having to be broadcasting TV things and recording things. Those poor little electrons. We ought to. Okay. We ought to if we're going to get out of here, if we're going to get out of here, Paul, sure. short next I'll, I'll accept the amendment to the motion that we um, order the further discussion of this to before public comment on general things. I'll, I'll okay. Agree. Roll call, Kelsey. Mayor, I actually just want to clarify that um, friendly amendment to the motion. Are you asking me to prepare your agenda so that this public hearing is arranged before no, public? No, put it in the regular thing, and we okay. can move it to the meeting. Thank later. you. That was just the clarification yeah, I needed. Thank and then you otherwise, you're continuing this yes. hearing to December 11th yes. um, with no other changes right. to the items we've prepared here. We'll just be bringing with them the back for further discussion. We'll, we'll try and move it up earlier in the agenda the next time we're around. Thank you. Um, then I'm ready for that roll call. Oh, oh wait, I'm, I don't want to it. prolong this, but I, I, I think the public deserves to know if we already decided that it's going to be heard earlier, that it's being heard earlier, because they're going to order their lives around we'll, this. We'll, we'll have it heard. We'll make it heard earlier. So, so I'm saying it should be it should be on the agenda that way. We're, we're now going to vote on that. We're voting to continue this to the next meeting, and it'll appear right before 2A. That's, that's the motion on the agenda. It'll appear right before 2A. That way people will know when it's going to be heard. I can make a commitment to be here for it. Right. And Mayor Pro Tem Stewart, you were the second on that motion? I'm fine with that. Give us the roll call. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Mayor Yearing? No. Motion carries. Can we, can we do 7A? What's 7A? Can we do 7 a Six A is just a receiving file, right? Yeah. Uh, we're looking for some direction on six A. Um, um, staff is recommending 
going out to uh, looking for direction from council to go out to an RFP. I'll make a motion that we hear item 6A. I'll second it. Okay, Wait, well, we, we have to vote. We have to make sure we have a majority. Have a majority. Yeah, we've got to have, we have to have four. We have to have four. Ready for a roll call vote? Yep. Wait, Council Member Regan? Can we just, yes. Uh, Council Member, or Mayor Pritchard Stewart? Yes. Council Member Grisanti? Yes. Council Member Silverstein? I'm only willing to vote to hear 6A if we're also going to hear 7A tonight. This has got to get done. 7A should get done too. It's a, I think seven is going to take us two minutes. Yeah. I, we have we to do it one at a time when we've done it in the past. I don't well, have a problem with 7A. I'm not I'm just saying that, but we in the past, we've taken each one individually. So. Well, I'm voting no unless we commit to do 7A. I'm going home. What do you think? I, I think you should call the question. Mayor Uring? No. Motion fails. Okay, so I'll make a motion that we hear 6A and 7A. We need four votes to do it. Uh, what's the rule? I, I don't have a problem with either one of them. It's just I thought we I'll had a rule. That. Go ahead. I'll second Bruce's motion. Which rule? That we hear each, we make a vote on each particular item in the order that we want to hear them. If we're changing procedure, that's fine, but just tell me we're changing procedure and then we can. The motion is we're going to the do motion. 6A and 7A tonight. Make sure we get them both done. When we've had it this late at night previously, we've we, voted on each one individually. The only rule says no new items will be taken up after 10.30 p.m. without a two-thirds vote of the City Council. I'm moving that we hear 6A and 7A. Guys, we can argue about this. We can do it and get it done and go home. It is usually done one by one, but I don't see anything in there that's right. prohibiting yeah, you from. still doing them one by one. You just want us to commit to doing both of them. Yes. Okay, so, so we got a motion. We got a second. Kelsey, give us a roll call. Who's Cal second? I second. The motion was from Councilmember Silverstein. The second was from Mayor Uring. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Uring? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? No. Councilmember no. Riggins? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. All right. Motion carries. 6A. Susan Wowers. <laughs> <laughs> good evening, or should I say good morning? <laughs> I will make this quick. All right. As I'm sure you're well aware, where we have a problem with people parking illegally throughout the city. Um, it's pretty routine, it creates dangerous conditions for residents and visitors, and it impacts the quality of life in a number of neighborhoods. Currently our parking enforcement is done by two groups of really great people, and I just want to enforce that this whole presentation is no way meant to diminish the amazing work that either of these groups do. So the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, of course, writes parking tickets, and so do our volunteers on patrol, and both of them do a great job. However, with each of these groups, it's not necessarily, well, like with the sheriffs, it's not their primary mission, so they're not doing it all the time. And with the volunteers, they're volunteers, so they don't have set schedules, so there's inconsistencies there too. And then I just have some graphs to kind of illustrate this. You can see this is in October when you can see the VOPs goes up and down, usually corresponding with weekends, but sometimes not. And with the Sheriff's Department, it's there's not a lot of activity with parking citation issuance. In the summertime when we have the beach team, there's definitely more activity with the Sheriff's Department because it includes parking enforcement in our contract. But again, you can see there are periods where there's little to no parking enforcement. I mean, some days where there's zero parking enforcement. And then this even, you see it from month to month. And definitely there's more during the summer months, but it really varies. Um, a lot, as you can see. So back when we passed the budget, this issue had come up before, and so the council approved uh, 
including three additional community service assistants to help us with parking enforcement. And unfortunately, the Sheriff's Department has a no growth moratorium, so they were not able to fulfill this request we had. So options, things that you know, other cities have done, I reached out to five different cities. Um, some have created internal parking enforcement with regular staff positions. Excuse me. And some have contracted out parking enforcement. I spoke with uh, staff at all these cities to get a sense of what was, you know, the pros and cons of either one. And it seemed to me that uh, contracting out seemed to be the more popular path. In fact, two of the cities, Burbank and Glendale, had their own parking enforcement with their police departments, but they decided to go with contract to save money and to deal with some of the staffing issues they were having because it was hard to maintain staffing levels. Um, and they have found that contracting out um, solves these problems. So just a few more final notes on this. Uh, another advantage to having parking enforcement, whether it's internal or contract, is that you can have marked parking enforcement vehicles, which helps to reinforce to people coming into the city that we are going to be enforcing our parking regulations. Also, with either uh, way, if you decide to pursue either of these, we would coordinate with the Sheriff's Department and the BOPs to make sure that any um, additional parking enforcement is coordinated with the work that they're already doing. And the Public Safety Commission in, in August discussed this issue and voted in favor of recommending uh, pursuing a contract for parking enforcement. That is my presentation. I'm available for questions. Do you have any public comments? Is there, any, is there, anybody, no, is there anybody online? Sure. There's, <laughs> there's wishful thinking. There's one raised hand from Ryan. Oh, man. <laughs> Ryan, you got you talk with Make it quick, Ryan. Go ahead. So I can speak fast. I support the concept. I just want to make sure that you're, you're asking for a request for proposal. You're not mm -hmm. asking uh, for bidders to, to respond to a specific program. And I think you're missing an opportunity with that because someone proposes that they want to take 30 percent or of whatever the ticket amount is, uh, you know, that would not be a starter uh, because they'll only write tickets that are expensive tickets. So th that isn't necessarily our problem throughout the city in general. So we do have an automated uh, ticket processing company. I don't know if they charge, you know, $4.50 to mail the envelope, you know, to the registered owner when they don't pay their ticket or process their check or however it works. But this is for, for boots on the ground riding tickets in the city. I think it should be factored on an hourly basis and not incentivized to the contractor based on the dollar value or the number of tickets that are written, i.e. the quota uh, incentive uh, for performance in that manner. <clears throat> the, the question really is, they say to save money, well, that, that assumes that the amount of tickets would either uh, stay the same from like last year to next year, or it assumes that they're going to write more tickets next year than they did last year. So you kind of have an apples and oranges scenario anyway, and I just think it needs to be uh, fair for all of the bidders that they're, they're bidding on the same thing. And when you ask them to propose their own, you know, deal, um, you're going to be stuck comparing, well, you know, I, I like this method and the, I didn't like the, what the other folks proposed, but I, I don't think that's fair and you're not going to get a competitive bid that way. Um, you're just going to, you know, pick a different menu item and you didn't tell people what you really want for dessert in the first place. So anyway, I'd suggest that you um, narrow the specs down or get it very clear when you when you uh, publish this that you want it based on an hourly rate um, or that you, you know, just put some, put some boundaries on it. That's my comment. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. 
All right. Close public comment, Bruce. Yeah, I have a, I have a question. Um, you, on the pros and cons, you don't include cost. Um, but there's a statement that some other cities have moved to the contracted services to save money. Um, and I was wondering whether we make more revenue in the grand scheme of things or less revenue. W with the t which, which of the two options give, nets the city more money? That was, I tried really hard to see if I could answer that question, but it was, it's very difficult because of how the revenue comes into those cities. And the, I mean, they know how much their contracts are. They know how much, you know, the city staff costs. <clears throat> what they can't always, what I wasn't able to get from them, they couldn't nail down exactly how much revenue. They gave me numbers that generally demonstrated that they tended to net more than the cost of their programs, but they monitored it. You know, it definitely covered the cost, um, but I guess the with Burbank and Glendale, I think the cost of their staff because of, <clears throat> pardon me, um, all of the benefits and retirement, the long-term cost of having city staff, tended to, uh, to outweigh the benefits. Okay, thank you. So I'll support sending this out for <coughs> proposals, but I would like before we accept one to get an analysis of whether we actually make more or less money <coughs> by hiring out or doing it ourselves. That, that's, that's my suggestion. I, I'll just pick a, uh, I'm going to start Paul, go ahead. I have a strong bias for hiring people who get paid more if they do more. So. Yeah. Uh, last comment. I think one of the things we have to realize is we basically contract out now, with the exception of the VOPs who do it for free, but the Sheriff's Department has their own uh, staff and we contract with them by the high car. So it's, it's already contracted out. It just depends on whether or not it's an independent group or not. Uh, one suggestion I would have, and I think this came out of the Public Safety Commission, was let's see if they can tow. Uh, it's called a 140 is what the Sheriff's Department issues, or 180, I'm sorry, 180 <coughs> a form. And maybe the other people can do something similar. I know some of the cities have towing capability, but I'm not sure how that works and whether yeah. it will City of West Hollywood, they have the company they use is they yeah. do tow. Yeah, let's just see yeah. if that's one of the options. I mm -hmm. do think it's a good idea to put it out for an RFP. Uh, You're looking for yeah. proposals. Mm -hmm. Give me the idea. Give me all the ideas you got. Otherwise, we may restrict something. And I do like Bruce's idea of uh, bringing it back for uh, approval, which I think you do anyway. Mm. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll make a motion to approve it as is. A second. Roll call, Kelsey. Um, maybe a council member can clarify, or Susan, uh, the staff recommendation didn't have a clear action, so which action are you approving? Send out RFP. Yeah. Okay. So you're approving um, staff to issue an RFP? Issue an RFP, yes. Yeah. For a contract. Yeah, for a contract. And I'm sorry, who was the second for that motion? I was. I was Bruce. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Mayor Yearing? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, 7A. Uh, this was, I brought this up, and you know, I don't know how many times we've heard since I've been on the council, uh, residents come up and say we really should do something to honor Walton and Lucille Keller. Uh, you know, they, they were the founders of our city. Uh, we have kicked around a number of ideas. The people that I've talked to said if you could rename the Ch Charm Lee Center uh, for them, uh, that would be a good idea. They, th they thought it was uh, an excellent, you know, acknowledgement of what these folks had done for us. So that was my proposal. Let's take a look and see if we can name the Visitor Center up at Charm Lee for uh, Walt and Lucille. And I've got a public comment from Joe. If you'd like to come on up, Joe. Basically, what my email is supporting this, obviously, from Malibu Township Council and all its members would right. love for Walt and Lucille to be honored in this way. Thank you. 
Okay, so can I get a motion? I'll make a motion to rename the Charmley Wilderness Park Nature Center in honor of Walt and Lucille Keller. Second. Just a quick question. This is just for the building. It's not to rename the park. It's just the, the building. building. Yeah. Can we? I've been in the park, but I don't think I've ever been in the building. What is it? It's a nature center. Yeah. It's, it's, it's. If you go up the driveway after the parking lot, um, there's a building. Are you that, talking about the ranger residence? Or no, is there it's across else? the way. There's another building. Trails. I've been on the trails. I've never been in the in the in a nature center. There's a road that goes up, and on the left hand side, there's a building that's um, painted. And they used to have animals and things in there. It's damaged right now. They're in the process of refurbishing. That's the one. Yeah. Talking right. About, right. So we're in the process of refurbishing a building. My understanding, yes. I'd like an opportunity to look at the building before I vote on it. I'm prepared to vote for a plaque, but, you know, I, I'm... Well, we've got a motion and a second. Steve, you want to... Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to clarify that the, that the recommended action is to, is to consider yeah. the, the change and also to direct staff to do its additional research and come back. So we would we would do some research and then bring this back to council for, for formal action at a later date. Cool. Is that okay, Paul? That'll give you a chance to look at what you want to look so at. Your, so your motion is now to do the recommended action. Yeah. And, uh, well, well Marianne moved to actually do the renaming. Can we do that? I if I would... I mean, I, I'm fine with renaming. I, I'm aware of the building. I took a tour up there earlier. Um, so I, I don't have any problems, but I'm also happy to. Well, and I'm fine seconding that if we're allowed to do that. Trevor, can we? We could do the, um, you could have the motion to rename it and then direct staff to return um, if any additional action is needed to memorialize it. Cool, that works. Take it that way. We didn't, we've got an agenda packet that doesn't say that we're going to do that, right? So now we're doing something that wasn't agendized. So that, that's the recommended action? The recommended action was consider a Charmley Wilderness Park name, name change. Okay, so we're asking staff to go back, consider that name change, come back with a plan, okay. see how we do that. And I'll go visit it cool. before then. Okay, we are, was, we made a motion. We had a motion. A I'm second. confused as what the motion is now. Yeah. Sorry, we state the motion. I think, Marianne, it's your preference. Do you want to stick with the motion to rename it and have staff do what's necessary to accomplish that, or do you want to change your motion to? No, I, I, I'm fine with with renaming it. Um, I guess the only thing to check is if we are allowed to name buildings after people or haven't we already dealt with that i mean it's no, so we, we don't city does not have an existing policy on this so as if, if, if staff has given directions tonight we would look at all that was necessary to effectuate this including if there's any cost necessary with it and we would bring all that back to city council for well, there's final obviously going to be cost because we we're going to have a plaque or something right that's not just going to be and I'm, I'm still seconding that motion yeah can I make a friendly amendment just to follow what's on here? And I give everybody, I give Paul a chance to go look at it. And it look kind of accomplishes the same thing. What do you want to change? Just whatever it says there. Um, uh, direct staff to conduct additional research on the feasibility of renaming the uh, building. And just come back with the, something we can approve and plaque those up on it. I'm fine with what I said. So. Yeah, right. and I'm fine with it too. Right. Okay, roll call, Kelsey. If we could just clarify that motion um, to make sure we all understand it. So it's a motion to rename the to visitor rename the center. Building, right, have staff take a look at what it takes to get that done and come back with it. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I think I was yeah, talking the, over you. The, the, the motion, I believe, was to agree we want to rename the building for the Kellers. 
and we want staff to go out and take a look at what it takes to do that, come back with any information. St staff will have to come back with a proposal if there's going to be painting or a plaque yeah. or what the option would be. For how to accomplish so, what we've said. So the motion is to rename it, but there's no change to the building until it's brought back with the proposal right. of how it would be, how the project would take place. Does that reflect everyone's understanding? Pretty good. Kelsey. Councilmember Riggins. Yes. Councilmember Silverstein. Yes. Councilmember Grisanti. Councilmember Grisanti, this is our roll call order. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart. Yes. Mayor Uring. Yes. Motion carries. We are adjourned.